Introduction to the series Wake Up and Live. No one is destined to be unhappy, consumed with fear and worry, live in poverty, suffer ill health, and feel rejected and inferior. God created all humans in His image and has given us the power to overcome adversity and attain happiness, harmony, health and prosperity. You have within yourself the power to enrich your life. How to do this is no secret. It has been preached, written about and practiced for millennia. You will find it in the books of the ancient philosophers. All of the great religions have preached it. It is in the Hebrew scriptures, the Christian gospels, the Greek philosophers, the Muslim Koran, the Buddhist sutras, the Hindu Bhavad Gita, and the writings of Confucius and Lao Tse. You will find it in the works of modern psychologists and theologians. This is the basis of the philosophy of Dr. Joseph Murphy, one of the great inspirational writers and lecturers of the 20th century. He was not just a clergyman, but also a major figure in the modern interpretation of scriptures and other religious writings. As minister director of the Church of Divine Science in Los Angeles, his lectures and sermons were attended by 1,300 to 1,500 people every Sunday. Millions of people tuned in his daily radio program. He wrote over 30 books. His most famous book, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind, first published in 1963, became an immediate bestseller. It was acclaimed as one of the best self-help guides ever written. Millions of copies have been sold and continue to be sold all over the world. Following the success of this book, Dr. Murphy lectured to thousands of people in several countries. In his lectures he pointed out how real people have radically improved their lives by applying specific aspects of his concepts and provided practical guidelines on how all people can enrich their lives. Dr. Joseph Murphy was a proponent of the New Thought movement. This movement was developed in the late 19th and early 20th century by many philosophers and deep thinkers who studied this phenomenon and preached, wrote and practiced a new way of looking at life. By combining a metaphysical, spiritual and pragmatic approach to the way we think and live, they uncovered the secret of attaining what we truly desire. This philosophy was not a religion in the traditional sense, but it was based on an unconditional belief in a higher being, an eternal presence, God. It was called by various names such as, New Thought, and, New Civilization. The proponents of the new thought or new civilization preached a new idea of life that brings out new methods and more perfected results. They base their thinking on the concept that the human soul is linked with the atomic mind of universal substance, which links our lives with the universal law of supply and we have the power to use it to enrich our lives. To achieve our goals, we must work for it, and this working, we may suffer the thorns and heartaches of humankind. We can do all these things only as we have found the law and worked out the understanding of the law, which God seemed to have written in riddles in the past. The new thought concept can be summed up in these words, you can become what you want to be. All that we achieve and all that we fail to achieve is the direct result of our own thoughts. In a justly ordered universe, where loss of balance would mean total destruction, individual responsibility must be absolute. Our weaknesses and strengths, Purity and impurity are ours alone and that of another person. They are brought about by ourselves and not by another. They can only be altered by ourselves, never by another. All our happiness and suffering are evolved from within. As we think, so we are. As we continue to think, so we remain. The only way we can rise, conquer and achieve is by lifting up our thoughts. The only reason we may remain weak, abject and miserable is to refuse to lift up our thoughts. All achievements, whether in the business, intellectual or spiritual world are the result of definitely directed thought, are governed by the same law and are of the same method. The only difference lies in the object of attainment. Those who would accomplish little must sacrifice little. Those who would achieve must sacrifice much. Those who would attain a great deal must sacrifice a great deal. New thought means a new life. A way of living that is healthier, happier and more fulfilling in every possible manner and expression. The new life is predicted on age-old, universal laws of mind, and the way of infinite spirituality within the heart and mind of everyone. Actually, there is nothing new in new thought, for it is as old and time-honored as humankind. It is new to us when we discover the truths of life that set us free from lack, limitation, and unhappiness. At that moment, new thought becomes a reoccurring, Expanding awareness of the creative power within, of mind principle, and of our divine potential to be, to do, 
and to express more of our individual and natural abilities, aptitudes, and talents. Central to mind principle is that new thoughts, ideas, attitudes, and beliefs create new conditions. According to our beliefs is it done unto us good, bad, or indifferent. The essence of new thought consists of the continuing renewing of our mind, that we may prove what is good, and acceptable, and the perfect will of God. To prove is to know surely, and to have trustworthy knowledge and experience of. The truths of new thought are practical, easy to demonstrate, and within the realm of accomplishment of everyone if, and when, he or she chooses. All that is required is an open mind and a willing heart. Open to hearing old truth presented in a new and different way, willing to change and to relinquish old, outmoded beliefs, and to accept new ideas and concepts to have a higher vision of life, or a healing presence within. The renewing of our mind constitutes the entire purpose and practice of new thought. Without this ongoing, daily renewal, there can be no change. Real new thought establishes and realized an entirely new attitude, and new consciousness, which inspires and enables us to enter into life more abundant. We have within us limitless power to choose, to decide, and our complete freedom to do so to be conformed, or to be transformed. To be conformed is to live according to that which already has taken or has been given form that which is visible and apparent to our own senses, ideas, opinions, beliefs, and edicts of others. To be conformed is to live and to be governed by the fleeting and unstable fashions and conditions of the moment. The very word conformed suggests our present environment has form, and we do not, should not, deny its existence. All around us there are injustices, improprieties, and inequalities. We may, we do, find ourselves involved in them at times, and we should face them with courage and honesty, and do our best to resolve them with integrity and the intelligence which we possess now. The world accepts and believes, generally, that our environment is the cause of our present condition and circumstance that the usual reaction and tendency is to drift into a state of acquiescence and quiet acceptance of the present. This is conformity of the worst kind, the consciousness of defeatism. Worse, because it is self-imposed. It is giving all power and attention to the outer, manifested state. The outer environment, surroundings, and to the past by choice and by decision by the lack of knowledge of the functioning of our wonderful and primary faculty. Creative power of the mind and imagination is directed toward our goals and aspirations. New thought insists on the renewal of the mind and the recognition and acknowledgement of our responsibility in life, our ability to respond to the truths we now know. One of the most active and effective of new thought teachers, Charles Fillmore, co founder of Unity School or Christianity, was a firm believer in personal responsibility. In his book, The Revealing Word, he wrote simple and without equivocation. Our consciousness is our real environment. The outer environment is always in correspondence to our consciousness. Anyone who is open and willing to accept the responsibility has begun the transformation, the renewal of the mind that enables us to participate in our transformed life. To transform is to change from one condition or state to another, which is qualitatively better and more fulfilling, from lack to abundance, loneliness to companionship, limitation to fullness illness to vibrant health, through this indwelling wisdom and power, the healing presence will remain within. True and granted, there are some things we cannot change. The movement of planets, the change in seasons, the pull of the oceans and tides, and the apparent rising and setting of the sun neither can we change the minds and thoughts of another person but we can change ourselves. Who can prevent or inhibit the movement of your mind, imagination, and your will? Only you can give that power to another you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the key to a new life. Your mind is a recording machine, and all the beliefs, impressions, opinions, and ideas accepted by you are impressed in your deeper, subconscious mind. But you can change your mind. You can begin now to fill your mind with noble and godlike patterns of thoughts, and align yourself with the infinite spirit within. Claim beauty, love, peace, wisdom, creative ideas, and the infinite will respond accordingly transforming your mind, body, and circumstances. Your thought is the medium between your spirit, your body, and the material. The transformation begins as we meditate, think upon, and absorb into our mentality those qualities that we desire to experience and to express. Theoretical knowledge is good and necessary. We should know what we're doing, and why. However, actual transformation depends entirely on stirring up the gifts within the invisible, and intangible 
spiritual power given fully to every one of us. This, and only this, ultimately breaks up and dissolves the very real claims and bondage of past unhappiness and distress. In addition, it heals the wounds of heartbreak and emotional pain. We all desire, and require, peace of mind the greatest gift in order to bring it into our environment. Mentally, and emotionally, contemplate divine peace, filling our mind and heart, our entire being. First say, peace be unto this house. To contemplate lack of peace, disharmony, unhappiness, discord, and expect peace to manifest is to expect the apple seed to grow into a pear. It makes little or no sense, it violates all sense of reason. But it is the way of the world. To achieve this we must seek ways to change our minds to repent where necessary. As a result, renewal and transformation will occur, following as a natural result. It is desirable and necessary to transform our lives by ceasing to conform to the world's way of choosing, or deciding, according to the events already formed and manifested to begin to determine the cause behind the physical event and man-made doctrine, dogma, and ritual to enter the inner realm of the metaphysical, real new thought. The word metaphysical has become a synonym for the modern, organized movement. It was first used by Aristotle, considered by some to have been his greatest writing his thirteenth volume was simply entitled, Metaphysics. The dictionary definition is, beyond natural science, the science of pure being. Meta means, above, or beyond. Metaphysics, then, means, above or beyond physics, above or beyond the physical. The world of form. Meta, is above that, meta is the spirit of the mind. Behind all things is meta the mind. Biblically, the Spirit of God is good. They that worship God worship the Spirit, or truth. When we have the Spirit of goodness, truth, beauty, love, and goodwill, it is actually God in us, moving through us. God, truth, life, energy, spirit can it not be defined? How can it be defined? To define it is to limit it. This is expressed in a beautiful, old meditation. Ever the same in my innermost being, eternal, absolutely one, whole, complete, perfect. I am indivisible, timeless, shapeless, ageless without face, form, or figure. I am the silent brooding presence, fixed in the hearts of all men and women. We must believe and accept that whatever we imagine and feel to be true will come to pass. Whatever we wish for another, we are wishing for ourselves. Emerson wrote, We are what we think all day long. In other words and most simply stated, spirit, thought, mind, and meta is the expression of creative presence and power and as in nature physical laws, any power can be used two ways. For example water can clean us or drown us. Electricity can provide power that makes life easier or more deadly. The Bible says, I form the light, and create darkness. I make peace, and evil. I, the Lord, do all these things I wound, I heal, I bless, I curse. No angry deity is punishing us, we punish ourselves by misuse of the mind. We also are blessed benefited when we comprehend this fundamental principle, and presence, and learn and accept a new thought or an entire concept. Metaphysics, then, is the study of causation concerned not with the effect, or the result, which is now manifest, but rather with that which is causing the effect, or the result. Metaphysics approaches spiritual ideas as scientists approach the world of form. Just as they investigate the mind or causation from which the visible is formed, or derived from. If a mind is changed, or a cause is changed, the effect is changed. The strength and beauty of metaphysics, in my opinion, is that it is not confined to any one particular creed, but it is universal. One can be a Jew, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, and yet still be a metaphysician. There are poets, scientists, and philosophers who claim no creed, their belief is metaphysical. Jesus was a master metaphysician he understood the mind and employed it to lift up, inspire, and heal others. When the Mahatma Gandhi the great souled one was asked what his religion was, he replied, I am a Christian, a Jew, a Buddhist, a Hindu, I am all these things. The phrase new thought has become a popular, generalized term. Comprised of a very large number of churches, centers, prayer groups, and institutions this has become a metaphysical movement which reveals the oneness or unity of humankind with infinite life, the innate dignity and worth, or value, of every individual. In fact, and in truth, in new thought, the emphasis is toward the individual, 
rather than an organizational body or function. But, as we said, there is nothing new in new thought. Metaphysics actually is the oldest of all religious approaches. It reveals our purpose to express God, and the greater measures of the good. I am come to bring you life and that more abundantly. It reveals our identity. Children of the infinite, that we are loved and have spiritual value as necessary parts of the creative Holy Whole One. Metaphysics enables and assists us to return to our divine source, and ends the sense of separation and feeling of alienation, of wandering in a barren, unfriendly desert wasteland. Metaphysics has always been, is now, and ever will be available to all ever patiently waiting our discovery and revelation. Many thousands have been introduced to new thought through one or another of its advocates. Its formation was gradual, and usually considered to have begun with Phineas P. Quimby. In a fascinating article in New Thought magazine, Quimby wrote about his work in 1837. After experimenting with mesmerism for a period of years, he concluded that it was not the hypnotism itself, but the conditioning of the subconscious mind that led to the resulting changes. Although Quimby had very little formal education, he had a brilliant, investigative mind, and was a very original thinker. In addition to this, he was a prolific writer and diarist. Records have been published detailing the development of his findings. He eventually became a wonderful student of the Bible. He duplicated two-thirds of the Old and New Testament healings. He found that there was much confusion about the true meaning of many biblical passages which caused misunderstanding and misinterpretation of Jesus Christ in the Bible. All through the 20th century so many inspired teachers, authors, ministers, and lecturers contributed to the New Thought movement. Dr. Chaz E. Braden, of the University of Chicago, called these people, spirits in rebellion, because these men and women were truly spirits in rebellion to existing dogmatism, rituals, and creeds. Rebelling at inconsistencies caused the fear of religion. Dr. Braden became no longer content with status quo, and refused any longer to conform. New thought is an individual practice of the truths of life a gradual, containing process. We can learn a bit today, and even more tomorrow. Never will we experience a point where there can be nothing more to be discovered. It is infinite, boundless, and eternal. We have all the time we need eternity. Many are impatient with themselves, and with what they consider failures. Looking back, though, we discover that there have been periods of learning, and we needn't make these mistakes again. Progress may seem ever so slow, in patience, possess ye your soul. In Dr. Murphy's book, Pray Your Way Through It, The Revelation, he commented that heaven was noted as being, awareness, and earth, manifestation. Your new heaven is your new point of view your new dimension of consciousness. When we see, that is see spiritually, we then realize that in the absolute, all is blessed, harmony, boundless love, wisdom, absolute peace, perfection. Identify with these truths, calm the sea of fear, confidence, faith, and become stronger and surer. In the books in this series, Dr. Murphy has synthesized the profundities of this power and has put it into an easily understood and pragmatic form so that you can apply it immediately in your life. This book and the others in this series consist of a compilation of lectures, sermons and radio addresses in which Dr. Murphy discussed the techniques of maximizing your potential through the power of the subconscious mind. As Dr. Murphy was a Protestant minister, many of his examples and citations come from the Bible. The concepts these citations illustrate should not be viewed as sectarian. Indeed, the messages conveyed by them are universal and are preached in most religions and philosophies. He often reiterated that the essence of knowledge is in the law of life, the law of belief. It is not Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, or Hindu belief. It is pure and simple belief. Do unto others accordingly. His wife, Dr. Jean Murphy, continued his ministry after his death in 1981. In a lecture she gave in 1986, quoting her late husband, she reiterated his philosophy. I want to teach men and women of their divine origin, and the powers regnant within them. I want to inform that this power is within and that they are their own saviors and capable of achieving their own salvation. This is the message of the Bible and nine-tenths of our confusion today is due to wrongful, literal interpretation of the life-transforming truths offered in it. I want to reach the majority, the man on the street, the woman overburdened with duty and suppression of her talents and abilities. I want to help others at every stage or level of consciousness to learn of the wonders within. She said of her husband, 
He was a practical mystic, possessed by the intellect of a scholar, the mind of a successful executive, the heart of the poet. His message summed up was, You are the king, the ruler of your world for you are one with God. Dr. Murphy was a firm believer that it was God's plan for people to be healthy, prosperous and happy. He countered those theologians and others who claimed desire was evil and urged people to crush out all desire. He said that extinction of desire means apathy no feeling, no action. He preached that desire is a gift of God. It is all right to desire. It is health and wholesome to desire to become more and better than we were yesterday. Desire for health, abundance, companionship and security. How could these be wrong? Desire is behind all progress. Without desire nothing would be accomplished. It is the creative power and must be channeled constructively. For example, if poor, desire for wealth wells up from within. If ill, desire for health, lonely, desire for companionship, for love. We must believe we can improve our lives. A belief whether it is true, false or merely indifferent sustained over a period of time becomes assimilated and is incorporated into our mentality. Unless countermanded by belief of an opposite nature, sooner or later takes form and is expressed or experienced as fact, form, condition, circumstance, events of life. We have the power within us to change negative beliefs to positive ones and thereby change our lives for the better. You give the command and your subconscious mind will faithfully obey it. You will get a reaction or response from your subconscious mind according to the nature of the thought you hold in your conscious mind. Psychologists and psychiatrists point out that when thoughts are conveyed to your subconscious mind, impressions are made in the brain cells. As soon as your subconscious accepts any idea, it proceeds to put it into effect immediately. It works by association of ideas and uses every bit of knowledge that you have gathered in your lifetime to bring about its purpose. It draws on the infinite power, energy and wisdom within you. It lines up all the laws of nature to get its way. Sometimes it seems to bring about an immediate solution to your difficulties, but at other times it may take days, weeks or longer. The habitual thinking of your conscious mind establishes deep grooves in your subconscious mind. This is very favorable for you if your habitual thoughts are harmonious, peaceful and constructive. On the other hand, if you have indulged in fear, worry, and other destructive forms of thinking, the remedy is to recognize the omnipotence of your subconscious mind and decree freedom, happiness, perfect health and prosperity. Your subconscious mind, being creative and one with your divine source, will proceed to create the freedom and happiness that you have earnestly decreed. Now for the first time Dr. Murphy's lectures have been combined, edited and updated in six new books that bring his teachings into the 21st century. To enhance and augment Dr. Murphy's original lectures, we have incorporated material from some of Dr. Gene Murphy's lectures and have added examples of people whose success reflects Dr. Murphy's philosophy. The books in this series are Maximize Your Potential Through the Power of Your Subconscious Mind for a More Spiritual Life Maximize your potential through the power of your subconscious mind for an enriched life. Maximize your potential through the power of your subconscious mind for health and vitality. Maximize your potential through the power of your subconscious mind to create wealth and success. Maximize your potential through the power of your subconscious mind to develop self-confidence and self-esteem. Maximize your potential through the power of your subconscious mind to overcome fear and worry just reading these books will not improve your life. To truly maximize your potential, you must study these principles, take them to heart, integrate them into your mentality and apply them as an integral part of your approach to every aspect of your life. Arthur R. Pell, Ph.D. Editor, May 2005 Preface Self-confidence, the feeling you have about yourself that you can accomplish anything you set out to do, is the essential element in living a full and meaningful life. The main reason many people never succeed in their jobs, their business ventures and even their personal lives is their lack of this key ingredient. Why do people lack self-confidence? One common reason is that they have failed in some activity early in their lives and fear this will happen again. Another is that other people often their own parents were never satisfied with their performance in school or other matters and have left them with a feeling of inferiority. Still others have tasted success only to have it followed by some sort of failure and have let that failure dominate their minds and doom them to a lack of self-confidence in anything they do. Can this be changed? Of course, it can. In this book Dr. Joseph Murphy provides a sure fire cure for lack of self-confidence. 
It has worked for a multitude of his readers and listeners. It will work for you. Self confidence is an integral part of self esteem. Before you can gain the confidence in decisions you make, you must believe in yourself. You must truly feel that you are someone of worth. If you do not have self esteem, how can you be confident that your decisions are worthwhile? Too often, we are more concerned about what others think of us than what we think about ourselves. William Boatker, a mid 20th century clergyman and writer, admonished his readers Never mind what people think of you. They may overestimate or underestimate you. Until they discover your real worth, your success depends mainly upon what you think of yourself and whether you believe in yourself. You can succeed if nobody else believes it, but you will never succeed if you don't believe in yourself. Dr. Murphy will show you how prayer can help you program your subconscious mind to overcome negative feelings about yourself and build or rebuild self esteem and with that, self confidence. You may say that you have tried prayer and it doesn't work for you. Lack of confidence and too much effort is the reason you do not get an answer to your prayer. Many people block answers to their prayers by failing to fully comprehend the workings of the subconscious mind. When you know how your mind functions, you gain a measure of confidence. You must remember that whenever your subconscious mind accepts an idea, it immediately begins to execute it. It uses all its mighty resources to that end and mobilizes all the mental and spiritual laws of your deeper mind. This law is true for good or bad ideas. Consequently, if you use it negatively, it brings trouble, failure, and confusion. When you use it constructively, it brings guidance, freedom, and peace of mind. Wonderful results are inevitable when your thoughts are constructive, when you are in tune with the infinite, and when you have love and goodwill to all. Therefore, it is perfectly obvious that the only thing you have to do in order to overcome failure is to get your subconscious to accept your idea or request by feeling its reality now, and the law of your mind will do the rest. Turn over your request with faith and confidence, and your subconscious will take over and the answer will come. You will always fail to get results by trying to use mental coercion or force, saying, I tried so hard. Your subconscious mind does not respond to coercion. It responds to your faith or conscious mind acceptance. Your failure to get results may also arise from such statements as, Things are getting worse. I will never get an answer. I see no way out. It is hopeless. I don't know what to do. I'm all mixed up. When you use such statements, you get no response or cooperation from your subconscious mind. You are like a soldier marking time. You neither go forward nor backward. In other words, you don't get anywhere. Your subconscious is always controlled by the dominant idea. Your subconscious will accept the stronger of two contradictory propositions. The effortless way is the better. If you say, I want self confidence but I can't get it. I try so hard. I force myself to pray. I use all the willpower I have. You must realize that your error lies in your effort. Never try to compel the subconscious mind to accept your idea by exercising willpower. Such attempts are doomed to failure and you get the opposite of what you pray for. The quiet mind gets things done. In quietness and in confidence lie your strength, not in getting agitated and perturbed and becoming a seething cauldron over the conditions of the world. You can't change the world, but you can change yourself. You may disapprove of what people do. Certainly, people disapprove of mugging, raping, murder, and all this sort of thing. You do the best you can. You write to your political leaders, you participate in voting, and you cooperate with police, and do all the things. But the main thing is to keep your own mind quiet. Keep it in tune with the infinite, because agitation, turmoil, resentment, hatred, and anger solve no problems. They only make matters worse. You are pouring out more toxins, more effluvia on the mass mind. You are doing more harm than good. If you are suffering from inner turmoil, you can't help anyone. If you have low self esteem and lack self confidence, you'll be a poor companion, a poor parent, and a poor co worker. The degree of success in dealing with your problems is directly proportionate to your tranquility, your serenity, your peace of mind, your sense of poise and balance, your sense of inner insight, and also your realization that there is an infinite intelligence within you that guides and directs, and reveals to you the perfect plan, and shows you the way you should go. God is the living spirit almighty within you. It's the only creative power there is. It's the one power. There are not two powers, or three, or a thousand. Just one you may call it God, Allah, or Brahma. There's only one power, 
one creative power. Your thought is creative. Therefore, if you think good, good will follow and if you think evil, evil will follow, and if you think lack, lack will follow. If you think of God's riches, riches will follow. Your thought is creative. That's the only immaterial power you know, and that's God, too. What governs you? It is your estimates, your blueprints, and your beliefs about yourself. It is not the other person's belief about you. If someone says to you, you're a failure, you'll never amount to anything, what should you do? Say to yourself, I'm born to win, to succeed. I must succeed. I'm going to succeed in a remarkable and unique way. The power of the Almighty flows through me. Every time any person says you are going to fail, it's a stimulus to you to reinforce your faith in the Almighty power, which never fails. In other words, you have to wake up and stop blaming people. Stop blaming conditions. There is no one to blame but yourself. Sure, there will be failures, but that does not mean that you are a failure. You have within you the creative power to reverse failure, to move on to success. The other person doesn't control you. The power isn't in the other person to manipulate you except you permit it. Self-confidence grows within you with each success you have. Self-confidence grows even when you meet occasional failure because you know that the creative power of God is still with you and you believe in it and therefore in yourself. You are what you think you are. You create yourself in the image you have of yourself in your own mind. Self-esteem and self-confidence are nothing more than the projection of your image of yourself and if you maintain a strong positive self-image, you will be a happier and more successful person, a person able to hurdle over roadblocks no matter how difficult and achieve the goals you set for yourself. Chapter 1 Building Self-Confidence If you think of yourself as a failure and picture yourself as a failure, you will fail. Instead, think of success. Realize you are born to succeed and to win, for the infinite cannot fail. Picture yourself successful, happy, and free, and you will be. Whatever you think and feel is true in your conscious mind is embodied in your subconscious and comes to pass into your experience. That's the law of mind, undeviating, immutable, timeless, and changeless. We're not talking about faith in creeds, dogmas, traditions, or any religious persuasion. We are talking about faith in your own thought, your own feeling, in the laws of your own mind, and the goodness of God in the land of the living, faith in that creative intelligence that responds to your thought. You can have faith that you are going to be ill when exposed to a draft, or that you will catch the virus, or a severe cold because someone sneezes in your presence. You can even have faith that you will fail. In that case, your faith is in the wrong thing and your business ventures will turn out badly. A woman once said to me, For ten years I had absolute faith I would be alone through life, no one would marry me, and I would be poor and miserable. Then she said, I read your book, the power of your subconscious mind and I applied the prayers outlined. Now I am happily married, have a marvelous husband, and have been blessed with three lovely children. This woman reversed her faith in the negative to a joyous expectancy of the best in all phases of her life. Fear is faith in the wrong thing. Fear is faith upside down. Have faith in the goodness of God in the land of the living. Have faith in divine love. Have faith in the healing presence which made you to heal you. The law of this woman's mind responded to her belief, for the law of life is the law of belief. What do you believe in? To believe is to accept something as true. Believe in whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, believe in these things. Your greatest need is to believe in yourself, in what you are doing and in your ultimate destiny. Self-reliance, or self-confidence, finds its greatest outlet when it is accompanied by a belief that your real self is God and that with God all things are possible. The Bible gives the key to building spiritual self-reliance. But without faith it is impossible to please God. You must first believe that God is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Down through the ages all men and women who have possessed spiritual self-reliance have had a deep, abiding conviction that they were one with the God presence within. God is the living spirit within you and they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit has no face, form, or figure. It's timeless, shapeless, and ageless. You give your attention, your devotion, and your loyalty to the spirit within you that created the universe and created you. It's all-powerful, knows all, and sees all. 
when you are in tune with it, that infinite power responds to you, and you do marvelous things. Great people down through the ages were sure of themselves without being aggressive, egotistical, or intolerant. Jesus, Moses, Buddha, Laotes, Confucius, Muhammad and many others accomplished the so-called impossible through the absolute conviction that they could do what they set out to do through the divine power that strengthened and inspired them. They were all human, born like you were. You can accomplish little in this world without faith. Farmers, when they plant seeds, have faith in the science of agriculture. Chemists have faith in the laws and principles of chemistry. Medical professionals have faith in their knowledge of anatomy, physiology, materia medica, and pharmacology and surgery. Engineers have implicit faith in the laws of mathematics, stress and strain, and other principles of the universe. And they build a building according to scientific laws that existed before any human walked this earth or before any church was ever formed. You can have the same abiding faith in the laws of your own mind, which are the same yesterday, today, and forever. A person is living in the dark ages who thinks that the principles of chemistry, physics, and mathematics are different than the principles of laws operating in one's own mind. These mental and spiritual laws are just as dependable and undeviating as the laws of gravitation. We know for a fact that, think good, good follows. Think evil and evil follows. The first step in building self-reliance or self-confidence is to believe in that infinite power within you which grows hair on your face, digests your food, grows nails when you are sound asleep, and grows hair on your head. It watches over you when you are sound asleep. It governs your heartbeat and all the vital organs of your body, and all the processes of your body are controlled by that infinite intelligence. That's what we are talking about. For example, if you cut yourself, it heals you. If you burn yourself, it reduces the edema, gives you new tissue and skin. It always seeks to heal you. That's the life principle in you. And you know you are alive. You know you have a mind. And you know you have that spirit, because you can feel the spirit of joy, rapture, ecstasy, and love when you look into your child's eyes. All these are invisible, yet they are real. So, believe in that infinite power within you. Recognize and know that the self of you is God. That's your higher self. The living spirit within you that was never born, will never die. Water wets it not, fire burns it not, wind blows it not away. It's eternal. It is the very life principle in you, through you, and all around you. The second step is to commune regularly with this infinite presence and power. Have a vision, realizing you go where your vision is. And your vision is what you are mentally looking at, what you are giving attention to, what you are thinking quietly, silently, and feelingly at this moment. That's where you are going, and that's what's going to happen to you. Let your vision be on abundance, right action, inspiration, and divine guidance and you will become like the perennial mountain of snow that, when melted by the heat of the sun, flows downward like a river of life, giving nourishment and sustenance to the valleys. What difference does it make if you have floundered and failed many times? Now that you know the divine presence dwells within you, and that the infinite intelligence and infinite power and the infinite life principle is the God presence within you, you know it responds to you, wants you to be happy. Stir up that divine gift within you, Wake up the sleeping giant within you. Trust that creative intelligence within you, more so even than you ever trusted your human father or mother. When the thought I cannot do this comes to you, mentally affirm. But the divine presence can. It's infinitely powerful and nothing can oppose or challenge it. It's almighty. If the thought comes, look at all the difficulties and obstructions, realize, know, and say boldly to yourself. Infinite intelligence and infinite power knows no obstructions, delays, or impediments. Find an affirmation that counteracts all your negations and your life will become more blessed and beautiful through the years. You will find your obstructions and challenges will be transformed into opportunities. Your fear will turn to faith, and your doubt will turn into certainty that the infinite presence is within you, and wonders happen as you tune in upon it. I had an intensely interesting conversation with a hotel proprietor in Lisbon, Portugal. He told me that he had started out as a waiter in a small restaurant. When the boss would ask him to do something special, he would often say, I'm going to try to do it. His boss finally said to him, never say, I'm going to try. Say, I'm going to do it, and know that you can do it. Then the power will respond to you. He said, I profited from that advice, and I never again said, I'm going to try. 
I began to believe in myself. I know that infinite power dwells within me. His secret was. I'm going to do it. He began to affirm, perhaps a thousand times a day. I'm going to have a big hotel and own it. He believed that through the power of the infinite he would do exactly that. The answer came in a strange way. He continued. I won at roulette in Monaco the equivalent of $100,000 in American money. I opened this hotel, and now I have paid off the mortgage. I have prospered beyond my fondest dreams. This man said he had felt an overwhelming urge to go to the tables at Monaco, and he asked a friend to accompany him and show him the ropes. He knew he would win. It was an inner silent knowing of the soul. He had fabulous winnings, and when he had enough money $100,000 for a deposit on his hotel, he stopped and never gambled again. This was the way his subconscious mind answered his prayer for a hotel of his own. The ways of your subconscious are past finding out. Money is just an idea, a symbol of exchange. There is nothing evil in the universe, nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Good and evil are the movements of our own minds relative to the infinite life principle within us, which is forever perfect, whole, and complete in itself. Make up your mind now, this minute, that you can do what you want to do and can be what you sincerely want to be, and can have what you wish to possess, and it will be done unto you as you believe. Follow the age-old maxim. Be sure you are right, then go ahead. Let nothing move you or shake your conviction. Make it a part of your mentality and with this kind of belief you will inevitably succeed and move forward in life. What is it that the immensely wealthy person or the prominent business executive possesses that you do not? Only one thing. It is self-reliance or self-confidence. They believe in themselves and the powers within them, both of which, of course, mean the same thing. Self-reliance and self-confidence are one. Confidence means with faith. Faith in a principle, and the powers of your mind. Just like an engineer has faith in the principles of mathematics faith in the principle of strain and stress. The first step in building self-reliance or self-confidence is to believe in that infinite power within you. They place their whole reliance on that infinite guiding principle, on the divine love and divine protection in all ways. Their words, actions, demeanor, and general attitude radiate power and confidence. Thus, they win your respect the first time you meet them. Last year I interviewed a man in Hilo, Hawaii. Her was very wealthy. He sadly said to me, I am nobody. No one cares for me. Frankly, no one did, for the simple reason that he didn't respect or care for the self within him. He was down on himself. If you are cruel or mean to yourself, others will be cruel and mean to you. For as within, so without. This man was down on himself. Even though he had vast holdings of real estate and large bank deposits. I explained to him that he was constantly criticizing and belittling himself and that doing that, others must treat him the same way, and that if he expected to accomplish precisely nothing of himself, neither would anyone expect any more of him. For as within, so without. The inside controls the outside. I pointed out to him that the riches of the infinite were within him and all around him. Shakespeare said, All things be ready if the mind be so. All he had to do was to call on the infinite presence and power, and it would respond to his thought. He began to use some of the great eternal truths of the Bible which I outlined for him as follows. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall make plain thy paths. Trust him. Believe in him, and he shall bring it to pass. This is the way the Lord created you. Rejoice and be glad that the infinite being created you, and know it is always with you and is capable of healing you, restoring you, vitalizing and energizing you. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. God in the midst of you is healing you now. In a nutshell if you think of yourself as a failure and picture yourself as a failure, you will fail. Think of success. Realize you were born to succeed and to win, for the infinite cannot fail. Picture yourself successful, happy, and free, and you will be. Whatever you think and feel is true in your conscious mind is embodied in your subconscious and comes to pass into your experience. That's the law of mind, undeviating, 
immutable, timeless, and changeless. Your greatest need is to believe in yourself, in what you are doing, and in your ultimate destiny. Self-reliance, or self-confidence, finds its greatest outlet when it is accompanied by a belief that your real self is God and that with God all things are possible. The first step in building self-reliance or self-confidence is to believe in that infinite power within you. What is it that the immensely wealthy person or the prominent business executive possesses that you do not? Only one thing. It is self-reliance or self-confidence. They believe in themselves and the powers within them, both of which, of course, mean the same thing. Self-reliance or self-confidence are one. Confidence means with faith, faith in a principle, and the powers of your mind. The first step in building self-reliance or self-confidence is to believe in that infinite power within you. Make up your mind now, this minute, that you can do what you want to do and can be what you sincerely want to be, and can have what you wish to possess, and it will be done unto you as you believe. Chapter 2 Learn to Love Yourself One of the most profound and deep-seated longings of the heart is to gain the recognition of your true worth, to be respected, loved and esteemed. In the Bible we are told to, love thy neighbor as thyself. You cannot truly love your neighbor unless you love yourself. Carlyle said, one of the god-like things of this world is the veneration done to human worth by the heart of men. In the eighth psalm we read, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou maddest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep, and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. In this beautiful poem, David speaks eloquently and beautifully of the tremendous potentialities within humankind. Today we are witnessing the works of infinite intelligence through our countless new discoveries. Scientists inform us that we are living in an age of light and supersonic speed, electronics and atomic power. All of these miracles of the air, space and sea come out of human mind. Mathematicians have said that the only abstractions can explain the world and that only physicists and mathematicians can understand events that transpire today on land, on the sea and in the air. Today we are penetrating and navigating the waters of the deeper mind and are gradually becoming aware of the kingdom of God within us. Research work at Duke University and other academic laboratories is revealing the powers of the mind and such discoveries as telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience, telekinesis, extrasensory travel, precognition, retrocognition, and marvelous powers of the mind. I received a letter from a woman in Arizona in which she said that her sister-in-law and mother-in-law disapproved of her and had told her bluntly that they preferred her husband's former wife. They never invited her to their homes but always asked her husband to visit them alone. Furthermore, although she tried her utmost to be nice to them, they criticized her meals, her home, her clothing, and her speech. This woman said that she felt inferior and rejected, and she asked me. Why do they do this? What's wrong with me? In reply, I pointed out that she had been suffering unnecessarily and without real warrant, that she had the power to refuse and reject the poisonous statements of her in-laws their rudeness and their incivility. I explained further to her that she didn't create her mother-in-law or sister-in-law and that she was not responsible for their jealous, envious attitudes and complexes. I told her to stop placing them on a pedestal and stop being a doormat for them. A doormat is something one walks on. If you think you're a worm, everyone is going to step on you. I added that it was quite possible that her charm, graciousness, kindness and wonderful character annoyed them and that they possibly got a sadistic satisfaction in disturbing her. I suggested that she break off all relations with them and cease debasing herself by toting to them. I told her that she needed an attitude of self-respect and self-esteem. In other words, she had to love herself, for the real self of you is God. I gave her the following prayer to be used. I completely surrender my in-laws to God. God made them, and he sustains them. I radiate love, peace and goodwill to them, and I wish for them all the blessings of heaven. I am a child of God. God loves me and cares for me. When a negative thought of anger, fear, self-criticism, self-condemnation or resentment enters my mind, I immediately supplant it with the thought of God in the midst of me. I know I have complete dominion over my thoughts and emotions. 
I am a child of the divine. I now redirect all my feelings and emotions along harmonious, constructive lines. Only God's ideas enter my mind bringing me harmony, health and peace. Whenever I am prone to demean or demote myself, I will boldly affirm. I exalt God in the midst of me. I am one with God, and one with God is a majority. If God be for me, who can be against me? This woman had a complete transformation in her mind and heart as she followed these simple instructions that I gave her. She said, the prayer has worked wonders for me. My husband said to me the other day, you are beaming. What happened to you? A few years ago I had a consultation with a salesman who said he was timid, shy, resentful and looking upon the world as harsh and cruel. Actually, he was trying to escape from trying to take his rightful dominion over life. He said that his wife, his boss and his associates did not appreciate him and that even his children looked down on him. The cause of all this was that this young man had an inner sense of insecurity and inadequacy. He was down on himself. He was mean to himself. And when you are cruel or mean to yourself, the whole world will be cruel to you. For as within, so without. He asked me. How can I gain the appreciation of others? First, of course, he has to have self-appreciation. He must appreciate himself, get a new estimate of himself, a new blueprint. I explained to this young man the truth about himself and how to love and appreciate himself more along the following lines. If you demote, despise and deprecate yourself, you can't lift up or give esteem, goodwill and respect to others. For it is a cosmic law of mind that we are constantly projecting our thoughts, feelings and beliefs onto others. And what we send out comes back to us. We are all children of the infinite, and all of the qualities and powers of God are within us, waiting to be expressed. Certainly, you should love, honor and exalt that divine presence within you. We must love and honor the indwelling God. You are the temple of the living God. God dwells within you, walks and talks in you. Love of self in the true biblical meaning is to honor, recognize, exalt, respect and give your allegiance to the living spirit within you. It is to have a healthy, reverent, wholesome respect for the divinity. It has nothing at all to do with egoism, selfishness or self-aggrandizement, or narcissism, or anything of that nature. On the contrary, it is a wholesome veneration of the divinity within you, for you are the temple of the living God. Supreme intelligence made you, created you, animates and sustains you. Give your allegiance to it. You don't give power to any created thing. You don't give power to sticks and stones, our conditions, circumstances, stars, men or women, or the atmosphere, or any created thing. The moment you do, you cease to love, which means to be loyal, to the supreme cause, substance and power. The sovereign spirit within you is the supreme cause. Therefore, scientific thinkers do not give power to a created thing. They do not give power to the phenomenalistic world. They give power to the spirit, the creative power within them. Then you love the self, the real self of you. When you honor and exalt God within yourself, you will automatically honor and respect the divinity in others. But if you do not love the self of you, you cannot give love to your wife, your husband, or anybody. You just can't. Because you can't give what you don't have. You appropriate this divine love within you by honoring and venerating. As Emerson says, I, the imperfect, adore the perfect. The infinite which lies stretched in smiling repose within you. Exalt God in the midst of you. Glorify God in your body for you are a temple of the living God. When you honor, respect and love the self of you, you will automatically love, esteem and honor others. The salesman listened carefully and avidly and then said to me, I never heard it explained that way before. I can see clearly what I have been doing. I have been down on myself, and I've been full of prejudices, ill will and bitterness. And what I have been sending out has reverberated back to me. I have gained a true insight into myself. This salesman practiced affirming the following truths with deep sincerity several times a day. Learning to love the self. Learning to know the self, too. Knowing that these truths would sink down from his conscious to his subconscious mind and, like seeds, come forth after their kind. This is the prayer. I know that I can give only what I have. From this moment forward I am going to have a wholesome, reverent and deep respect for my real self, which is God. I am an expression of God, and God hath need of me where I am. Otherwise, I would not be here. From this moment forward I honor, respect and salute the divinity in all my associates and all people everywhere. 
I hold the self of every person in veneration and esteem. I am one with the infinite. I am a tremendous success. And I wish for all what I wish for myself. I am at peace. Yes, learn to love yourself. And learn the true meaning of love yourself. The self of you is the divinity within you. Love in the Bible is to give your allegiance, devotion and loyalty to it, refusing to give power to any created thing. I want to emphasize that because if you are worshipping stars, suns, moons or things, you have no God. You have wandered away from the divine. This young man has transformed his life. He is no longer timid, shy or resentful, or apologizing for being alive, or a doormat. He has gone ahead by leaps and bounds, and so can you. Learn to love your true self. Then you will learn to love and respect others. If you are down on yourself, that is, if you condemn yourself or you are mean to yourself, you can't think well of others, for you project your feelings, mood and tone onto others. There is the type of mother who neglects herself. She wears old clothes, eats cheap food, and gives the best to the children. She eats donuts and gives them filet mignon. I suppose she thinks she's noble. That's a very poor example to her children. She should wear the best clothes and eat the best food. Cleanliness is next to godliness. She should also teach her children of the riches of the infinite. God made you rich. Why, then, are you poor? God gave you richly all things to enjoy. Prentice Mulford, one of the early proponents of the New Thought movement, wrote about this type of woman. He said, This woman says, I am an old and decaying, weather beaten hulk and can't hold myself together much longer. All I can do is to become a footbridge for the children in the shape of a nurse, a cook, and a servant. And, of course, that isn't a very good example. She has to love the self and honor it, and also honor the divinity in her own children by telling them who they are. They are all children of the infinite and also children of eternity. I had a letter from a man who stated he couldn't understand why everybody around him annoyed him. I asked him to come and see me. In talking with him, I discovered that he was constantly rubbing others the wrong way. He did not like himself, he was down on himself. He was full of self-condemnation. Self-condemnation and self-criticism are the most destructive mental poisons. They send psychic pus all over your system and rob you of vitality, enthusiasm, and energy, and leave you a physical and a mental wreck. Exalt God in the midst of you always. Whenever you are prone to criticize yourself, say, I exalt God in the midst of me, mighty to heal. If it's a thousand times a day, do it. And after a while you begin to do it automatically, and you will like yourself and love yourself more. This man spoke in a very tense, irritable tone. His tone of speech grated on one's nerves. He thought mainly of himself and was highly critical of others. I explained to him that while his unhappy experiences seemed to be with other people, his relationship with them was determined by his thoughts and feelings about himself and them. I elaborated on the fact that if he despises himself he cannot have goodwill and respect for others. It is a law of mind that he is always projecting his thoughts and feelings onto his associates and all those around him. He began to realize that as long as he projected feelings of prejudice, ill will and contempt for others, that is exactly what he would get back. Because his world is but an echo of his moods and attitudes, I gave him a mental and spiritual formula that enabled him to overcome his irritation and arrogance. He decided to write consciously the following thoughts in his subconscious mind, which is called the Book of Life. I practice the golden rule from now on, which means that I think, speak and act towards others as I wish others to think, speak and act toward me. I walk serenely on my way, and I am free, for I give freedom to all. I sincerely wish peace, prosperity and success to all. I am always poised, serene and calm. The peace of God floods my mind and my whole being. Others appreciate and respect me as I appreciate myself. Life is honoring me greatly, for it has provided for me abundantly. The petty things of life no longer irritate me. When fear, worry, doubt or criticisms by others knock at my door, faith in goodness, truth and beauty opens the door of my mind and there is no one there. The suggestions and statements of others have no power to disturb me. The only power is the movement of my own thought. When I think God's thoughts, God's power is with my thoughts of good. He affirmed these truths morning and night, putting feeling and life into them. And he committed the whole prayer to memory. He poured into these words life, love and meaning, 
and by osmosis these ideas gradually penetrated the layers of his subconscious mind. Then, he said, a few weeks later, I know full well that my new understanding of my mind and how it works has changed my entire life. I am learning how to specialize myself out of the law of averages. I am getting along fine, and I received two promotions in the past two months. I now know the truth of the passage. If I be lifted up I draw all men unto me. That means all manifestations unto you. As you lift this divine presence up, as you lift the idea of yourself up, get a new concept of yourself, a new estimate, and a new blueprint. Appreciate yourself. All of us want esteem. We want our children to like us and love us. We want our family to appreciate us. We want the boss and our associates to think well of us. But if you don't think well of yourself and you think you're an old worm or something, and, as I said before, everybody's going to step on you. So, this young man learned that the trouble was within himself, and he decided to change his thoughts, feelings and reactions. Any man can do the same. It takes decision. Stick to it iveness and a keen desire to transform oneself. Go now and do likewise. An astronomer friend of mine said to me that for years he had scanned the heavens seeking the answer to the story of creation and the riddle of the universe through the telescope, but that lately he has been looking within himself, who is inevitably at the small end of the telescope. He added that the small end of the telescope is the important end, for within us is God, the living spirit almighty, the life principle and the entire secret of creation is there, and the mystery of the cosmos. When we learn about ourselves we will have learned about the universe. Now it is time to analyze the analyzer. In trying to find happiness, peace and prosperity outside of ourselves we have neglected to look within ourselves to the infinite storehouse of riches within our subconscious mind. Where will you find poise, balance, peace and happiness but in your own mind? Through your own thoughts, feelings and a sense of oneness with the eternal verities and spiritual values of life. Listen to what Shakespeare said. How could you be mean to yourself? How could you say, like one woman did to me, I'm nobody? Imagine saying that. She is a child of the infinite, a daughter of eternity, a child of the living God. God gave her everything. God gave himself to her. The very life of her is God, for God is life and that is her life now. William Shakespeare said, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action how like an angel, in understanding, how like a god. After you read that or hear it, wouldn't you have a new estimate of yourself? Wouldn't you have a new respect for that self of you, which started your heartbeat, and watches over you when you are sound asleep? And if you say, I want to get up at two in the morning, it will wake you up exactly on the dot even if there is no clock in the room? Emerson said, There is one mind common to all individuals, everyone is an inlet to the same and all of the same. He also said, He who's admitted to the right of reason is a free man of the holy state. Begin to believe this. Realize that infinite intelligence, the guiding principle of the universe, is within you. It is your higher self. I am not talking about your ego now, or your intellect. I am talking about the infinite being within you that heals a cut on your finger that governs all of your vital organs when you are sound asleep. It is governing all the processes and functions of your body. You have the capacity to make choices, use your imagination, all the other powers of God within you. Your mind is God's mind, for there is only one mind. When you consciously, decisively and constructively use the infinite wisdom within you, you become free, as Emerson said, of the holy state. Emerson inspires you to enlarge the concept of yourself when he announces this profound truth. What Plato has thought, man may think. What a saint has felt, he may feel. What at any time has fallen any man, he can understand. Who has access to the universal mind is a party to all that is or can be done, for this is the only and sovereign agent. That's how wonderful you are. Emerson was America's greatest philosopher, one of the greatest thinkers of all times. He was constantly in tune with the infinite, and he urged all of us to release the infinite potentialities within us. Emerson taught the dignity and grandeur of humankind and pointed out to his listeners that the great appeared to us great only because we are on our knees, that we attribute greatness to Plato and others because they acted upon what they, themselves, thought and not upon what other people believed or what others thought they should think. Begin to have a lofty, noble and dignified concept of yourself. Here's a letter from a woman. She said, 
My husband left me a year ago for a younger woman. I suffered from such intense rage that my doctor said the sudden precipitation of arthritis was caused by my emotional shock, anger, hostility and hatred. Every day for the past three months I have claimed boldly, as you suggested, that my body is a temple of the living God and that I glorify God in my body. Every day for the past several months, for about 15 minutes every morning, afternoon and evening, I affirm that God's love permeates every atom of my being, and his heavenly being saturates my whole being. I also prayed for my ex-husband. I knew in my heart and soul when God's love came into my heart all hate would go out. Love casts out hate. Peace casts out pain. Joy casts out sadness. There has been a remarkable change in my body. The edema and excruciating pain has subsided. The suppleness and mobility of my joints have improved remarkably. And the calcareous deposits are gradually disappearing. My medical doctor is delighted, and so am I. I continue to realize that I am a child of God and that God loves me and cares for me. I know that this new self appraisal has brought wonders in my life. All hatred of my ex husband has gone, and I am on the way to perfect health. Divine law and order governs me. Yes. You can exalt God in the midst of you, too, as the Bible says, mighty to heal. And as you honor it and appreciate it and realize that you are the temple where God dwells, then you listen to the soft tread of the unseen guest. There is the intimacy of the divine presence knocking at the door of your heart. It opens from the inside, you know. Open your mind and heart right now. Let in the influx of the Holy Spirit. Realize his river of peace flows through you. Realize the infinite ocean of God's love saturates your whole being. You are bathed by the light and you are immersed in the holy omnipresence. Continue to realize that you are a son of the living God, and wonders will happen in your life, too. This woman discovered what the power of her true appraisal, of her real self can do. She found that when she began to think of herself as a temple wherein God dwells, and as she began to honor, exalt and call upon this divine presence, it responded with the emotions of love, peace, harmony, confidence, joy, vitality, wholeness and goodwill. As she began to love and respect herself, she discovered that all hatred vanished and love rushed in to fill up the vacuum. Love is the fulfilling of the law of health, happiness, success and prosperity, for the law is, you are what you contemplate. As a man thinketh in his heart not in his head so is he. And the heart is your subconscious mind. Therefore, what you really feel and believe deep down in your heart will always be made manifest, for it is belief expressed. Believe in the goodness of God in the land of the living. Believe in the guidance of that infinite spirit within you. For God is spirit. They that worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. Therefore, you worship no man on the face of the earth, for then you would not be worshipping God. To worship is to give your supreme adoration and veneration to that higher self in you to count it worthy of supreme attention and devotion, and refusing to give power to any created thing, man, woman or child. Know that the God in the other is the same God in you. Therefore, if you hurt the other you would be hurting yourself. That would be foolish. Knowing this, you practice a magnificent formula. Say to yourself, I bless and exalt the good in the other. I exalt God in the midst of me. I also honor and exalt God in the midst of the other person. If you are married, salute the divinity in your wife or husband. Claim that what is true of God is true of him or her. Then the marriage will grow more blessed through the years. Many are scavengers, you know. They are constantly dwelling upon each other's shortcomings. They are full of peeves and grudges. Then, of course, they are divorced from love and harmony. For divorce is of the mind. When you are divorced from your marriage vows, you are truly divorced. Psychologists tell us that each of us creates a script for our lives. This script may be one of high self-esteem and optimism or one of low self-esteem and pessimism. One that makes us happy or one that makes us troubled. Please do not interpret this to mean that people with high self-esteem are always cheerful and optimistic and those with low self-esteem are always depressed. All of us go through phases of life when things may not go well. The difference is that those with high self-esteem bounce back more easily than those who do not. People with high self-esteem have written positive scripts for themselves. They like themselves. Is it important to like yourself? Of course it is. God commanded that we love the Lord our God with all our might, with all our strength, with all our being. 
and the Eternal One created humankind in God's image. High self-esteem is basic to self-respect and to respect for God. Many people who have had low opinions of themselves have been able to overcome this by taking steps to enhance their self-esteem. Sometimes with professional help, but often by self-determination they have rewritten the scripts on which they base their lives. Unfortunately, low self-esteem or worse, self-loathing, may have deep psychological roots. In such cases, professional assistance is needed to overcome it. However, most of us do not loathe ourselves. We may have temporary slumps in our self-esteem that need bolstering. If these slumps are not dealt with, they may lead to more serious consequences. We don't need a psychologist. We can do it ourselves. Encouragement from a friend, a spouse, a pastor, or a boss, is helpful, but even without such a support person, we can do it. All of us have had both successes and failures in our lives. There are two consequences of failure. One is the tangible aspect the problem itself. The other is the intangible the depression and loss of self-esteem that accompanies failure. We have learned how to handle the tangible problems by dealing with the pragmatics of the situation. Coping with the psychological aspects is more complex. But it can be done. It must be done. Otherwise we fall into depression, become self-loathers and doom ourselves to misery and continued failure. We have written a script of low esteem. We can overcome this by concentrating on our achievements and successes. When we feel depressed, when our self-esteem is at low ebb, instead of sulking about this failure, reflect on our past accomplishments. We did it before. We can do it again. This reinforces our self-esteem. It enables us to change the script in our minds from bewailing failure to savoring success. Self-esteem is perishable. It must be constantly nourished and reinforced. Just as the coach of an athletic team reaches out to motivate the team with a pep talk to instill enthusiasm, self-confidence and to prod them to put all their efforts to win the game, we need pep talks too. We need pep talks when our enthusiasm for life wanes, when we are depressed, when we have suffered failures. But where's the coach? We have to be our own coaches. Have you ever given yourself a pep talk? To change the scripts in our minds, we must give ourselves pep talks. We must remind ourselves that we are good, that we are winners, that we will succeed. But we also have a higher level coach. God. Prayer can be a means of helping overcome depression and pessimism. Prayer invites God to let His presence suffuse our spirits, to let His will prevail in our lives. Prayer cannot bring water to parched fields, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city, but prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart and rebuild a weakened will. Our self-esteem governs our lives. In our youth it pushes us forward, in our middle years, it sustains us and in our late years, it renews us. We must replace those negative words in our personal scripts with positive words. Instead of words of despair, words of hope. Instead of words failure, words of success. Instead of words of defeat, words of victory. Instead of words of worry, words of encouragement. Instead of words of apathy, words of enthusiasm. Instead of words of hate, words of love. The prayer is that we all should feed into our minds through our thoughts and into our souls through our prayers are the words of encouragement, the words of love, the words of self-esteem. Yes, unless we love ourselves, we cannot love our neighbor, nor can we truly love God. In a nutshell you have to love yourself, for the real self of you is God. When you honor and exalt God within yourself, you will automatically honor and respect the divinity in others. But if you do not love the self of you, you cannot give love to your wife, your husband, or anybody. You just can't. Because you can't give what you don't have. If you despise yourself, you cannot have goodwill and respect for others. It is a law of mind that we are always projecting our thoughts and feelings onto our associates and all those around us. In trying to find happiness, peace and prosperity outside of ourselves we have neglected to look within ourselves to the infinite storehouse of riches within our subconscious mind. Where will you find poise, balance, peace and happiness but in your own mind? Through your own thoughts, feelings and a sense of oneness with the eternal verities and spiritual values of life. People with high self-esteem have written positive scripts for themselves. They like themselves. Is it important to like yourself? Of course it is. God commanded that we love the Lord our God with all our might, with all our strength, with all our being. And the Eternal One created humankind in God's image. 
High self-esteem is basic to self-respect and to respect for God. When we feel depressed, when our self-esteem is at low ebb, instead of sulking about this failure, reflect on our past accomplishments. We did it before. We can do it again. This reinforces our self-esteem. It enables us to change the script in our minds from bewailing failure to savoring success. Feed into your minds through your thoughts and into your souls through your prayers the words of encouragement, the words of love, the words of self-esteem. Yes, unless you love yourself, you cannot love your neighbor, nor can you truly love God. Chapter 3, Love and a New Self-Image. You can get a new image of yourself. Yes, you can develop a new self-image. The word, image, is related to the term, imagination. Imagination is called the workshop of God. Imagination clothes all ideas and gives them form. Artists, through the divine artistry of the imagination, clothed all the wonderful ideas with pictorial form. In the act of imagination, that which is hidden in your deeper self is made manifest. By imagination, what exists in latency or is asleep within you is given form and thought. We contemplate that which has hitherto been unrevealed. Let us take some examples. When you were preparing for your wedding, you had a vivid, realistic picture in your mind. With your power of imagination you saw the minister, priest, or rabbi. You heard him or her pronounce the words, saw the flowers, the church, and you heard the music. You imagined the ring on your finger. You traveled through your imagination on your honeymoon to Europe, Niagara, or somewhere else. All this was formed by images in your mind. Likewise, before graduation a beautiful scenic drama was taking place in your mind. You had clothed all your ideas about graduation in form. You imagined the professor or the president of the college giving you your diploma. You saw all the students dressed in caps and gowns. You heard your mother, father, and your friends congratulate you. You felt the embrace and the kiss. It was all real, dramatic, exciting, and wonderful. Images appear freely in your mind as if from nowhere. But you know, and must admit, there was and is an internal creator with power to mold all these forms which you saw in your mind and endow them with life, motion, and voice. These images said to you, for you only we live. Do you want to be greater than you are? Do you want to be grander, greater, nobler, or more godlike than you now are? Do you want good digestion? Well, you must give up fear, grudges, peeves, and self-condemnation. You must give to get, you know. You must give up negative thinking in order to practice constructive thinking. Do you love the person you want to be? Give up the person you now are. Are you willing to let go of the old so that you might experience the new? Often you have said, oh, I'll buy that idea. Well, we are all exchanging the old for the new. If you have some merchandise on your shelves, and it's old and dilapidated or dusty, you don't throw it out. You replace it with new merchandise on the shelf. Likewise, what is it you want to be? Imagine you are now doing what you long to do. A young woman who attended our meetings wanted to be an actress. She was a wonderful dancer and singer. She imagined she was on the stage, and in her imagination she was dancing. It was all vivid and real. She was also singing in majestic cadences all in her mind. She saw an imaginary audience. She visualized her mother and her friends congratulating her. She experienced the embrace of her mother telling her how wonderful she was and what a marvelous performance, and how wonderfully she sang. She heard all this. It was vivid and real. She lived the role in her mind over and over again and it paid off. Some months later she got a wonderful contract in Las Vegas. Since then she has also appeared in Reno. In other words, she began to imagine what she wanted to be, and she lived the role. She loved the role. She got a new image of herself she loved it so much. She became entranced and fascinated with the idea. For love is a fascination. You can fall in love with music, you can fall in love with art, and you can fall in love with the law. You can sit down and contemplate health, happiness, peace of mind, abundance, security, right action, harmony, inspiration, guidance. You can dwell on these things, give them your attention, devotion, loyalty. You, too, can become entranced, fascinated, absorbed and engrossed, and the law of your subconscious will respond. As you think in your heart or subconscious, so are you. So will you act, and so will you become. It is not as you think in your head, but in your heart because these ideas have to be emotionalized and felt as true. Any thought, any idea, 
that you dwell upon induces and evokes a certain response and emotion. When you continue to do that, it sinks into your subconscious, impregnates your subconscious, and becomes compulsive. Therefore, you are compelled to be, to do, and to express that which you meditated on. That's the law of your subconscious mind. You can love that law. Because you can create what you want, and love casts out fear, and all the fear goes away as you fall in love with a higher image of yourself. You can begin now. There is a wonderful opportunity for you to dwell upon these great truths. Where do all these vivid pictures come from? Keats said that there is an ancestral wisdom in us. We can, if we wish, drink that old wine of heaven. He used his imagination wisely when he was confronted with difficulties and predicaments. His biographers point out that he was accustomed to fill many hours wisely holding imaginary conversations. It is well known that his custom was to imagine one of his friends before him in a chair answering in the right way. In other words, if he were concerned over any problems, he imagined his friend was giving him the appropriate answer accompanied with the usual gestures, tonal qualities of the voice, making the entire imaginary scene as real and vivid as possible. So, imagination is the workshop of God. A businessman whose affairs are prospering but who dwells in negativity is another example of the destructive use of imagination. He comes home from the office. He runs a motion picture in his mind of failure, sees the shelves empty, and imagines himself going into bankruptcy, an empty bank balance, and the business closed down. Yet all the while he is actually prospering. There is no truth whatever in that negative mental picture of his. It is a lie made out of whole cloth. In other words, the thing he fears does not exist, save in his morbid imagination. The failure will never come to pass except if he keeps up that morbid picture charged with the emotion of fear. If he constantly indulges in this mental picture, he will, of course, bring failure to pass. He has a choice of failure or success, but he chose failure. In the science of imagination you eliminate all the mental impurities, such as fear, worry, destructive inner talking, self-condemnation, and the mental union with other miscellaneous negatives. You must focus all your attention on your ideal. Just as that girl focused all her attention on being the great dancer and the great singer, you must refuse to be swerved from your purpose or aim in life. As you get mentally absorbed in the reality of your ideal, you are falling in love with a higher image of yourself. You love it, and you remain faithful to it. And you will see your desire take form in your world. In the book of Joshua it says, Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Let your choice be. I am going to imagine whatever things are lovely and of good report, whatever thing is noble, whatever is wonderful, whatever gives me greater peace and greater health, greater vitality and greater wealth. Think on these things. When your desire is in conflict with your imagination, the imagination always wins. Alcoholics know that if they try to overcome alcoholism by willpower, they set the law of reversed effort into application. They get the opposite of that which they are praying for, and they fail. They are actually driving themselves to drink, because they are thinking of drink, they are looking at the glass, and that's what is in their minds. But when they focus attention on peace of mind, sobriety, and divinity, realizing an almighty power is backing them up, only then they will overcome. Do not try to overcome alcoholism or any negative habit by willpower. All you are doing is mentally dwelling on the drink or the bad habit. Every idea, every desire, has its own mathematics and mechanics with it, and it executes itself, just like every seed has its own mathematics and mechanics with it. It's the nature of an acorn to become a tree, an oak tree, and it's the nature of an apple seed to become an apple tree. The more you think of the drink, the more you are caught up in the compulsion of the drink. Because whatever you give your attention to, your subconscious magnifies and multiplies. As you continue to give attention to it, you become compelled to do that thing. Imagine yourself in balance, in poise. Imagine yourself serene, calm, relaxed, doing what you love to do. I knew an attorney in New York who was an alcoholic and ended up in the gutter. He became a panhandler. He sincerely wanted to overcome his alcoholism. At my suggestion, he imagined he was back at his desk, clean-shaven, a wonderful suit of clothes, and before the judge, pleading the case of a client. All this was in imagination. He was running a motion picture in his own mind. He said, that's what I want to be back in the old role of an attorney pleading for his client, helping them, giving them advice, and so on. He lived that role. 
When the shakes or the jitters came, or the temptation came, he flashed the picture in his mind. He did it again, and again, and again. And, naturally, by osmosis, it sank into his subconscious mind. The subconscious took over and compelled him to sobriety and peace of mind. No, we are not talking about daydreaming. If you look at the top of the mountain and you say, Oh, I couldn't get there. I'm too old. I haven't got a chance. No but real imagination is looking at the top of the mountain and putting a foundation under it and saying, I'm going to climb to the top. And you will because you have made up your mind. We are not talking about idle fancy. You must have confidence in what you are doing and why you are doing it. Then you will get results. In spite of the way you feel, imagine yourself as being what you want to be. Insist on a magnificent performance, even though you think you are a failure. Even though you may not have any great desire to do so, discipline your mind. Call back the negative imagery. Direct your imagination, your attention, again and again on the way you want to go and the thing you want to be. And you will become it. Cast yourself in the role of being and doing what at present you seem not to have the wish or the inclination to be or to do. Do it over and over again like you learn to walk, or play golf, or swim. As you continue to do it, your subconscious assimilates that pattern. Then it becomes second nature, which is the response of your subconscious to your conscious thinking and acting. It's an automatic response. So, do it over and over again until it is reasonable, until it is acceptable in your mind. It becomes a living part of you. Yes, you must imagine the role. You must imagine the role and live that role, and you will be building supports and strengths because an almighty power will respond and you will be compelled to sobriety and to peace of mind. For that's the law of your mind. Some time ago I flew up to Reno at the request of a couple who had lived together for 20 years and were now contemplating divorce. In talking to the husband and wife, I found that she was in the habit of always belittling her husband. She admitted that she frequently screamed obscenities at him in restaurants and at private social gatherings. His complaint was that she was constantly accusing him of infidelities, all of which were imaginary on her part. This woman suffered from extreme outbursts of temper, was intensely jealous, and was obstinate in that she refused to admit that she was in any way responsible for the marital conflict. The husband was passive, very quiet, completely subservient to her moods, and tyrannical outbursts. Of course, you are undoubtedly coming to the conclusion that for a man to put up with this sort of behavior on the part of his wife indicates that he is sick, also. Yes, he is sick, very sick. A doormat, you know, is something you walk on. You are here to stand up for your rights, your privileges, and your prerogatives. You are here to stand up to that which is true, and to say yes to life. Say yes to all the ideas that heal, bless, inspire, elevate. Say no to all these things that are false. Say no to anyone who wants to drag you down. Say no to all the lies in the world. And absolutely refuse to accept them. This woman said that she had come from a home where her mother was dominant and who bossed her father and cheated on him right and left. She elaborated, my mother had no morals. My mother was cruel. She was sloppy. My father was a fool. He was easygoing blind to what was going on and completely subservient to my mother. I explained to her why she was acting the way she was. There is an old saying. The explanation is the cure. First of all, she had received no love or real affection as a child. Her mother had probably been jealous of her, making her feel inferior and unwanted. Consequently, for the past 20 years or more she had been building defenses against being hurt. Her jealousy stemmed from a sense of fear, insecurity, and inferiority. I pointed out to her that her basic problem was that she refused to give love and goodwill. Her husband had developed ulcers and high blood pressure and suffered from suppressed rage and deep-seated resentment. But he was so mousy that he never said a word and had put up with this chaos in the home for over 20 years. It is far more decent, honorable, and upright to break up a lie than live a lie. Living the lie is living in confusion resentment, hostility, and what does that bring forth? Chaos, sickness, disease, poverty, and everything else under the sun. There was no love in that home. Where there is no love there is nothing. Where there isn't kindness, consideration, compassion, and understanding, such a marriage is a farce, a sham, a masquerade, and absolutely false. Both of them, at my suggestion, began to look inwardly. She suddenly realized that unconsciously she married a man who allowed himself to be manipulated, 
henpecked, browbeaten, and emasculated psychologically. So, of course, he couldn't have any marital relationship because he was resenting her deeply. And, of course, the marital act is a love act. Therefore, there was no love there. He lacked potency insofar as his wife was concerned, but he hadn't lost his virility insofar as other women were concerned. He realized that, too. She realized that she was completely devoid of real affection. Her possessiveness and intense jealousy and antagonism of her husband and his female relatives were in reality a craving for the love she had missed in childhood. She was pining for love. Moreover, she began to see that she had married a father image. He said, I've reached the point that I'm through. My doctor says, get out. Her constant nagging is making me sick, and life is unbearable. They agreed, however, that they wanted to make a go of the marriage. But it takes two to make a go of marriage, not one. It takes two to argue, two. It takes two to go to court. The first step was for her to determine to stop doing and saying all the things which hurt and humiliated her husband. He, in turn, agreed to assert his rights, prerogatives, and privileges as a man and husband. He was no longer to be mousy and subservient to her tantrums and abusive language. I gave each of them what is known as the simplest of all prayers, and it works. It is called the mirror treatment. You can practice it. Anyone can. She agreed to stand before the mirror in her bedroom three times a day, regularly and systematically, and affirm boldly as follows. I am a child of God. God loves me and cares for me. I radiate love, peace, and goodwill to my husband and his relatives. Every time I think of my husband I will affirm, I love you and I care for you. I am happy, joyous, loving, kind and harmonious, and I exude more and more of God's love every day. You know, whatever you attach to the words, I am, you become, and when you look in the mirror and you say these things knowing very well what you are doing and why you are doing it, your conscious mind is your pen and you are writing down a new self-image in your subconscious mind. When it is engraved there, it becomes compulsive, for the law of your subconscious is compulsive. Your assumptions, beliefs and convictions dictate and control all your conscious actions. She committed this prayer to memory. It isn't hard to do. And as she repeated this prayer before the mirror, she knew these truths would be resurrected, as her mind is a mirror, reflecting back to her what she holds before it. Perseverance and stick to it Iveness paid off, and at the end of two months she came to visit me in Beverly Hills. I found a transformed woman, affable, amiable, kind, gentle, and bubbling over with a new life. Yes, a new self-image. Falling in love with a new self-image of herself. Love is an emotional attachment. Love is a feeling, an awareness. Love also frees, love gives. Love is the spirit of God. And you can fall, as I said, in love with music, you can fall in love with art. Edison fell in love with the principle of electricity. Einstein fell in love with the principle of mathematics, absorbed and engrossed, fascinated, carried away, entranced by it. It gives all its secrets to him. Oh, yes, you can fall in love with animals, husbandry. You can fall in love with plants and flowers. You can fall in love with a cause. Love casts out fear. Her husband's spiritual prescription was to stand before the mirror twice a day for about five minutes and affirm he is talking to himself, now. You are strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, illumined, and inspired. You are a tremendous success, happy, prosperous and successful. You love your wife and she loves you. Whenever you think of her you will say, I love you and I care for you. Now there is harmony where discord was, peace where pain was, and love where hatred was. The explanation was the cure. It's impossible for you to stand before a mirror and affirm these things without getting results, because you are writing these things in your subconscious mind. You are engraving them there. You are impregnating your subconscious with these truths by repetition, faith, and expectancy. Faith is knowing what you are doing and why you are doing it. Seeds grow after their kind. It's the nature of an apple seed to become an apple tree. It's the nature of your thoughts to come forth after their kind. It's the nature of the image of yourself to be reproduced on the screen of space, which is the law of life. So, this man realized as he affirmed these truths about himself that even though he might think he was a hypocrite in the beginning, gradually, by repetition, these truths would sink into his subconscious mind, and the law of the subconscious being compulsive, both of them were compelled to express what they impressed, for that is the law of mind. 
I talked to a troubled young man, who was brought to me by his aunt. In discussing his problem, it was obvious that he had an image of an overbearing mother who gave him no love or understanding. As far back as he could remember, from infancy to the age of 15, she had exacted obedience by whipping and criticism and condemnation. He is now 18 years of age. He claimed that he had great difficulty getting along with anybody. His aunt said that she took him into her home where love and harmony prevail. He seemed to feel envious and jealous of his cousins, who had such a loving father and loving mother. I explained to him that his present attitude was simply a defense mechanism, which caused him to reject people who were kind and friendly, and that it was all due to the traumatic experiences of his childhood. His father had deserted his mother when he was one year old, and he had a terrible hatred towards his father, whom he had never seen and who had never communicated with him. This young man began to comprehend that undoubtedly his mother hated herself, because you must hate yourself first before you can hate anybody else. She was projecting that hatred to her ex-husband, her son, and all those close to her. The cure for that youngster was simple. I explained to him that all he had to do was to change his image of his mother. In discussing the laws of mind, he could see that the image he had of his mother was also his own image of himself because whatever image he held in his mind would be created by his subconscious mind and come forth in his body and circumstances. The technique was as follows. He pictured his mother in his mind's eye as happy, joyous, peaceful and loving. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it who wants to. How much do you want what you want? Yes, if you want to become a great musician, you'll sit down and practice. You'll study. You'll apply yourself. You'll be diligent in your application. And, of course, you'll become a great musician. This young man imagined his mother to be smiling, radiant, and embracing him, saying to him, I love you. I am happy you came back. He could feel the warmth of the embrace, the kiss on his cheek. He could feel the touch of her hand and her fingers, the naturalness, the tangibility, the validity of it all. So can you. And she is saying to him over and over again, I love you. I am happy you came back. After a lapse of six weeks I heard from this young man. He is back with his mother and has been given a wonderful position with an electronics firm. He supplanted the old image of his mother and got rid of the destructive, hateful image. At the same time he got a new self-image, which transformed his life. Divine love entered into his heart, and love dissolved everything unlike itself. Love frees. Love gives. Love is the spirit of God. Love is not puffed up. Love is kind. Faith works by love. Love dissolves everything unlike itself. Love is like the fire, it gives out its heat to all corners of the room. It has neither height, nor depth, neither length, nor breadth, it neither comes nor goes, but it fills all space, and the ancients called it love. Love is an outreaching of the heart. Love is goodwill to all. When you love another, you love to see the other become and express all they long to become and express. You love to exalt God in the midst of them, mighty to heal. If a husband loves his wife, he wants his wife to be expressed. He wants her to release her talents to the world. He doesn't say, you must stay home. You are married now. You must stay in the kitchen. That's not love. That's the opposite of love. Love always frees, it gives. Love is the spirit of God. Love is goodwill. I recently read a magazine article about a 5-foot, 11-pound woman, who successfully battled a 1, 50-pound car for her father's life. Her name was Janet Stone, age 20, the daughter of Robert Stone of Covina, California. He was making repairs on his car and the jack slipped. The car fell on him. Janet heard his cries and found him pinned under the auto. In an incredible upsurge of strength, she lifted the car, freed her father then carried him to her own car and drove him to the hospital. This young daughter's love for her father and her intense desire to save his life at all costs seized her mind and caused the power of the Almighty to respond to her focal point of attention, enabling her to perform the Herculean task which saved her father's life. Remember, all the power of the infinite is within you, enabling you to do extraordinary things in all walks of life. This is why it is called omnipotent, all-powerful. All the power that moves the universe is within you. It's omniscient, meaning all-wise, the ever-living one, the all-wise one, the all-knowing one. It made you from a cell. It created the universe and all things therein contained. It governs the galaxies in space. 
Yes, and with amazing mathematical exactitude, it caused the planets to move in their orbits and the Earth to turn on its axis. All in divine order, which is heaven's first law. An outstanding singer in one of the casinos in Las Vegas told me that for several years he had been a waiter but that he had always had an intense desire to sing, and many of his friends who had heard him sing had pointed out to him that he had all the qualities and abilities necessary to become an outstanding singer. A customer in the restaurant where he worked gave him my book, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. He read this book avidly. He said that every night he practiced one of the techniques outlined in the book. He sat quietly for about 10 minutes each evening and imagined he was on the stage singing to a wonderful audience. He made this mental image vivid and realistic. He imagined the audience to be applauding him and his friends congratulating him on his wonderful voice. He saw them smiling and felt the naturalness of their imaginary handshake. At the end of about three weeks the opportunity came and a new door of expression opened up for him. He experienced objectively what he had been imaging and feeling subjectively. Love as an emotional attachment, and as he began to identify with the greater image of himself, his subconscious responded and the cherished desire of his heart was realized. Some years ago I visited a businessman in the hospital. He was very ill with shingles, which caused him great pain. He was also suffering from a cardiac attack. It seems the combination of circumstances had broken him financially and physically. Due to bad investments he had lost almost all the money he had saved during the many years of his life. On top of all this, he had an intense fear of death. At that time I appealed to his ruling love, which was that of a daughter 15 years old, his only child. I pressed the point that she was entitled to his love, to his attention, to his affection, to his devotion. She needed his protection and wanted to be educated. She wanted to find her true place in the world. I also emphasized that inasmuch as he loved his daughter and had to play the role of both father and mother to her since her mother had passed on when she was born, he should now see to it that his daughter would have all the advantages that could be provided only by loving parents. I gave him a simple technique, which was that frequently during the day he was to picture himself at home, walking about the house, sitting at his desk, opening mail, answering the phone, and feeling the naturalness, tangibility, and solidity of his daughter's embrace in his own home. The prayer I gave him was that he was to repeat feelingly and knowingly many times during the day. Father, I thank thee for the miraculous healing taking place now. God loves me and cares for me. This man carried out these instructions faithfully. A few weeks later, while still in the hospital and picturing himself at his desk at home, suddenly something happened. He said, I felt lifted up out of darkness into a blinding light. I felt divine love filling my soul. I felt transformed from misery to peace of mind. He had a remarkable healing and today is happy and joyous and leading a very successful business life. He has recouped his losses, and his daughter is in college. When a person is sick and depressed, it is a good point to appeal to his or her ruling love, for love conquers all. Perfect love, you know, casts out fear. If you are attracted, you will be in love. You are what you imagine yourself to be. Therefore, imagine you are a tremendous success. Imagine you are doing what you long to do. Keep it up. Do it over and over again. A doctor told a man he had to give up smoking. That was interfering with his blood pressure and his heart, and so on. Well, he began to think of all the advantages of longevity, peace of mind, greater discernment, better judgment, better health, and all that. Then he began to imagine the doctor congratulating him on his perfect health and peace of mind. And he said to himself, I'm going to give up this habit. He began to think of all the advantages. He said, I decree it. I'm giving it up now. I am free of this habit, and I have peace of mind, I have serenity, I have tranquility, I have perfect health. It is said that if you decree a thing it shall come to pass and the light shall shine upon your ways. When you decree something and you mean it, and when you are sincere, when it is irrevocable, the subconscious accepts that. The smoker ran that picture a couple of times a day morning and night imagined the doctor having examined him and saying, your heart is perfect. Your blood pressure is normal. It is wonderful. Your health is fine. He imagined this over and over again. What is he doing? Well, he is impregnating his subconscious with the idea of freedom and peace of mind and perfect health. He kept that up for a couple of weeks. He lost all desire to smoke. That's the way your subconscious works. It takes away the craving. It becomes compulsive. 
It compels you to give them up, because you are contemplating freedom, peace of mind. He went to the doctor, and the doctor told him exactly what he had been contemplating, what he had been meditating on. The doctor confirmed objectively what he had been imagining subjectively. As within, so without, as above, so below. As in heaven meaning your own mind, so on earth, your body, circumstances, and condition. Begin to think constructively and harmoniously. To think is to speak. Your thought is your word. Let your words, you are told, be as a honeycomb, sweet to the ear and pleasant to the bones. Let your words be, as the Bible says, like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Very beautiful, isn't it? The future is the present grown up. It is your invisible word or thought made visible. Are your words, your thoughts, and your images sweet to the ear? Are you imagining success and happiness now? If you were going on a trip to Europe, are you imagining a lovely voyage? Are you realizing the plane is God's idea moving from point to point freely, joyously, and lovingly? Are you saying, the pilot is God's creation? He is illumined and inspired. He is divinely guided. Love goes before us making straight and perfect our way. Divine love surrounds the plane, enfolds it, and enwraps it. The presence of God saturates the hearts and minds of all on the plane. And God controls the highways of the heavens above as well as the earth beneath, making all roads a highway for our God. Then you are falling in love with that journey. You are falling in love with a new picture, falling in love with the truth. And you will have a marvelous trip, a wonderful, wonderful trip. Because you are imaging, you are picturing, you are decreeing it. It's all real. It's all vivid. You are experiencing it in your mind. Are your words, your thoughts, and your images sweet to the ear? What is your inner speech like at this moment? No one hears you. It is your silent thought. Perhaps you are saying, I can't, it is impossible. I'm too old now. What chance have I? Mary can, but I can't. I have no money. I can't afford this or that. I have tried, but it is no use. You can see that your words are not as a honeycomb. There is nothing sweet about that. Eat honey, Solomon says. Honey in the Bible means wisdom. Wisdom is an awareness of the presence and power of God within you. To eat of is to meditate on, to absorb, to ingest, to digest, to appropriate these truths. These words are not sweet to your ear. They do not lift you up, they do not inspire you. Never forget the importance of inner speech, inner conversation, inner talking. It is that silent thought of yours, that silent talking to yourself when you are alone, when your head is on the pillow, when you are sitting in the armchair and there is nobody around, your silent thought that is always made manifest. Therefore, your words are sweet to the ear and pleasant to the bones. Let the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart be acceptable in thy eyesight, Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So, your inner speech is the way you feel inside, for the inside mirrors the outside. Is your inner speech pleasant to the bones? Does it exalt you, thrill you, and make you happy? Bones are symbolic of support and symmetry. Let your inner talking sustain and strengthen you. Decree now say it meaningfully and lovingly. From this moment forward I will admit to my mind for mental consumption only those ideas and thoughts which heal, bless, inspire, strengthen, elevate, and dignify my soul. If you were in the hospital, picture yourself home with your family or back at work at your desk. The man in the ball field who hurt his ankle and is strapped in the hospital where do you think his picture is? His picture is that he is back on the ball field. He is kicking the football. If he didn't have that picture in his mind he'd never leave the hospital. Imagine a person in the hospital saying, I'm done for. I'm through. I'll never get out of here. I have an incurable disease. He'll remain there. But, you see, when you are in the hospital you have a picture that you are home with your loved ones. That is why you go home. If you didn't have that picture in your mind you'd never leave the hospital. Yes, imagination is the workshop of God. It separates person from person. It is a beacon light in a world of darkness. What you imagine represents your desire. It's the way you want things to be. It is a picture of your fulfilled desire. It could be a new position or health. Let your words, your silent thoughts and feeling, coincide and agree with the picture of silver, or your desire. Desire and feeling join together in a mental marriage and will become the answered prayer. Let your words be sweet to the ear. What are you giving your ear to now? What are you listening to? 
What do you listen to as you go to sleep at night news about murder, crime, burglary, and all that sort of thing? With what are you polluting your mind for before you go to sleep? Why don't you open the Bible or an inspirational book? Sing a song to God. Fill your mind with eternal verities and go to sleep with the praise of God forever on your lips. Isn't that the way you should go to sleep? We lay down in peace to sleep for we know God will keep us in safety. What are you listening to? What are you giving attention to? Whatever you give attention to will grow, magnify, and multiply in your experience good or bad. Faith cometh by hearing. Listen to the great eternal truths. Listen to the voice of the one who forever is. What language does it speak? It is not the language of any nation or culture. It is the universal language, or mood of love, peace, joy, harmony, faith, confidence, and goodwill. You speak in the tongue of love, faith, and confidence. Then you are speaking in the universal language. Then you are speaking in tongues, and everybody will understand. Love, peace, harmony, joy, and the inner, silent knowing of the soul. That's the universal language of a smile and of love. This is what is meant when the Bible refers to speaking in tongues. It is not gibberish, but deep love and faith. Give your ear to these qualities and potencies of God. Mentally eat of these qualities, and as you continue to do so, you will be conditioned to these positive, enduring qualities, and the law of love will govern you. You have heard this oft repeated quotation Man is made in the image and the likeness of God. This means that your mind is God's mind. There is only one mind, and your spirit is God's spirit. There is only one spirit. And you create in exactly the same way, through the same laws God creates. Let us make ourselves after God's image and likeness. Just as the concrete fills the forms of the building, that life force fills the form of your thoughts and brings them forth as form, function, experience and events. That's why you are made in the image and the likeness of God, so there is one mind common to all individual people. You are in an individual world. Your experiences, conditions, circumstances, environment, as well as your physical health, financial state, social life, is made out of your own mental images and after your own likeness. You can imagine you are a great singer if you love to sing. You can now imagine you are before a distinguished audience and God is singing in majestic cadences through you. You are saying, I am singing for him. I am poised, serene, and calm. I am relaxed and at ease. The inspiration of the Almighty flows through me. And the song of God wells up within me. And the song that comes forth from me fills the soul of all with joy, happiness, and peace. They are all resurrected. They are all lifted up and inspired, because the mood of love, faith, and confidence impinges on their receptive minds, and they are made whole and perfect. Then, of course, you will sing in majestic song. You are falling in love with music. You have created a new image of yourself. Wonders will happen as you pray that way. So, your whole world is made out of your own mental images and after your own likeness. Like attracts like. Your world is a mirror reflecting back to you your inner world of thought, feeling, beliefs, and inner conversation. If you begin to imagine evil powers working against you, or that there is a jinx following you, or that other forces and people are working against you, there will be a response of your deeper mind to correspond with these negative pictures and fears in your mind. Therefore, you will begin to say that everything is against you, or that the stars are opposed to you, or you will blame karma, your past lives, or some demon. Truly, the only sin is ignorance. Pain is not a punishment. It is the consequence of the misuse of the law of your mind. Come back to the one truth and realize that there is only one spiritual power, and it functions through the thoughts and images of your mind. The problems, vexations, and strife are due to the fact that we have actually wandered away after false gods of fear and error. We must return to the center, the God presence within. Affirm now the sovereignty and authority of the spiritual power within you, the principle of all life. Claim divine guidance, strength nourishment, and peace, and this power will respond accordingly. I will now proceed to point out you may definitely and positively convey an idea or mental image to your subconscious mind. The conscious mind is personal and selective. It chooses, selects, weighs, analyzes, dissects and investigates. It is capable of inductive and deductive reasoning. The subjective or subconscious mind is subject to the conscious mind. It might be called a servant of the conscious mind. 
The subconscious obeys the order of the conscious mind. Your conscious thought has power. The power you are acquainted with is thought. Back of your thought is mind, spirit, or God. Focus directed thoughts reach the subjective level. They must be of a certain degree of intensity. Intensity is acquired by concentration. To concentrate is to come back to the center and contemplate the infinite power within you. To concentrate properly, you still the wheels of your mind and enter into a quiet, relaxed, mental state. When you concentrate you gather your thoughts together and focus all your attention on your ideal, aim, or objective. You are now at a focal or central point where you are giving all your attention and devotion to your mental image. The procedure of focused attention is somewhat similar to that of a magnifying glass, and the focus it makes of the rays of the sun you can see the difference in the effect of scattered vibrations of the sun's heat and the vibrations that emanate from a central point. You can direct the rays of the magnifying glass so it will burn up a particular object upon which it is directed. Focused, steadied attention of your mental images gains a similar intensity, and a deep, lasting impression is made on the sensitive plate of your subconscious mind. You may have to repeat this drama of the mind many times before an impression is made, but the secret of impregnating the deeper mind is continuous or sustained imagination. When fear or worry comes to you during the day, you can always immediately gaze upon that lovely picture in your mind, realizing and knowing you are operating a definite psychological law that is now working for you in the dark house of your mind. As you do this, you are truly watering the seed and fertilizing it, thereby accelerating its growth. The conscious mind is the motor. The subconscious is the engine. You must start the motor and the engine will do the work. The conscious mind is a dynamo that awakens the power of your subconscious. The first step in conveying your clarified desire or idea or image to the deeper mind is to relax, immobilize the attention, get still and quiet. This quiet, relaxed, peaceful attitude of mind prevents extraneous matter and false ideas from interfering with your mental absorption of your idea. Furthermore, in the quiet, passive, receptive attitude of mind, effort is reduced to a minimum. Prayer is effortless effort. There is no mental effort or coercion used in prayer. Any time you use mental coercion or force, you get the opposite of what you are praying for. That's called the law of reversed effort. In the second step you begin to imagine the reality of that which you desire. A good example of this is how Louise L. applied this principle to get the job she really wanted. Louise had good experience in secretarial work, but what she really desired was to work in the medical field. She took courses in medical assistance and administration at a community college and then applied for several openings in doctor's offices, but was always rejected because of lack of medical experience. She was determined to reach her goal. Every night and often during the day, she saw herself in a doctor's office helping the doctor handle all of the insurance, administrative and clerical details that take so much time and energy away from dealing with patients. She visualized herself assisting the doctor in dealing with patients. Before her next interview, she repeated to herself, I will get this job. I may not have previous experience, but I know I am capable, knowledgeable and willing to work hard to be a successful medical assistant. At her next interview, when asked about her previous experience, she responded, I may not have previous experience in a doctor's office, but I have been successful in all my jobs, often with matters that I had not faced previously. I know what a doctor expects of a medical assistant. I have studied and worked hard to prepare for a career in this field and I am committed to be the best medical assistant you can hire. The doctor hired her. Some months later, he told her that when he read her application, he planned to just give her a courtesy interview and send her on her way, but she impressed him with her enthusiasm and self-confidence, and he added, I am glad I did. You are the best medical assistant I have ever had. This procedure or technique is older than our Bible. The outside mirrors the inside. The external action follows the internal action. As within, so without, as above, so below, as in heaven, so on earth. Heaven is the heavens of your own mind, your own consciousness. You can't experience anything except by right of consciousness. Consciousness is the way you think, feel, believe, and what you give mental consent to. Become convinced that there is a power within you capable of bringing you what you imagine and feel is true in manifestation. Sitting idly by, daydreaming. Imagining the things you would like to possess will not attract them to you. You must know and believe that you are operating a law of mind. You must put foundation under your images. 
Become convinced of your God-given power to use your mind constructively to bring into manifestation the thing you desire. It's all right to build castles in the air, but build a foundation under them. Then you'll bring them to pass. Know what you want. The subconscious mind will carry out the idea, because you have a definite, clear-cut concept of what you wish to possess. Imagine clearly the fulfillment of your desire. Then you are giving the subconscious something definite to act upon. It may take two or three minutes, or longer, depending on your temperament, feeling, and understanding to see results. It is not so much the time as the quality of your mind, the degree of feeling or faith. Generally speaking, the more focused and absorbed your attention is, and the longer the time, the more perfect will be the answer to your prayer. Believe that you have received and you shall receive. Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. To believe is to accept something as true or to live in the state of being it. As you sustain this mood, yes, wonders will begin to happen as you pray and you will experience the joy of the answered prayer. In a nutshell do not try to overcome a negative habit by willpower. All you are doing is mentally dwelling on the bad habit. The more you think of the bad habit, the more you are caught up in the compulsion of that habit. Because whatever you give your attention to, your subconscious magnifies and multiplies. As you continue to give attention to it, you become compelled to do that thing. Whatever you attach to the words, I am, you become, and when you look in the mirror and you say these things knowing very well what you are doing and why you are doing it, your conscious mind is your pen and you are writing down a new self-image in your subconscious mind. When it is engraved there, it becomes compulsive, for the law of your subconscious is compulsive. Your assumptions, beliefs and convictions dictate and control all your conscious actions. You are what you imagine yourself to be. Therefore, imagine you are a tremendous success. Imagine you are doing what you long to do. Keep it up. Do it over and over again. Decree now say it meaningfully and lovingly. From this moment forward I will admit to my mind for mental consumption only those ideas and thoughts which heal, bless, inspire, strengthen, elevate, and dignify my soul. Never forget the importance of inner speech, inner conversation, inner talking. It is that silent thought, that silent talking to yourself when you are alone, when your head is on the pillow, when you are sitting in the armchair and there is nobody around, your silent thought that is always made manifest. Decree now say it meaningfully and lovingly. From this moment forward I will admit to my mind for mental consumption only those ideas and thoughts which heal, bless, inspire, strengthen, elevate, and dignify my soul. The conscious mind is the motor. The subconscious is the engine. You must start the motor and the engine will do the work. The conscious mind is a dynamo that awakens the power of your subconscious. Know what you want. The subconscious mind will carry out the idea, because you have a definite, clear-cut concept of what you wish to possess. Imagine clearly the fulfillment of your desire. Then you are giving the subconscious something definite to act upon. Chapter 4. Developing a Wonderful Personality you can create a wonderful personality by thinking on things that are true, things that are honest, things that are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely and things that are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You are what you think all day long. Your personality is the sum total of all your thoughts, feelings, beliefs, opinions, early indoctrination, and environmental conditioning. Your personality is acquired, and you can change it. The word personality comes from persona, meaning a mask. The ancient Greek actors wore masks when dramatizing their part on the stage. Actually, each one of us is a mask of divinity inasmuch as we are the garments which God wears as he moves through the illusion of time and space. We are reproductions of the original spirit, or God, and that the divine standard of personality is to reproduce the qualities, attributes, power, and aspects of God. Begin now to become a channel for the divine. For 10 or 15 minutes every morning of your life, contemplate this great truth. That I am a channel for the light, love, glory, beauty, peace, and harmony, and power of the Infinite One. The qualities of God are flowing through me now like a golden river, and I am walking and talking with God all day long. And I am expressing more and more of God-like qualities every day of my life. I become what I contemplate, and I am a channel of the Divine now and forevermore. As you practice this, Wonders will happen in your life. Let us realize that the first thing you learn is that there is no one to change but yourself. 
this is the beginning of a real change in your entire personality. As you would that others should think about you, think about them in like manner. As you would that others should feel about you, feel also about them in like manner. As you would want others to act towards you, act toward them in like manner. This is the key to happy human relationships in all walks of life. This is the key. All things whatsoever ye would that others should do unto you, do ye so to them in like manner. Do you observe your inner talking? For example, you may be polite and courteous to people in your office. But when their backs are turned, you are very critical and resentful towards them in your mind. Such negative thoughts are highly destructive to you. It is like taking poison. You are actually taking a mental poison, which robs you of vitality, enthusiasm, strength, guidance, and goodwill. Remember, the suggestion you give to the other, you give to yourself. Ask yourself now. How am I behaving internally toward this other person? This interior attitude is what counts. Begin now to observe yourself. Observe your reactions to people, conditions, and circumstances. How do you respond to the events and news of the day? It makes no difference if all the other people were wrong and you alone were right. If the news disturbs you, it is your evil because your bad mood affected and robbed you of peace and harmony. You do not have to react negatively to the news or comments of broadcasters. You can remain unmoved, undisturbed, and poised, realizing that they have a right to their expressions and beliefs. It is never what a person says or does that affects us. It is our reaction to what is said or done that matters. Mentally divide yourself into two people. Your present mental state and that which you desire to be. Look at the thoughts of fear, worry, anxiety, jealousy, or hatred which may have enslaved and imprisoned you. You have divided yourself into two for the purpose of disciplining yourself. One part of you is the human mind working in you. The other is the infinite, or the God self-seeking expression through you. Be honest with yourself and determine which mood shall prevail. For example, if someone gossips about you or criticizes you, what is your reaction? Are you going to engage in the typical way by getting excited, resentful, and angry? If you do, you are letting the world mind work in you. You must positively refuse to react in this mechanical, stereotyped, machine-like way. Say positively and definitely to yourself. The Infinite One thinks, speaks, and acts through me now. This is my real self. It is my God self. I am now developing a marvelous and wonderful personality, because I am this very moment radiating love, peace, and goodwill to this person who criticized me. I salute the divinity in him or her. God speaks through me as peace, harmony, and love. This attitude is wonderful. This heals, blesses, and restores my soul. As you do this, you are a real scientific thinker. Instead of reacting like the herd, which returns hate for hate, ill will for ill will, you have returned love for hatred, peace for hurt, goodwill for ill will. You have come into truth to think and react in a new way. When you come into scientific thinking, you make a new set of reactions to supplant the old. If you find yourself always reacting in the same way to people, conditions, circumstances, and events, you are not growing spiritually. Instead, you are standing still, deeply immersed in the mind of the human race. Remember what we said about developing a marvelous and wonderful personality. It means to express more and more of the godlike qualities, attributes, and potencies within you, which means that you radiate more love, peace, harmony, joy, and beauty. Furthermore, you radiate more of God's power in your thoughts, words, and actions. You know that you do not have to accept negative thoughts. You can become what you want to be by refusing to be a slave to old thought patterns. Become a real scientific thinker and practice observing your reactions to the events of the day. Whenever you discover that you are about to react negatively, affirm as follows. This is not the infinite one within me speaking or acting. This will cause you to stop your negative thinking. Then the divine light, love, truth and beauty will flow through you at that moment. Instead of identifying yourself with anger, resentment, bitterness and hatefulness, identify immediately with peace, harmony, poise and balance. With this attitude, you are really practicing the presence of God. You are separating yourself from the old attitudes of mind, and you are identifying yourself with the new that which you desire to be. You are developing a marvelous and wonderful personality, and you find that you are exuding more and more vibrancy. You want to be the happy, joyous and illumined. In order to become the ideal, 
you must identify yourself with all the qualities you wish to manifest. Remember this great truth. You do not have to go along with, believe in, nor consent to negative thoughts or reactions. Begin to positively refuse to react mechanically as you formerly did. React and think in a new way. You want to be peaceful, happy, radiant, healthy, prosperous, and inspired. Therefore, from this moment forward, you must refuse to identify with the negative thoughts that tend to drag you down. Many women ask. How can I change my husband? It's an old, old refrain. Another frequent statement is. I would like to change Mary in the office. She is the cause of all the trouble. Many have heard this great truth. See God in the other and all is well. However, most people do not know exactly what that means. It really means to become aware of the presence of God in the other person and to realize that God is actually being expressed through the thoughts, words, and actions of that person. To really know, accept, and believe these truths is to see God in the other. God is the Father of all. God is the life principle in everybody, everywhere. God is the living spirit within you the mind, the invisible part of you. To look at it in a very simple way, God is the highest and the best in you. The more wisdom, the more truth and beauty you are expressing, the more of God is being expressed by you. That's how simple it is. There is no problem in human relations that you cannot solve harmoniously and for the benefit of all concerned. When you say that your associate in the office is very difficult to handle, that he or she is cantankerous, mean, obstreperous, and difficult, do you realize that in all probability this is reflecting your own inner mental states? Remember also, that like attracts like. Birds of a feather flock together. Is it not possible that your associate's crotchety, petulant, critical attitude is the reflection of your inner frustrations and suppressed rage? What this person says or does cannot really hurt you except you permit him or her to mentally disturb you. The only way that person can annoy you is through your own thoughts. The reason for this is, you are the only thinker in your universe. You and you alone are responsible for the way you think about other people. They are not responsible, you are. For example, if you get angry, you have to go through four states in your own mind. You begin to think about what the other person said. You decide to get angry and generate a mood of rage. Then you decide to act. Perhaps you talk back and react in kind. It takes two to make an argument. You see that the thought, emotion, reaction, and action all takes place in your own mind. You and you alone are responsible. You are the cause of your own anger. If someone called you a fool, why should you get angry? You know you are not a fool. The other person is undoubtedly very disturbed mentally. Maybe that person had serious problems at home or was very ill psychologically. You should have compassion and not condemn that person. Realize God's peace fills that person's mind and that God's love flows through him or her. Then you would be practicing the golden rule. You would be identifying not with anger or hatred, but with the law of goodness, truth, and beauty. Would you condemn a person who had tuberculosis or cancer? Of course you would not. Perhaps you would claim that the harmony and perfection of God were flowing through that person and that the miraculous power of God was healing him or her. That would be compassion. Compassion is the wisdom of God functioning through the human mind knowing that as you do this you are radiating love, peace, and goodwill to that individual. People who are hateful, spiteful, envious, or jealous, and who say nasty, mean, scandalous things are very ill psychologically. They are just as sick as people who have tuberculosis or cancer. How are you going to react to such people? Where is your truth? Where is your wisdom and understanding? Are you going to say, I am just one of the herd. I react in kind. I return spite for spite, hate for hate, anger for anger. No, you would stop and say, this is not divine love acting through me. God sees only perfection, beauty, and harmony in all people everywhere. I see, therefore, as God sees. Begin to see all men and women as God sees them. When your eyes are identified with beauty, you will not behold the distorted picture. Would you condemn and criticize a hunchback? No, you wouldn't. Perhaps it's a congenital defect. Or perhaps he suffered from a debilitating illness. There are many people who are mental hunchbacks, twisted and distorted in their mind, who were negatively conditioned when they were young. Have understanding. To understand all is to forgive all. 
information or news is constantly brought to your attention all day long through the medium of your five senses. You are the one who determines what your mental responses are going to be to the news conveyed. You can remain poised, serene, and calm. Or you can be very foolish and fly into a rage and, as a result, make mistakes in business. Your judgment becomes very poor. Perhaps you get an attack of migraine or some other form of pain. The reason two people react differently to the same situation is based upon their subconscious conditioning. Your personality is based on the sum total of all your opinions, beliefs, education, and early religious indoctrination. This inner attitude of mind conditions your response. Some people will fly into a rage when they hear somebody espouse a certain religious or political program, but others may enjoy it because the irate group is prejudiced and the other is not. Our subconscious convictions and conditioning dictate and control all of our conscious actions. You can recondition your mind by identifying yourself with the eternal verities. You can develop a marvelous and wonderful personality by filling your mind with the concepts of peace, joy, love, good humor, happiness, and goodwill. Busy your mind with these ideas and they will sink into the subconscious level and become orchids in the Garden of God. You are living in the Garden of Eden now. The Garden of Eden is simply your subconscious mind where you plant seeds. The seeds are your thoughts. You are what you think all day long. And your prayer is your thought. What are you thinking? No matter where the problem is, no matter how acute it may be, or how difficult the person may be, there is in the final analysis no one to change but yourself. When you change yourself, your world and environment will change. Begin with number one yourself. Remember, you are not living with people. You are living with your concept about them. You are living with your belief about your husband, or you are living with your thought or your belief about your wife. What do you believe about your husband, your wife, your son, or your daughter? Remember this great truth. God is in all people. Begin to see God in your husband. Begin to see God in your wife. Call forth the God presence in all those around you. Our mind is a garden. In this garden, which is called the Garden of Eden or the Garden of God, we plant seeds. Regardless of what we sow with our conscious mind, our subconscious will bring it to pass. Therefore, let us sow the thoughts of peace, happiness, guidance, and goodwill. Let us meditate on these qualities and accept them in our conscious, reasoning mind. Whatever we accept in our conscious, reasoning mind, our subconscious, which is like the soil, will accept without question and bring it to pass. This is the law of life. It is done unto you, as you believe. And belief is a thought in your mind, nothing more and nothing less. What do you believe in? If you believe that Los Angeles is in the state of New York, your mail will go astray. Believe, therefore, in things are noble, good, and godlike. Believe in these things. And throne the concepts of peace and love, harmony, joy, and goodwill in your mind. Plant these seeds daily in your mind, and wonders will happen as you pray. Our subconscious assumptions and convictions of ourselves dictate and control all our conscious actions. Believe nothing, therefore, which does not contribute to your health, happiness, and peace of mind. Your subconscious mind will objectify faithfully the habitual thinking of your conscious mind. Your work is with your conscious mind. Your conscious mind reasons, analyzes, weighs, dissects, investigates, scrutinizes, and comes to decisions. Your conscious mind is the choosing mind. Choose your thoughts, your imagery, and your reactions. You are a volitional, choosing being. Ask yourself, what kind of thoughts am I choosing now? Whatever you believe is true in your conscious mind your subconscious will accept without question. Be very careful that you accept only that which is true, noble, and godlike. Your subconscious mind is the mind that controls your heartbeat, your digestion, grows hair on your head, heals the cut on your finger, watches over you while you are sound asleep. Your subconscious mind is the mind that takes a piece of steak and transforms it into tissue, muscle, bone, and bloodstream. It watches over you while you are sound asleep upon the bed. If you say, I would like to wake up at 4 o'clock o'clock in the morning prior to sleep. The subconscious will awaken you exactly at 4 o'clock o'clock even though there is no clock in the room. Or, if there were a clock in the room and it was out of order, or it was too fast, your subconscious will wake you up exactly at 4 o'clock o'clock, and it would be the correct time, chronologically speaking. Whatever you impress on your subconscious mind as expressed on the screen of space is conditions, experiences, and events.
as you sow in your subconscious mind, so shall you reap in your body, environment, and pocketbook, and in all phases of your life. One time the great Italian tenor, Enrico Caruso was struck with stage fright. He said his throat was paralyzed due to spasms caused by fear, which constricted the muscles of his throat. Perspiration poured copiously down his face. He was ashamed, because in a few minutes he had to go out on the stage. Yet he was shaking with fear and trepidation. He said, They will laugh at me. I can't sing. Then he shouted in the presence of those behind the stage, The little me wants to strangle the big me within. He said to the little me, Get out of here. The big me wants to sing through me. By the big me, he meant the God power within, the limitless power within all of us, the powers of your own subconscious. He began to shout, Get out, get out. The big me is going to sing. This released the almighty power within him. When the cue came, he walked out on the stage and sang gloriously, majestically, enthralling the audience. In your subconscious mind, as William James, the father of American psychology, wrote, is the power that moves the world. It is the almighty power of God. Your subconscious is one with infinite intelligence and boundless wisdom. It is fed by hidden springs. It is called the law of life. A law is either good or bad, depending on how you use it. You can use electricity to kill someone, or to light a house, or fry an egg, or vacuum the floor. Surely, you don't say electricity is evil. It depends on how you use it. Good and evil are in the movements of your own mind based upon your thoughts, your actions, and your decisions. You wouldn't say that water is evil. You could drown your child in the water, or you could quench its thirst. Fire isn't evil, but you can burn someone in the fire, or you can warm the house with the fire. Whatever you impress upon the subconscious mind, the latter will move heaven and earth to bring it to pass. The subconscious mind knows no obstacles. We must impress it with the right ideas and constructive thoughts. Your subconscious mind is called the law. A law is good or bad, depending on how we use it. Your subconscious mind is impersonal and non-selective. In the Bible it's called the wife. The Bible says, the husband shall be head of the wife. Don't take that literally. It's foolish to do so. Many people take these statements literally with all kinds of absurd, ridiculous, weird consequences. The Bible is a psychological, spiritual textbook dealing with the principles and modes of living. It deals with moods, tones and vibrations. It talks about the male and female principles in each one of us. When you read about men and women in the Bible, they are not men and women, literally speaking. They represent the conscious and subconscious mind in all individuals throughout the world. The conscious mind in the Bible is called the husband. Why? Because it is head of the wife. The subconscious is called the wife in the Bible, and the subconscious is amenable to suggestions by the conscious mind. It is controlled by the suggestions of the conscious mind. Whatever your conscious mind decrees and believes in, your subconscious will honor and execute accordingly, whether it is good, bad, or indifferent. I told you, the subconscious is like the soil. If you put thistle seeds in the soil, it will grow thistles. If you put raspberry seeds there you will get raspberries. The soil will take all seeds given to it, whether good or bad, and the seeds will come forth after their kind. You will get an apple tree from an apple seed. You can believe a lie and your subconscious will express whatever is impressed upon it good, bad, or indifferent and will bring it to pass. The reason there is so much chaos, misery, lack, and misfortune in the world is because people do not understand the interaction of the male and female principle within themselves. When these two principles work in accord, in concord, in peace, and synchronously together, we have health, happiness, peace, and joy. There is no sickness or discord when the conscious and subconscious minds work together harmoniously and peacefully. What are you planting in your mind now? The conscious mind is the reasoning mind. It analyzes, scrutinizes, and chooses. What are you choosing now? If you are resentful or hateful, you are sowing seeds of destruction and you may have growths in your bodies to conform to your destructive mental attitude. The growths may appear in different parts of the body. The great secret of the ancient temple mystery schools was that the I am in you is God, as you were told in the third chapter of Exodus. This is my name now and forever, henceforth and for all generations. He said, Tell them I am hath sent me unto you. When you say I am, you are announcing the presence of the living God within you infinite mind and infinite spirit, 
which is invisible. The I am in the Bible means being, life, and awareness. You know that you are alive. Life is God. You are alive with the life of God. You have never seen life, but you know that you are alive. No theologian has ever seen spirit, but you have felt the spirit of peace, love and goodwill well up in your mind at the sight of your own child. No psychologist has ever seen mind, but we perform experiments with mind. You are a thinking being, and you have a mind. When you say I am, you are announcing pure being, life, and indifferentiated awareness, the presence of God in you. This is the great secret. This is sometimes called, the lost word, because it's in the mouths of many people and they don't know what they are saying. They say, I'm blind, I'm deaf, I'm dumb, I'm broke, I'm all mixed up, I'm confused. Whatever you add to I am, you become. If you say, I'm a bum and I'm no good, and I'm inferior, you'll become all these things. Whatever you attach to the I am within you, you become. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful to say, I'm a part of the living God. I am happy, joyous, and free. I am secure. I am strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and kind. I am inspired. I am illumined. I am a tremendous success. I am absolutely outstanding. All these things will take place in your life, because whatever you attach to the I am, you become. Whatever is impressed on your subconscious will be expressed on the screen of space as conditions, experiences, and events. Moses, Isaiah, Jesus, Buddha, Zoroaster, Lao Tzu, and all the illumined seers of the ages proclaimed these truths. Spiritual-minded people who are alert and alive knows that the greatest secret in the world is the discovery of the presence of God in us. This is far more important than the discovery of the atomic bomb, nuclear energy, or thermonuclear energy, or any of these things. You can never deviate from the truth. That is you think and feel, so are you. Your thought and feeling control your destiny regardless of what you say, regardless of whether you deny it or not. We are dealing with laws of mind, just like laws of chemistry, physics, and mathematics. What's the use of saying 2 and 2 or 5? They're not, 2 and 2 or 4. The intake and the outgo must be equal. Motion and emotion must balance. As it is in heaven which means your own consciousness it is on earth which means your body and environment. This is the law of life. You will find throughout all nature the law of action and reaction, of rest and motion. These two must balance. Then there will be balance and equilibrium in your life. Realize that within you is the very life of the divine. You are here to let the life and the love of God flow through you rhythmically and harmoniously. Pray frequently as follows, and you will discover that wonders are happening in your life. God flows through me as harmony, health, peace, beauty, and right action. God speaks, thinks, and acts through me now. I am illumined, I am inspired, I am prospered beyond my fondest dreams. I am expressing the life divine. Repeat that prayer frequently, slowly, quietly, and lovingly, and as you do, these seeds or thoughts will sink by osmosis into your deeper mind, called the subconscious. And the subconscious expresses whatever is impressed upon it. That's a very simple prayer. Very beautiful, too. Everyone can do something far more wonderful than he or she is doing. When we are young, we dream of becoming a hero. To make that dream a reality, we must be taught to express and direct our talents and express our desires in the right way, along godlike channels. Something within us tells Hughes that we are born to be victorious and triumphant. God whispers to us through urges and intimations. Go forth and conquer. The higher self knows we can do it. The desire, ideas, plans, and purposes that you have are the urges, the intimations, and the drive of the higher self in you, saying to you, you can be. You can do, you can have. Otherwise, you would not have the desire. Your desire to be greater and grander than you are is the push of life within you. Your desire for health is the life principle in you telling you that you can be healed. Your desire for wealth is the higher self in you telling you to appropriate God's abundance that is all around you. Wealth is of the mind. Health is of the mind. If you want to be wealthy and have all the money you need to do what you want to do when you want to do it, do this do it every night prior to sleep. I have taught it all over the world to thousands of men and women. It works. God's wealth is circulating in my life, and there is always a divine surplus. Repeat that simple phrase three or four times prior to sleep. 
God's wealth is circulating in my life, and there is always a divine surplus. Your head can be on the pillow, your eyes closed. You are writing that down with your mental pen, namely, your conscious mind. As you reiterate these truths, they sink down into your subconscious and your subconscious mind will compel you to be wealthy. I say compel, and I mean that. Because the law of your subconscious is compulsion. You will be compelled to be a success, and you will have all the wealth you need to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Your subconscious mind is impersonal and non-selective. It is all wise and knows the answers to all questions. It does not argue with you controversially. It does not say, you must not impress me with that. If you are saying, I can't make ends meet, bills are piling up, and so on, you are planting negative seeds into your subconscious mind and more lack will be yours, because the subconscious magnifies everything that is deposited in it. It is like a bank. A bank gives you compound interest. Your subconscious gives you compound interest, too. If you plant good seeds, it will be wonderful. You will receive compound interest. Deposit love, peace, harmony, good humor, abundance, and security. Just say to yourself frequently, God's wealth is circulating in my life, and there is always a surplus. Do this frequently. You will never want for money or wealth all the days of your life, because you are operating a law that is changeless, timeless, and ageless. If the radio in your car ceased to function, you wouldn't say the principle by which the radio was devised or invented is suspended, or that the laws of sound are suspended. Of course not. You'd look for a short circuit, and you would make the necessary adjustment. When you do not get results in using your mind, it means you are not using it the right way. The short circuit sometimes is fear, superstition, ill will, and bitterness. If you're condemning the wealth of another person, no matter how it was attained, you will attract lack and loss to yourself. Because whatever you condemn takes wings and flies away. This is why many people never prosper. They are envious and jealous of the wealth of others. Remember, you are praying for wealth and prosperity. How can you prosper when you are condemning that which you are praying for? Surely, that's simple. Radiate love, peace, and goodwill to everyone. Wish for them health, happiness, peace, and all the blessings of heaven. How will you get your subconscious to work for you? First of all, realize the great secret that the intake and the outgo must be equal. The impression and the expression must be equal. All frustration is due to unfulfilled desires. For example, when you say, I can't do this, I am too old now, I can't meet this mortgage, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. I don't know the right politician, you are putting up resistance and frustration, and you are blocking your own good. Affirm boldly. The God presence which gave me this desire leads, guides, and reveals to me the perfect plan. This causes the intake and the outgo to be equal. What you felt within is expressed in the without. There is balance, equilibrium, and equanimity. In a nutshell you are what you think all day long. Your personality is the sum total of all your thoughts, feelings, beliefs, opinions, early indoctrination, and environmental conditioning. Instead of identifying yourself with anger, resentment, bitterness, and hatefulness, identify immediately with peace, harmony, poise, and balance. With this attitude, you are really practicing the presence of God. You are separating yourself from the old attitudes of mind, and you are identifying yourself with the new that which you desire to be. You are developing a marvelous and wonderful personality, and you find that you are exuding more and more vibrancy. You want to be peaceful, happy, radiant, healthy, prosperous, and inspired. Therefore, from this moment forward, you must refuse to identify with the negative thoughts that tend to drag you down. Our mind is a garden. In this garden, which is called the Garden of Eden or the Garden of God, we plant seeds. Regardless of what we sow with our conscious mind, our subconscious will bring it to pass. Therefore, let us sow the thoughts of peace, happiness, guidance, and goodwill. Let us meditate on these qualities and accept them in our conscious, reasoning mind. Whatever we accept in our conscious, reasoning mind, our subconscious, which is like the soil, will accept without question and bring it to pass. This is the law of life. Whatever you believe is true in your conscious mind your subconscious will accept without question. Be very careful that you accept only that which is true, noble, and godlike. Radiate love, peace, and goodwill to everyone. Wish for them health, happiness, and peace, and all the blessings of heaven. How will you get your subconscious to work for you? 
First of all, realize the great secret that the intake and the outgo must be equal. The impression and the expression must be equal. All frustration is due to unfulfilled desires. Chapter 5. Become a lifter upper. If you take any idea, dream, or aspiration of yours and lift it up to the point of acceptance in your mind, it will come to pass. In the prayer process you must lift up your concept to the point of acceptance. Then the manifestation will follow. Your physical senses report their findings, which, at best, are depressing. In prayer you turn within to the infinite presence and power. Anchor your mind there. This infinite intelligence is responsive to you. Call upon it and it will answer you. When you call upon this divine power you will receive an answer. You can receive courage, faith, strength, power and wisdom that transcend the ordinary physical senses. You are then lifted up. The old state dies and the new state is resurrected. You cannot manifest your good in a depressed, dejected state. You hold your vision and contemplate its reality. The vision is what you are looking at, giving attention to, what you are focused on. Attention is the key to life. Whatever you give attention to, whatever you focus on, your subconscious mind will bring to pass. Your subconscious always magnifies what you give attention to. As you contemplate a supreme intelligence within you, you will realize that here is a power that will respond to you, guide, direct you, open up new doors, set you on the high road to happiness, freedom and peace of mind. You don't, as a rule, rise by accident from the slums and obscurity to wealth, honor and fame by saving someone from drowning at the seashore or by meeting a millionaire who likes you. Remember a simple truth. You will always demonstrate your character, your state of mind. Character is destiny. Character is the way you think, feel, and believe, the spiritual values you have enthroned in your mind, the integrity and honesty that you have established in your mind. These qualities pay dividends. Release your talents and abilities and develop a zeal and enthusiasm to learn more about your inner powers. You then can lift up yourself to astonishing heights. Energetic, confident and enterprising people who attend to business, do the right thing, practice the golden rule, will make a success of their lives, whether or not they meet a stranger who will help them or know the right politician, or win a sweepstakes ticket. Your character, your mental attitude, your thought and feeling will make or break you. Thought and feeling create your destiny. It's as simple as that. Any idea, emotionalized and felt as true, your subconscious will bring to pass good, bad or indifferent. Therefore, it is wise to have the right idea ideas which heal, bless, inspire, elevate and dignify your soul. These ideas generate emotions. Emotions compel you to act them out. Therefore, get good ideas. If you desire to lift up yourself and put your head above the rock, Ask the supreme intelligence within you to give you what you need and it will respond to you. Realize infinite intelligence is guiding you, revealing hidden talents to you, opening up new doors for you, showing you the way you should go. And the guiding principle within you will lead and guide you in all your ways. There are two kinds of people on earth today just two kinds of people no more. Not the good and the bad, for it is well understood the good are half bad and the bad are half good. Not the happy and sad not the rich or the poor, not the humble and proud. No the two kinds of people on earth are the people who lift and the people who lean. Wherever you go, you will find the world's masses are ever divided into just these two classes. And, strangely enough, you will find it seems that there is only one who lifts for twenty who lean. Do you know anyone who leans? Are you a lifter upper? Are you a leaner or whiner? Do you lean on others? You are here to grow, to transcend and to discover the divinity within you. You are here to meet problems, difficulties and challenges and to overcome them. You are not here to run away from them. The joy is in overcoming. If the crossword puzzle were filled out for you, it would be very insipid in our world. The joy is in solving the puzzle. The engineer rejoices in overcoming all obstacles, failures, and difficulties in building a bridge. You are here to sharpen your mental and spiritual tools while you grow in wisdom, strength and understanding. Otherwise, you would never discover your divinity. Don't let your young children lean on you indefinitely for everything. When they are old enough, teach them to mow the lawn, how to sell newspapers, and how to do odd jobs for which they are paid. Teach them the dignity of labor, and then the money they receive for mowing the lawn for the neighbor, or for babysitting, is for work well done. This will give your children pride in accomplishment and in their contribution of service to others. 
it will also teach them self-reliance and confidence in themselves. Teach them also to see the good in others and how to call it forth. They will always be a lifter, not a leaner or whiner and complainer. They will respect and save the money they earn. You must be careful how to give to others. Never rob a person of an opportunity to grow and to advance. Young people who receive money and help too easily and too frequently find it easier than self-discovery and self-propulsion. Constant assistance is destructive to their maturity. Cease psychologically demeaning the other person. Stop destroying their initiative. Give them an opportunity to overcome and to discover their inner powers. Otherwise, you will make them leaners always seeking a handout. I told a woman to stop filling the refrigerator for a relative of hers who recently relocated to her town. Her attitude was, poor Tom, he is a stranger here. It's hard for him to get a job. She paid his rent, bought groceries for him, gave him pocket money until such time as he could get a job. He never got a job. Rather, he became the perfect leaner. He even resented her because she didn't give him more. At a Christmas dinner to which he was invited, he actually stole most of her silver, and she cried out, why did he do this after all I've done for him? She didn't do anything for him. She had been seeing him through the eyes of lack and limitation. However, instead of lifting him up, realizing he was one with infinite intelligence and boundless wisdom, that he was led to his true place, and clothing him mentally with the riches of heaven, what had she done? Figuratively speaking, she clothed him in rags. Poor Tom. Seeing him in lack and limitation, at the same time building that lack and limitation in herself. Because what you think and feel about the other, you are creating in your own mind and in your own body. Tom subconsciously picked up the negative attitude of this woman and reacted accordingly. He couldn't react any other way. You should always be ready to help those who are really hungry or in want and distress. This is right, good and true. However, be sure that you do not make a parasite of them. Your assistance must always be based on divine guidance, and your motivation must be to help them to help themselves. If you teach others where to find the riches of life, how to become self-reliant and how to contribute best to humanity, they will never want for a bowl of soup, a suit of clothes or a handout. Because you taught them where the source is. You taught them how to tap their own subconscious minds. They can have an idea worth a fortune. There is only one mind, whether you say it's God's mind or the human mind. Where did the radio, television, everything come from? Out of the human mind. All of us are willing to give a helping hand but it is wrong to contribute to the shortcomings, derelictions, laziness, apathy and indifference of others. All of us are here to put our shoulders to the wheel. If you are wearing just a loincloth, someone made it for you. What are you doing for others? Are you working and contributing your talents and abilities? Do you say, the world owes me a living? It doesn't. What do you owe the world? There are many beggars who are able-bodied and who make a profession begging for alms and as long as you give to them, they will never work. They become parasites and leaners. Some of them are very wealthy. They have fashionable homes and cars, whether in London, New York or elsewhere. I knew a beggar in New York who had three homes. One was in London, one was in Paris, and another was upstate. He used to laugh at people who would give him a dollar. Within all of us there is a vast mind of undiscovered gifts, powers and riches. Each of us is responsible and children must be made aware of their responsibilities to society. All of us are a part of humanity on the pathway of life. There are some people who are constantly complaining about society, business and all that. They don't like the words, ambition, competition, and, success. Heavens! Their parents came over here and couldn't even speak the language. They came over here penniless. They became the great engineers, the great doctors, the great scientists, and the great physicists they contributed to this country. Our history is rife with examples of men and women who rose from poverty and misery to become leaders of industry or government. They did not give up when faced with obstacles, but worked hard to face and overcome them. Dave Thomas, the man who founded the Wendy restaurant chain, is an example of such a man. He was an orphan who was adopted by a poor family. His adoptive mother died early in his childhood and his father, an itinerant laborer, never stayed in one place long enough to establish roots. Dave had to work from childhood on. He worked most frequently doing menial labor in the kitchens of hotels and restaurants. He became intrigued with the restaurant industry and hoped to someday own his own restaurant. 
Despite the hardship of his poverty and his unstable family life, he never gave up his desire. He programmed in his subconscious mind that he would achieve this goal, and despite many setbacks he never gave up. By working in almost all capacities in restaurants, he learned about every aspect of the business. He became an expert cook, a competent marketer and a top customer relations man. In due course he became a manager of a Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet. His great success in this position enabled him to obtain backing to open his own restaurant, and expand it to become one of the most profitable fast food chains. Despite his success, he never forgot his beginnings. Because of his need to work to support himself, he had dropped out of high school. But after he achieved success, he encouraged youngsters who were potential dropouts to continue their schooling. He backed this up by choosing to be an example to dropouts by working to get his own high school diploma 45 years after he left school. His goal now is to persuade school dropouts whether they've recently dropped out, or whether it's been years since they've been in school that it's never too late to graduate. I tell people to program their minds to get all the education they possibly can. The fact that I got my diploma 45 years after dropping out shows that it's never too late, said Thomas. Even with everything that's happened in my life, getting this diploma is one of my most important accomplishments. In addition to his work in the field of education, as an adopted child himself, he became a leader in the field of adoption. Thomas donated millions of dollars and much of his time to working with adoption services and lobbying to obtain more equitable laws in this area. His desire for success was not for selfish gain or attainment of power, but to help others learn to program their minds for success and to overcome the problems similar to those he had faced and beaten. You too can do what Dave Thomas did, in your own way. You are here to do your share, whether pulling an oar or driving a car. Life rewards faith, courage, endurance, stick to itiveness and persistence with more of these qualities. It is by overcoming obstacles that you develop character, and character is destiny. Lean on the divine presence within you and not on people or the government. The government can't give you anything except it first takes it away from you. Furthermore, no government can legislate peace, harmony, joy, abundance, security, wisdom, love of neighbor, equality, prosperity or goodwill. How frightfully dumb can people be? You create all of these. You can give yourself security. The government is on your own mind. A government of divine ideas mothered by divine love. This is the government of the free. No one else in the entire world can guarantee freedom, peace of mind or health for you. These things come from the spiritual world within you. There are the leaners who drift along on their name, background, heredity or good looks until people become aware of how empty inside they are. Then they fall, because they have no inner support and strength. The thing that supports you is your faith, your confidence and your trust in the powers of your subconscious mind. A business executive in Los Angeles told me that in 1929 he had lost everything in the market crash. So did his brother. Each of them had been worth over $1 million. His brother committed suicide. He jumped out of a window. He said there was nothing to live for, that he lost everything. This business executive told me that he said to himself, I have lost money. So what? I have good health, a lovely wife, abilities and talents. I have wisdom that I have garnered through the years. I have financial acumen, sagacity. I'll make it again. He rolled up his sleeves and went to work. Oh, yes. He watered gardens, mowed lawns, washed automobiles. He did a lot of odd jobs. He accumulated money again. He reinvested it, and he became immensely wealth again in a short period of time. How could you take away his talents, his abilities, wisdom, understanding, and experience? That's where riches are. That's where the gold mine is. It's where the pearl of great price is in your own mind. Where you walk and talk with God. This man of whom I spoke gave advice to others along financial lines, and they made a small fortune, too. When you make money for others, you make it for yourself. He was a lifter. He had lifted up himself for he knew there is a divine power which would reveal to him a way out, an answer. He had called upon the spiritual reserves within him, and strength, courage, wisdom and guidance came to him. Infinite intelligence is responsive to you and will answer when you call. It says, I and my God are one. You and this infinite intelligence are one. Don't lean on land, stocks, the government, your background, heredity or anything else. 
Trust the supreme wisdom within you to sustain you, to watch over you at all times. Stop looking outside. Look inside. If you look outside for help, you are denying the riches of the divine within you. You are stealing power, wisdom and intelligence from yourself. The living spirit almighty within you, which created you, is the source of all things. It is the source of the air that you breathe. The whole world was here when you were born. Yes, the cattle on a thousand hills, the sun, moon and stars, all the water in the world and all the gold in the hills were all here when you were born. Life was a gift to you. How could you earn a living? You couldn't earn it. It was a gift. You are here to release the imprisoned splendor that is within you. You are here to release your talents. If you think you are here to earn a living, that's all you will ever do. But life was a complete gift to you. God is life. That is your life now. It was never born. It will never die. Believe in yourself as a spiritual being of grandeur. Recognize your divinity. Moreover, contemplate the truth that you are here to release the imprisoned splendor that is within. Be a lifter upper by realizing there is an infinite power to back you up. This power will lift you up, heal you, inspire you, open up new doors for you, give you new, creative ideas, present you with a sense of deep, abiding security in that which changes not and is the same yesterday, today and forever. All you have to do is to trust this presence and believe in it, and wonders will happen in your life. The lifters meet a problem head on. They say to themselves, this problem is divinely outmatched. The problem is here, but the supreme intelligence, which people call God, is here, too. And God wins. They grapple with all hurdles, business problems, engineering and space problems with faith, courage and confidence. They go forth to conquer sickness, fear and ignorance. We will never abolish the material slum until we abolish the slums in our own minds. People are talking about pollution. Pollution is in the mind. A clean mind is a clean body. We have to cleanse the mind first. The mind is polluted with fear, ignorance, greed and everything else under the sun cleanse the mind. You don't have to worry about the atmosphere. Some scientist will come along. Invent a new chemical, a new discovery for there is an antidote to everything. And, lo and behold, all pollution goes away. There is an old saying that the weak chick gets pecked to death by the healthy ones. It is true, too. The boy in school who feels beaten, defeated, rejected and demeans himself is picked on by the bully and others. Why? Because he is weak inside. He feels inferior, inadequate. He is full of fear. He is saying to himself, I'm no good. But when he stands up to the bully, challenges him, and meets him head on, the so-called bully always retreats. Feel your dignity and grandeur as a child of God. Everybody is a child of the living God. Feel your dignity and grandeur, therefore, as a child of God. Realize that you are immune to the insults, criticism and vilification of others, because you are divinely intoxicated. If you exalt and love the divine presence within you, everybody, even your so-called enemies, will be constrained to do you good. Refuse to accept suffering, and never resign yourself to any situation. You are a transcendental being and you can lift yourself up mentally over all conditions and circumstances. When Abraham Lincoln was informed that a member of his cabinet, his secretary of war, was maligning and traducing him and calling him an ignorant baboon, he replied, he is the greatest secretary of war this country ever had. No one could hurt Lincoln or wound his ego. Lincoln knew where his strength was, and he knew that no one could drag him down except through a movement of his own mind. Lincoln was a lifter which means he not only lifted up himself, but he recognized the divine presence within him. He thereby acquired the strength to lift the whole country. Likewise, if someone criticizes or condemns you and calls you a skunk, well, are you a skunk? How could it upset you? It would have to be a movement of your own thought, wouldn't it? Nobody can hurt you but you. You can curse or bless. Where there is no opinion, there is no suffering. If the cucumber is bitter, don't eat it. Where there is no judgment, there is no pain. Do you have an opinion about the headlines in the morning newspaper? Did you get all boiled up about it? Are you in a state of turmoil? If you keep it up, all it will get you is an ulcer or high blood pressure, or indigestion. Who gave you indigestion? Not the columnist who wrote the article. You gave it to yourself. He's entitled to write that article. He has freedom to think the way he thinks. 
You have freedom to write to the editor and completely contradict everything he said. But he has a perfect right to his opinion. So have you. And you grant him freedom to write that. I am sure he would grant you the freedom to disagree with him. Do your in-laws disturb you? Your mother-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law or someone else? Are you saying, he doesn't think the way I think he should think? Or she doesn't act the way I think she should act? Or they don't believe the way I think they should believe? Well, why should they? They are adults. And if what they think or do begins to worry you, you're going to get sick and will end up on a psychiatrist's couch. You know of some so-called, do-gooders, in many cities who go about seeking paroles for molesters of children, sex fiends and other deviates who kill, maim and choke young girls or boys. And the minute they get out, they again attack, rape and even kill. You read it every day in the newspaper. He was just released. Our newspapers are full of this sort of thing. Before you can uplift and help others, you must first be lifted up in wisdom and understanding. You can't give what you don't have. And if you don't have some mental acumen and sagacity and some wisdom, you will begin to release prisoners who will go out and kill. They tell you they've got religion or something, and you are so gullible you'll believe them. But a man with a little mental acumen and perspective, believing in a guiding principle, doesn't fall for that bunk. It is wrong to release people who kill, maim and destroy. They should be incarcerated. Not that we hate them or anything like that, but they should be put away to protect themselves as well as others. They don't belong in society. They can change if they want to. Anybody can change who wants to, but he or she must want to. You can give only what you have. Often the soapbox preachers and the do-gooders are simply projecting their own shortcomings and inadequacies upon others. The blind cannot lead the blind. You know about that old preacher who was denouncing alcohol. He thought it was the only evil in the world. It's just a bad habit. The evil is in the mind, not in the alcohol. The alcohol has no power except you give it power. You can break the bottle and throw it down the sink. The power is in you. But, anyhow, he began to rant and rave. He said, we should take all the whiskey in town and throw it in the river. Then he said, now, we'll have a new hymn, page 35, hymn number 66, let us gather at the river. You see how silly the whole thing is. There is no one to change but yourself. You have to be nice to yourself. The real self of you is God. Exalt, honor, revere and respect this divine presence within you. Then you are loving and honoring your neighbor. Don't tell me you can love the person next door except you first love and honor the God self within you. You can't do it. Your neighbor is the closest thing to you. It's the divinity that shapes your ends. It's the spirit that started your heartbeat that grows hair on your face and created the world. God is your neighbor, the living spirit. Therefore, you have a healthy, wholesome, reverent respect for the divinity within you. Give it all your allegiance and devotion. Don't give any power to men, women, institutions, sticks or stones, stars, sun or moon. The moment you do, you are wandering off with strange gods. There is only one God not more. If you love this God presence meaning you give it your allegiance, devotion, loyalty to the exclusion of everything else then the minute you give power to any man or woman, stick or stone, you cease to love the divine presence. But when you respect the divinity within you, you will automatically respect the divinity in the police officer, the college professor, your mother, your father and the neighbor next door because you will realize that everyone is an incarnation of the divine. The lifter knows that he or she is here to go forth conquering and to conquer. The lifter affirms, the infinite presence and power gave me this desire, and the divine wisdom will reveal the perfect plan for its development. This attitude dispenses with all frustration. That's the way to get an answer to your prayer. All of us are interdependent. You may need a doctor, lawyer, psychologist or carpenter, and they may need you. We need each other. But let us remember to lift up God in everyone, to see each person, as he or she ought to be, the child of God, radiant, joyous, prosperous and free. Be a lifter. Yes, you should have ambition, and you should want success. There are some people today who despise success. Don't listen to them. You were born to succeed, to be successful in your prayer life, your relationship with people in your chosen work, your communion with the divine. If you are a doctor, you want to become a great surgeon so you can save the lives of thousands. You don't want to be a mediocre surgeon. You want to be a great chemist, a great engineer, 
a great teacher, or a great manager. Then you are able to bless humanity. Clothe people with majesty and excellence. Adorn and embellish them with the sunshine of love. As you first love and exalt the divinity within yourself, you will then automatically exalt it in others. If you are married and you don't exalt this divinity within yourself, honor it and give it your allegiance, you can't respect or love your spouse. You can't do it. Seek and ye shall find. Yes, you'll find tongues in trees, sermons in stones, songs in brooks and God in everything, for there is only God anyhow. The lifter knows the truth of this ancient saying. What thou seest, that, too, become thou must. God if thou seest God, and dust if thou seest dust. The kids today are talking about materialism. There isn't any such thing. There is only spirit and matter. Matter is the lowest degree of spirit, and spirit is the highest degree of matter. And what are they denouncing? They use the credit card to get a fancy car, and then are buying all the trinkets, the cell phones, video games, iPods and everything else, and charging it to their parents. Apparently, they like the good things of life, yet at the same time denounce them. That's hypocrisy of the first water. It's like a preacher denouncing wealth, and then asking for a second collection. You see how phony that is. Cease crawling, cringing and living in the shadows and eddies of life. Exalt God in the midst of you, mighty to heal. One with God is a majority. God is with you now. In a nutshell character is destiny. Character is the way you think, feel, and believe, the spiritual values you have enthroned in your mind, the integrity and honesty that you have established in your mind. These qualities pay dividends. Release your talents and abilities and develop a zeal and enthusiasm to learn more about your inner powers. You then can lift up yourself to astonishing heights. Thought and feeling create your destiny. Any idea, emotionalized and felt as true, your subconscious will bring to pass good, bad or indifferent. Therefore, it is wise to have the right idea ideas which heal, bless, inspire, elevate and dignify your soul. These ideas generate emotions. Emotions compel you to act them out. Therefore, get good ideas. You are here to grow, to transcend, and to discover the divinity within you. You are here to meet problems, difficulties and challenges and to overcome them. You are not here to run away from them. The joy is in overcoming. Be a lifter upper by realizing there is an infinite power to back you up. This power will lift you up, heal you, inspire you, open up new doors for you, give you new, creative ideas, present you with a sense of deep, abiding security in that which changes not and is the same yesterday, today and forever. All you have to do is to trust this presence and believe in it, and wonders will happen in your life. Be a lifter. Yes, you should have ambition, and you should want success. There are some people today who despise success. Don't listen to them. You were born to succeed, to be successful in your prayer life, your relationship with people in your chosen work, your communion with the divine. Chapter 6. There are certain things you cannot change. There is an old saying, prayer changes things. That is true, but there is a way in which it is true. Prayer changes the one who prays, and prayer is the contemplation of the truths of God from the highest standpoint. We become that which we contemplate. As we meditate on harmony, beauty, love, peace, divine guidance, divine right action, and goodwill to the entire world magically melts into the image and likeness of our contemplation. This changed attitude is reflected in the reaction of others toward us and similarly appears in all phases of our life. Some years ago when Nikita Khrushchev, then the leader of the Soviet Union, visited America, a woman wrote to me saying she was going to pray for him to cause him to change and become peaceful, harmonious, and loving toward this country. She thought that by sending out vibrations of love, peace, and harmony to Mr. Khrushchev, he would become mentally transformed. Her approach was all wrong. I explained to her there was no one she could change but herself and that she, together with others, could help to change the world. But she had to begin regularly, systematically, and devotedly practicing the presence of God by reiterating the following great truths until they sank into her subconscious mind where they would become convictions. This is the prayer. I am divinely guided in all ways. I think, speak, act, and react from the standpoint of the indwelling God. I meditate on those things are true, lovely, noble, and godlike. I contemplate divine law and order in my life. Divine love fills my soul. Divine right action reigns supreme. 
I know that every thought tends to manifest itself in a varying degree in my life, and as I continue to think along these lines, I know that these truths become subjectified and I will be compelled to express and radiate what I think all day long. Together with others I generate a mighty spiritual force which neutralizes the mental poisons of the mass mind. The Bible says, let God arise and his enemies be destroyed, which means to resurrect the light, truth, and love of God in your own mind and heart. And the enemies are fear, hate, jealousy, greed, anger, doubt, and self-condemnation. All of these are the poisons that we generate in our own mind. Jesus called them the enemies in your own household. But when love, light, and truth are resurrected, these will automatically be destroyed in your own mind. Your spiritual vibrations of love, peace, harmony, and goodwill will be poured out on all humankind, thereby nullifying to some degree the miasma of the mass mind. Praying for someone else is vastly different from trying to change the other person. For example, if your mother asked you to pray for her, you would accept her request and then contemplate the infinite healing presence flowing through her as harmony, beauty, peace, joy, and vitality. By dwelling on the wholeness, beauty, and perfection of God and His divine love, you would rise in consciousness to the point of acceptance, and your mother, being open and receptive, and since there is no time or space in mind, the idea of perfect health would be resurrected in her subconscious mind. You would enter into the mental conviction that a healing would take place, and according to your belief would it be done unto you, for a word is a thought expressed. And if you really believe what you claim to be true, it will come to pass. Some years ago I was told about a woman who was very irate, incensed, and furious because of the music being played next door to her in the hotel morning, afternoon, and night. The hotel manager informed her that it was the great Cardo, a famous French pianist, who was practicing for his concert. Oh, she said. I have tickets for that concert. I'm going to have my friends in the hotel come to my room and listen to him. Nothing had changed but her attitude. The hotel was the same, the music was the same, and the atmosphere was the same. The only thing that had changed was her thought. There is no one to change but yourself. You cannot change the tides, the rotation of the earth, or the movement of the sun, the moon, or the order of the galaxies in space. You cannot guide the planets in their courses, or interfere with the heat of the sun or the four seasons. You cannot change the variety of the weather all over the world. The reason for this is obvious. God works on the cosmic or universal plane. We humans work on the particular or individual plane. In other words, God, or the universal intelligence, will do nothing for you except through your thought, imagery, and convictions. In order for God, or the universal spirit, to work on the plane of the particular, it must become the particular. That's modern science today. There are certain things you cannot change but you can change yourself and mold, fashion, and create your own future. Your thought and feeling creates your destiny, whether you know it or not. I visited a man in the hospital who had undergone a major operation. He told me his kidneys had completely given up functioning. He asked me to pray for him, saying, I have no future. I'm only 40, but I suppose I'm done for. What will happen to my family? Prayer is all that's left. I said to him that his first step was to believe sincerely and willingly that a cosmic healing power which made his body and all his organs could restore and heal him. We prayed together as follows. We freely join together now in an awareness that the infinite healing presence, which made your body and all its organs knows all the processes and functions of your body, and the miraculous healing power is permeating every atom of your being, making you whole and perfect. All your organs are God's ideas, and through the power of the Almighty they are functioning perfectly now. After about 15 minutes our prayer was answered, and his kidneys began to function, which pleased his surgeon immensely. He is now back with his family and in perfect health. While conferring with me recently, he said, my future is assured. I know that my future is my present thought grown up, which, of course, is absolutely true. This man knows that his faith in the goodness of God, in the guidance of God, and in the creative power of his own thought will always be made manifest in his life. With this attitude, he is building a glorious future for himself full of harmony, health, peace, and abundance. A few years ago while lecturing at the Science College in Belfast, Ireland, I interviewed a young woman who said to me, I haven't got the power to handle my troubles and difficulties or to meet and solve the problems of life. I am divorced. I hate myself, and I'm no good. 
I explained to her that her condition was simply due to habitual negative thinking and to constant criticism and self-condemnation, which were poisoning the springs of hope, faith, confidence, and enthusiasm, and were rendering her a physical and mental wreck. In other words, she was taking mental self-generated poisons, and she was polluting the sanctuary of the living God within her, which was her own mind. I told her the story of how Eddie Rickenbacker, the famous aviator, and his companions were shipwrecked, set adrift in a raft in the Pacific Ocean. He prayed for food and a gull came and perched on his head. It remained long enough to be seized and utilized for food. He prayed to be rescued, and, of course, he was picked up. He believed in the wisdom and power of God to take care of him. The answer came, for the infinite power answers you when you call, believing. Call upon me. I will answer you. I'll be with you in trouble. I will set you on high, because you have known my name. The name always in the Bible means the nature. The nature of infinite intelligence is to respond to your call. This episode made a profound impression on the young Irish girl. I gave her the following prayer, pointing out that it was a process of reconditioning her mind and that when negative thoughts of any kind came into her mind which they would because of her destructive habit of self-condemnation and self-denigration she was to immediately supplant them with a spiritual thought. This is the prayer that she was to repeat out loud for about 10 minutes morning and night. I am a child of God. I am a channel of God. And God has need of me where I am. Otherwise, I would not be here. I know I am here to express more of God's love, life, truth, and beauty. I am here to do my share and to contribute to humanity. I have much to give. I can give love, laughter, joy, confidence, and goodwill to all people to all animals, and to all things in God's universe. I am here to stir up the gift of God within me. I realize that I am a gardener, mentally speaking. And as I sow, so shall I reap in life. Life is a mirror for the king as well as for the beggar. And whatever I give to life, life returns to me magnified, multiplied, and running over. I deposit in the garden of my mind wonderful seeds of peace, love, goodwill, success, harmony, and joy. I forgive myself for harboring negative, destructive thoughts, and I pour out love and goodwill to all my relatives and to all people everywhere. I know when I have forgiven others, because when I meet them in my mind there is no sting. I no longer sizzle, and I am free. I am constantly partaking of the fruit of the delightful seeds I am depositing in my subconscious mind, which is called the Garden of Eden, or the Garden of God. I know that my thoughts, like seeds, will be made manifest as form, function, experience, and conditions. I think on these things, and the cosmic power within me brings all these things to pass, and I am at peace. She repeated the above prayer for the recommended ten minutes in the morning and evening, realizing that her eyes saw these truths and her ears heard them, bringing the two faculties of sight and hearing into function, thereby reinforcing the power of her affirmations. I received the following letter. Dear Dr. Murphy. All of us enjoyed your lectures in Belfast, Ireland. You opened the eyes of many. I would like to tell you of the change that has come over me. I prayed the way you told me, and after a few days all the bitterness in my soul disappeared as if by magic. I joined a dancing class. I have been promoted in the store to the position of head of my department. The assistant manager proposed marriage to me, and we are to be married in six months. I have forgiven myself and my relatives. Every day is a new day. I know that I predict my own future by the way I think, feel, and imagine. I am grateful. It is wonderful. On a recent visit to Ireland, the driver asked me, what happens when a priest prays for rain and a Protestant minister prays for dry weather? The answer is, there is a universal wisdom governing the entire world, regulating the action of the cosmic rays, sunspots, precipitation of rain and heat all over the cosmos. And this universal wisdom regulates the atmosphere and meets the needs of all people throughout the world. You do not change God. How could you? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You find out what is true of God and align yourself with the universal principles and verities that existed before any human walked this earth, before any church was formed on the face of the earth. The truths of God were the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you name it, you cannot find it. When you find it, you cannot name it. How on earth could you label love, peace, harmony, joy, wisdom, understanding, inspiration, or guidance? These are universal. Could you name laughter? 
No these are of God. They are eternal. They are within you. You must become a channel through which the light, love, truth, beauty, and peace of the Almighty flow ceaselessly, endlessly, and timelessly. I received a beautiful Christmas card from a member of our organization. The following prayer was printed on it. God grant me the courage to change things that can be changed, the serenity to accept the things that cannot be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. Alcoholics Anonymous and other self-help groups have adopted this prayer, often called the serenity prayer. When you have shut your doors and darkened your room, remember never to say you are alone, for you are not alone. God is within you, and your genius is within. A woman came to me distraught, depressed, and suffering from a guilt complex because her son-in-law had shot someone in the neighborhood. I explained to her that she was not responsible for the actions or state of mind of another person. That she was not to blame for the actions of some demented person, and that if she began to worry, fret, fume, and fulminate over all the psychotics, schizophrenics, sex maniacs in the jails and mental institutions, she would become sick herself, based upon the fact that you become what you contemplate. I added that her business in life is to walk in the awareness of God's love and God's peace, thereby generating a mood of peace, love, and harmony to the whole world. These spiritual vibrations tend to minimize and neutralize the noxious patterns of fear, hate, jealousy, and greed in the mass mind or the race mind. I pointed out to her that creating a wailing wall of depression and guilt within herself would tend to contaminate and poison herself and contribute to the misery and suffering of the race. She thereupon absolved herself from a sense of guilt and walked out a free woman into the sunshine of God's love. The elements comprising the atmosphere are innocuous. There are many people who say when the winter comes they get rheumatism or sciatica. They do, because of their expectancy, fear, and belief. Job said, what I fear most comes upon me. That's a psychological law. It's absolutely true. Millions of people do not get the flu, aches, pains, sniffles, or rheumatism when the weather changes. Therefore, it is not universal law. If it were, all people would be afflicted when the weather changes. Obviously, it is due to the mental and emotional climate of their own minds. You must remember health and peace of mind are of God the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace and good shall come to thee. Get acquainted with the God presence within you, the living Spirit Almighty, which can't be sick, frustrated, or vitiated in any way. It was never born, it will never die. Water wets it not, fire burns it not. Winds blow it not away. And there is something in you when you were born that was never born. There is something in you that when you die will never die. There is something in you that was never hurt while you may have been hurt. Emerson said that. That's the living spirit within you, the God presence. Let the infinite ocean of peace, joy, and wisdom flow through you, and you will discover you can adjust to any weather under the sun if you are fearful and worried and say, the night air gives me a chill, or, I catch my death of cold if my feet get wet, you are simply decreeing sickness and suffering for yourself. The night air never said to anyone, I will give you pneumonia or a virus infection. No, men and women have polluted the atmosphere with their weird, grotesque, and superstitious beliefs, and according to their belief is it done unto them. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That comes from the book of Proverbs. We may define fear as being afraid, but it also has another meaning. To have a wholesome, reverent respect for something in the same manner that you would have respect for the principles of electricity, chemistry, and physics. Give all power to the God presence within you, not to the air around you. You must be careful to not let the demagogues try to make you feel guilty because of some crime committed by somebody else. Why should you feel guilty? You can't do anything about the insensate actions of others, or what they say or don't say. You are not guilty because John Jones shot his wife. What is the sense of generating mental poisons of grief, sorrow, hostility, and depression within yourself and exuding that noxious mental effluvia into the mass mind that is contaminated enough already. You must not permit others to manipulate your mind for ulterior purposes. Your mission in life is to walk in the consciousness of God's love, knowing that with your eyes stayed on God, there is no evil on your pathway. The peace of the everlasting God fills your soul. It is a lamp unto your feet and a light upon your path. God is love, and that love fills your soul and the healing presence of the living God animates and sustains you. 
The light of God permeates every atom of your being so that your whole body dances with the rhythm of the eternal God. In a nutshell there are certain things you cannot change, but you can change yourself and mold, fashion, and create your own future. Your thought and feeling creates your destiny, whether you know it or not. When faced with doubt about taking a stand on a situation, pray the serenity prayer. God grant me the courage to change things that can be changed, the serenity to accept the things that cannot be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. Your business in life is to walk in the awareness of God's love and God's peace, thereby generating a mood of peace, love, and harmony to the whole world. These spiritual vibrations tend to minimize and neutralize the noxious patterns of fear, hate, jealousy, and greed in the mass mind or the race mind. There is no sense in generating mental poisons of grief, sorrow, hostility, and depression within yourself and exuding that noxious mental effluvia into the mass mind that is contaminated enough already. You must not permit others to manipulate your mind for ulterior purposes. Your mission in life is to walk in the consciousness of God's love, knowing that with your eyes stayed on God, there is no evil on your pathway. Chapter 7. Learning to Say Yes and No in Life Two of the most important words in the whole world are, yes, and, no, it is your obligation to say, yes, to all the ideas which heal, bless, inspire, elevate, and to accept only the eternal verities and spiritual values of life, and then purposefully build these into your own personality. You must say, no, to all teachings, ideas, thoughts, creeds, and dogmas that inhibit, restrict, and instill fear into your mind. In other words, accept nothing mentally that does not fill your soul with joy. You must realize that God is infinite life and that he is your life right now. God is boundless love, and his love fills your soul. God is joy, and you are expressing the fullness of joy. God is wisdom, and your intellect is constantly anointed with the light from on high. God is peace, and you are expressing more and more of God's peace in your thoughts, words, and deeds. As you make a daily habit of realizing these truths, you will develop a radiant personality and make a highway for your good in all ways and things. The Bible says, Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. When you are in the valley of despair, dejection, melancholia, turn to the God presence within you and realize that external things and conditions are not causative. All things pass away. Conditions do not create other conditions. The primary cause is your thought and feeling. Thought and feeling create your destiny, and thought and feeling represent your mental attitude, the way you believe. Conditions and circumstances are suggestive only. You have the power to reject or to accept them. Decide, therefore, that infinite intelligence reveals the way out. Contemplate the way you want things to be, and the mountain problem will be removed, and the hill the obstacle or difficulty will be shattered. As you claim that divine law and order govern your life, the crooked the ups and downs of life, the swings of fortune shall be made straight and the rough places plain. That is, you will begin to live a balanced life of growth, achievement, advancement. Free from detours, sickness, accidents, losses, plus foolish expenditures of energy, time, and effort. As you keep your eyes on the God power, and as you tune on the infinite wisdom within you, making contact through your thought and feeling, all the barriers, delays, impediments, and difficulties will disappear and the desert of your life will fully rejoice and blossom as the rose. Say, yes, to the following biblical injunction. It is very beautiful. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. This is your spiritual yardstick. You must judge all your thoughts, reactions, feelings, beliefs, and convictions based upon these eternal truths. Anything, whether it's a lecture from your minister, priest, imam or rabbi, anything that does not conform to these spiritual values, should be completely rejected in your mind. Say, yes, to all the ideas that heal, bless, inspire, elevate, and dignify your soul. Be sure to say, no, emphatically and decisively to any thoughts or suggestions of fear, worry, resentment, ill will, bitterness, or hostility. Remember that what you say, yes, to in life is deposited in your subconscious mind and eventually comes forth as experiences, conditions, and events.
Emerson, one of the world's greatest thinkers, certainly one of the world's greatest philosophers, said, Stop barking against the bad. Chant the beauty of the good. Isn't that beautiful? What you say, no, too, incisively and decisively, departs from your experience. Recently, I talked with a woman employed in a large office. Five o'clock was the quitting time. Regularly and systematically, however, some of the other employees would say to her such things as, Mary, I have an appointment with the chiropodist. Will you finish these letters for me? And another would say she had an appointment with the dentist or the doctor. Still others would claim they had appointments at the airport to meet relatives, and so on. Willingly, she took over all this work, though at the same time deeply resenting it. Mary had to learn to say, no, in her life. She realized these selfish people were pulling the wool over her eyes, taking advantage of her, pushing her around, and laughing at her behind her back. She thereupon decided to make arrangements to have an appointment with her chiropodist and her dentist also. So, when they again asked her to work overtime, she told them it was impossible, that she had to keep her own appointment. From then on she did not allow herself to be taken advantage of in this way. It is wrong to let people take advantage of you or steal from you. Learn to say, no, to everything that is false and everything that you know is untrue. A woman told me recently that she babysat for her son three nights a week, neglecting her own family and her own husband. Her son and daughter-in-law came home at one o'clock or two o'clock o'clock in the morning, usually drunk. They gave her no thanks and showed no appreciation, yet she said she had to take care of the child. I explained to her that it was morally, ethically, and spiritually wrong for her to contribute to their selfishness, boorishness, and delinquency that she should realize her husband and her own family came first. I suggested that the next time they asked her to babysit, she should emphatically say, no get a babysitter and pay the babysitter. This she did. Thereafter, her son and daughter-in-law had far more respect for her and no longer took advantage of her. A man who wrote a manuscript and sent it to several publishers in New York had it returned to him marked, no comment. One publisher performed what the writer called mayhem on his manuscript, which made him furious. He became incensed and highly aggravated. When he learned what he was doing to himself, he began to use the laws of mind constructively. He reasoned as follows. This manuscript contains a lot of useful information. It is not only good, it is very good. Infinite intelligence which is God within you reveals to me the ideal publisher who will appreciate the contents and agree to publish it in divine order. He learned to say, yes, to life. In a few weeks' time he received notice from a publisher that his manuscript was accepted. When a publisher says, no, you don't have to accept this. You can completely reject it and realize that infinite intelligence within you, which is God, opens up the door that no one can shut. A woman told me recently that she and her sister had a telephone conversation. They had an argument, and her sister concluded by saying, you are a skunk, and hung up. She became intensely angry, entered into despondency and gloom, and had what she called a slow burn. I explained to her the workings of her mind and said to her, suppose your sister did say you were a skunk. Ask yourself, am I a skunk? Do I have any of these animal propensities or tendencies? If the answer is no within you, why should you be disturbed? When you get angry and resentful, you tune into the same mental frequency and become enmeshed in the negative, destructive state. It is possible for you to remain completely aloof and detached. You can arise above any abuse aimed at you. You can refuse to accept anything of a hurtful nature. All you have to do is enter into the secret place of the Most High. Tune in with the infinite and affirm boldly. I am identified with the peace, harmony, and love of God, which now flow through me. You can refuse to descend from that impregnable position for any person in this world. Your sister had no power to hurt you and her words had no power. The power is in the movement of your own thought and your own emotion. All you had to do was bless her and go on about your business. She prayed as follows. I fully and freely forgive my sister and wish for her all the blessings of life. Any time I think of my sister, I say to myself, God be with you. After a few days of using this simple prayer, she had a complete healing. Remember, no one can hurt you but yourself. The statements and actions of others have absolutely no power to disturb you. If someone calls you a snake in the grass, it is easy for you to say, God's peace fills your soul, and walk on. Peter O. Spensky, 
one of the great thinkers of the early 20th century, used to say to a student who was disturbed by the words, gossip and actions of another, is there truth in what he said about you? If he said, no, Ospensky would say, well, then, why should you be disturbed? Identify with your aim. What is your aim? Your aim is to identify mentally and emotionally with harmony, peace, wisdom, understanding, success, right action, and beauty. It is as simple as that. There is an old saying, he whom the gods would destroy, they first makes mad. If someone can get you riled up or emotionally disturbed, that person has power over you. Under the sway of that negative emotion you are bound to do something stupid, foolish. Something that you really don't want to do but which you do under the sway of the negative emotion. When you are in the secret place, which means when you are in tune with the infinite, you are an impregnable fortress. No one can lay siege to it. To be alone in the silence is to be alone with God. A young man who was taking up new thought teaching in order to become a minister told me that his mother created scenes at home. These scenes consisted of silent weeping and fainting spells. She would exclaim, you are giving me a heart attack because you are leaving the faith of your fathers, the only true religion. Someday I will die and you will be sorry. She would go into many tantrums during the day. I explained to this young man that his mother's motivation was to get him to refrain from fulfilling his heart's desire. She wanted to get her own way and wanted to make him feel guilty and unkind because he did not conform to her wishes. This is emotional blackmail. I told him that he should absolutely refuse to yield to these tantrums, tears, and stormy scenes, that he had only to say, no, which is what he did and explained to her an age-old truth. The harmony of the part is the harmony of the whole, for the whole is in the part and the part is in the whole. How simple that is. So, he said to his mother, Mom, this new teaching gives me a new lease on life, gives me an inner sense of peace, tranquility and serenity which I never had before. It gives me a sense of well-being, and I have had a marvelous healing of a physical condition that I endured for many years. If you really love me, you will rejoice that I have found peace and harmony, and you will wish me well. Love is not possessiveness. Love is not trying to get the other to conform to your wishes. Neither is it trying to force the other to believe the way you want to believe or to do what you want that person to do. He said, Mom, I am going to stand my ground, and I am going off to be a new thought minister. What gives peace and harmony to me must of necessity give harmony and peace to you. After several months she wrote him a very beautiful letter telling him how grateful and happy she was that he had found his true place in life, and she wished for him all the blessings of life. When you know that something is true, do not try to appease the other person. Always stand on eternal principles. Never yield one iota. You cannot appease a person who is a little Hitler in his or her heart as such people feed on its gratification. Appeasement never gains gratitude. One of our students told me recently that he was a guest in a home and his hostess began to talk to him about reincarnation, karma, and life after death. She was furious and incensed because he did not agree with her on her theory of reincarnation and karma. She said that he must be stupid beyond words not to realize that we come back again and again to expiate for our sins and crimes in a former life. He said, no, to all these falsities in a very polite way saying to her, I give you complete freedom to believe in all these things, and I am glad if your belief gives you solace and comfort. I hope you don't want to impose your beliefs on me, because I cannot accept these beliefs, as they are repugnant to me. I expect you to give me the same freedom as I give you. This is the proper attitude in saying, yes, to the truth and, no, to that, which is false. A few months ago I received a six-page letter from a woman vilifying and denouncing me because I said there was no, hell, limbo, or purgatory. That the only hell that exists is the hell we make in our own mind, which, of course, is absolutely true. She went through the Bible the Old and New Testaments selecting all the quotations referring to Satan, devil, liar in wait, adversary, and so on. In scanning the letter, I realized I was dealing with a sick mind. I simply blessed her and threw the message into the wastebasket and went on to the next letter. How could a poison pen letter, which is only a piece of paper with some ink on it, have any power? The only power it could have is the power you give it in your mind. In other words, the power is in your reaction to it. You have freedom to bless or to curse. To bless is to say, yes, to life and to wish for others everything you wish for yourself. Namely, harmony, health, peace, and all the blessings of life.
Judge Thomas Troward was a former judge and a great teacher in India. In one of his lectures in Edinburgh, he stated there was no devil. He said the only devil was the false belief or false concept of God. The devil is God upside down, which, of course, is absolutely true. In our language it is the distorted, warped, twisted, morbid concept of the God of love. After his lecture a member of the audience said, Mr. Troward, you said there was no devil. He said to the woman, What do you want the devil for? For your husband? She said, No, he said, for your neighbor. She said, No, he said, for yourself. She said, No, then he said, What the devil do you want her for? It is necessary to laugh at many things that happen during the day. If you do not laugh at least six to eight times at yourself during the day, you will never grow spiritually. A priest is reported to have said to a rabbi, Sometimes I think, Rabbi, I behold the Christ in you. The rabbi replied, That in you which enables you to see the Christ in me is that in me that sees the Jew in you. Let us realize we are all children of the one Father. All of us have one common progenitor, the life principle. For God is the life principle in you. You are alive, aren't you? God is life. The Bible says, Have we not all one Father? It also says, When you pray, say, Our Father. This means we are all intimately related. Actually, we are all brothers and sisters. Out of one blood, our life, made he all nations and men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Yes, and, no, are the criteria for judgment. Say, yes, to your unity with God, which is the living Spirit Almighty within you. And Spirit is without face, form or figure timeless, shapeless, and ageless. But it's within you. Say, yes, to the great truth. I and my Father are one. Say, no, to all that would deny this. Say, yes, to the following great prayer. God as, and His, presence flows through me as love, peace, harmony, joy, beauty, wisdom, light, understanding, security, and true expression. I am a focal point for the divine. All the qualities and attributes of God are being expressed through me all day long and every moment of my life I become more godlike in all my ways. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. I said, ye are gods, and the scripture cannot be broken. We are all children of the Most High. Realize that truth and wonders will happen in your life. If you reiterate these great truths, you will develop a marvelous, wonderful personality. You will exude vibrancy and become flooded with the radiance of the light limitless. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Whenever any fear or worry comes to you, or whenever you think you cannot accomplish something, get still and quiet and contemplate the sovereignty of the Spirit. Realize infinity is within you, that God is boundless love, infinite intelligence, infinite life, marvelous wisdom, absolute power, absolute harmony. There is nothing to oppose this God presence or challenge it. If you call upon it, it answers you. Infinite intelligence responds to your thought. Every modern scientist knows that. This type of prayer will bring about complete relaxation, quiet your mind. When in this relaxed state of being, contemplate what you want to be, to do, or to have and the infinite spirit within you will respond to your faith and confidence in it. Remember a great truth. Nothing is forever. Everything passes away. Scientific thinkers do not give power to any created thing. They know that the creator is greater than their thought. The artist is greater than the art. The spiritual-minded person also knows that material things do not make material things. Conditions do not create conditions. Everything is subject to change and modification. You give all allegiance and devotion to the spirit within you. Surely you know that a spirit has no face, form, or figure. It is timeless, shapeless, and ageless. No one has ever seen spirit, but you can feel the spirit of joy, love, ecstasy and rapture in your own mind. When your thoughts are God's thoughts, God's power is with your thoughts of good. The primary cause of spirit is in mind. Do not make a God of anything visible, of any person, place, or thing. There is only one God not two, not three, not four. Just one. I am God, and there is no God beside me. And from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, there is none else. Suppose you went to a sailor on board ship and said to him, I notice yellow pigmentation around your eyes. You look wan, weak, and pallid. You look as if you were going to become very ill. He would treat your remarks with derision, perhaps scorn. 
or he might even think you are mentally unbalanced. He knows his immunity to seasickness. He is full of confidence and faith that he will have a wonderful time on board. He also knows that he can roll with the blows and feel the rhythm of the deep. Realize, therefore, that no person in the world has any power to disturb you but yourself. The conditions, circumstances, and people may suggest certain things to you, but they cannot create the things they suggest. It's always a movement of your own mind, and you can curse or bless. You can say, God's peace fills her soul. God saturates his mind. God is guiding me now. There is right action in my life. You can always identify with your aim. Let nothing bother you. Let nothing frighten you. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing anger you. You are a master. You are in charge of your own conceptive realm. Of your thoughts, feelings, emotions, and reactions. You are a king over your own conceptive realm. When any negative suggestion comes to you, you can say, God's love fills my soul. I am in the secret place of the Most High. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, for I dwell in the house of God forever. In a nutshell it is your obligation to say, yes, to all the ideas which heal, bless, inspire, elevate, and to accept only the eternal verities and spiritual values of life, and then purposefully build these into your own personality. You must say, no, to all teachings, ideas, thoughts, creeds, and dogmas that inhibit, restrict, and instill fear into your mind. Love is not possessiveness. Love is not trying to get the other to conform to your wishes. Neither is it trying to force the other to believe the way you want to believe or to do what you want that person to do. When you know that something is true, do not try to appease the other person. Always stand on eternal principles. Never yield one iota. You cannot appease a person who is a little Hitler in his or her heart as such people feed on its gratification. Appeasement never gains gratitude. Nobody can curse you or have power over you. The only power others could have is the power you give it in your mind. In other words, the power is in your reaction to it. You have freedom to bless or to curse. To bless is to say, yes, to life and to wish for others everything you wish for yourself. Namely, harmony, health, peace, and all the blessings of life. We are all children of the Most High. Realize that truth and wonders will happen in your life. If you reiterate these great truths, you will develop a marvelous, wonderful personality. You will exude vibrancy and become flooded with the radiance of the light limitless. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Whenever any fear or worry comes to you, or whenever you think you cannot accomplish something, get still and quiet and contemplate the sovereignty of the Spirit. Realize infinity is within you, that God is boundless love, infinite intelligence, infinite life, marvelous wisdom, absolute power, absolute harmony. There is nothing to oppose this God presence or challenge it. Never forget. You are the master of your soul. You are in charge of your own conceptive realm. Of your thoughts, feelings, emotions, and reactions. You are a king over your own conceptive realm. Chapter 8. Handling Injustice. There is no doubt that there is injustice in the world. Life isn't always fair and we must learn to understand and live with it. I have often been asked how can we believe in a God who allows unfairness to exist and appears to reward ill-doers and punish good people. The ways of the Eternal One are unfathomable, and what appears often to be unfair may in the long run be beneficial. Some clergy comfort people by telling them they will receive their reward in heaven. Perhaps this is so, but it is a natural desire to enjoy the lives we live here and now. Often one's bad luck is self-created by the negativism that has been inculcated in their subconscious minds. The law of the subconscious mind is impersonal and eminently fair at all times. Your subconscious mind accepts the impress of your thought and reacts accordingly. As you sow, you reap. You can plant orchids and you'll get orchids. Seeds grow after their kind. The seeds are your thoughts, of course. You are what you think all day long. What you feel you attract and what you imagine you become. That's the law of mind. And the law is absolutely just. You can't think evil and expect good. It is your mental attitude operating within you rather than the winds of negative thoughts and the waves of fear from without that makes the difference between promotion and success and failure and loss. The law is absolutely just and mathematically accurate. Your experiences are the exact reproduction of your habitual thinking and imagery. 
You can rise above the mass mind, human cruelties and greed, by aligning yourself with the principle of right action and absolute justice within you. You establish justice in your own mind. Don't look for it in the world. It isn't there. God is absolute justice, absolute harmony, all bliss, boundless love, and fullness of joy, absolute order, indescribable beauty, absolute wisdom, and supreme power. But God is the spirit in you. God is the life principle. Stop looking for it. It's omnipresent. If it's omnipresent, it must be in you. Common sense tells you that. All of these qualities, attributes and potencies of the infinite are within you. When you dwell on these qualities and contemplate the truths of the infinite, you rise above the injustice and the cruelties of the world, and you build a conviction counter to all its false beliefs and erroneous concepts. In other words, you build up a divine immunity, a sort of a spiritual antibody to the mass mind. The mass mind is the thinking of the over six billion people in this world, and you can't tell me that all their thoughts are lovely, noble and godlike. That's absurd. When Joseph T. came to see me, he was angry, resentful and bitter about the company for which he worked. Over the past two years he had been twice bypassed for promotion. He told me that he had earned the promotion by his good work, perfect attendance and adherence to all company policies and procedures. I've always received good performance reviews and never not once have I been reprimanded. When I asked my boss why I didn't get the promotion, he just said that although my work was good, the person who got the promotion was better suited for the higher position. I'd quit tomorrow, but jobs are scarce and I can't afford to be out of work. I told this man, you are resentful, angry, and full of condemnation and criticism of the organization which employs you. These negative suggestions enter your subconscious mind and have resulted in loss of promotion, financial increase and prestige. We promote ourselves. Each of us answers our own prayer. Whatever you impress on your subconscious or believe, your subconscious mind will bring it to pass. Whatever you really believe with your conscious mind, your subconscious will dramatize that and execute it, whether it is good or bad. I gave him the following mental and spiritual formula to practice daily. I know that the laws of my mind are absolutely just and that whatever I impress on my subconscious mind is reproduced accurately in my physical world and circumstances. I know that I am using a principle of mind, and a principle is absolutely impersonal. I am equal before the laws of mind which means what I truly believe will govern what happens to me. I told Joseph to say this prayer every morning and every night. I suggested that before he closed his eyes each night to set his mind on positive thoughts. Think about the contributions you have made on your job, with your family, in your social and religious activities. Dwell on the compliments you received from your boss, your colleagues, your wife and children. Your dreams will follow those thoughts and they will program your subconscious mind for success and happiness. Some months later Joseph reported to me that he had been promoted to head up a new department in the company. He said, I followed your suggestion and it not only changed my attitude, but it unleashed a stream of creativity I didn't know I had. When I got this promotion, my boss told me that he chose me because the new ideas and suggestions that I had proposed showed that I was not just a good worker, but an innovator who could meet the challenges of this new position. I met a very wealthy and philanthropic woman a few years ago. She informed me that in her philosophy money and wealth is like the air around us. I came from a family that was of moderate means, but I always felt that I was rich. After all, I am God's daughter. God gave me richly all things to enjoy. She married a young merchant and together they built a successful retail store, which they expanded into a chain. After her husband died, she sold it for millions of dollars and has spent the past few years establishing college scholarships, endowing hospitals and medical clinics in the developing countries all over the world. She told me, even when I had little money, I said to myself, I am rich and I will do good things with my money. You see, a great law of mind is this. Whatever you attach to I am you become. For example, if you say, I'm no good, I'm a flop, I'm a failure, I'm getting old, I'm no use anymore, whatever you attach to I am you become. Therefore, you should say, I am strong, I am powerful, I am loving, I am harmonious, I am kind, I am inspired, I'm illumined, I'm immensely wealthy, and I am doing what I love to do, divinely happy and divinely prospered. Whatever you attach to I am you become. Therefore, you'd better watch what you're saying when you speak.
Many people who are living in poor circumstances, are envious and resentful of the wealth of their neighbors. This mental attitude results in even more lack, limitation, and poverty in their lives. They are probably unwittingly blocking their own good. Yet, they have a fortune to share if they would but put their minds to the truth of being and realize that they, too, have the key that unlocks the treasure house of the gold mine within. Shortly after I finished broadcasting one of my lectures, I received a phone call from a listener. He said, I just heard your talk, and I disagree with you. You said if I accept that God dwells within me, good things would happen to me. I have been a religious man, go to church regularly, and pray daily and I have suffered nothing but misery. About a year ago my wife and I left our hometown and moved to Oregon to start a new life. I got a job selling insurance, but have had little success. I live in a poor rural area. The farmers and small business owners have little cash and I just can't make a living. My wife is pregnant and if I can't turn this around, we'll be forced to return to our old town and rely on help from our parents. I want to make it on my own. Why are my prayers not working for me? I suggested that he add this prayer. Where I am, God is. God dwells within me and God has need of me where I am. Otherwise, I would not be here. This divine presence within me is infinite intelligence. It is all wise. It knows all and sees all. It's the ever living one, the all wise one, the all knowing one, the self renewing one. It's the life principle in me and reveals to me the next step opening up for me the treasures of life. I give thanks for the answer which comes to me as an intuitive feeling or an idea which wells up spontaneously from my mind. He followed my advice and each morning he awoke feeling stronger and more confident. Recognizing that the potential for increasing his income was limited in just selling insurance, he came up with the idea of capitalizing on his hobby photography. He bought a camera and took pictures of the beautiful Oregon mountains and valleys. He sold the photos to travel magazines. He wrote a brochure about the beautiful landscapes to accompany the photos and send them to travel agencies. He started a tourist business, which has made him a small fortune. This man had found happiness by tapping the treasure house within him establishing justice within himself. He discovered his fortune was right where he was. Diane S. was an environmental engineer. From childhood on she was fascinated by nature and she devoted her life to working to save the environment. She had a doctor's degree in the subject and was working for the Sierra Club, researching ways to conserve our natural resources. As in most not-for-profit fields, her salary was modest. Her sister, on the other hand, had little education took a job as a showgirl in Las Vegas and was earning four times as much money as Diane. She said, it is all so unfair. We must change the system. I worked hard and toiled for six years to get my PhD degree, and my sister never even graduated from high school. I explained to Diane that she could rise above the mass mind the mind that thinks from the standpoint of circumstance, condition and tradition. Accordingly, at my suggestion, she began to practice standing before the mirror each morning and affirming, wealth is mine. Success is mine. Happiness is mine now. She continued affirming these statements for about five minutes every morning, knowing that these ideas would impregnate her subconscious mind. She knew what she was doing and why she was doing it. She realized that she was a gardener planting seeds in the ground. Seeds grow after their kind. When you put seeds in the ground, you water them, fertilize them and they quicken and accelerate their growth. But you can't make the seed grow. The oak is in the acorn. At the end of one month's time the Sierra Club promoted her to a more important job at a far greater salary. She began to write articles about environmental matters that she sold to magazines and she signed a contract with a major book publisher. Millions suffer from injustice all over the world. The reporters write about persecution and even genocide all over the world today the greed for power of a dictator or tyrant can create cruelty to hundreds of thousands or millions of people. These things are shocking, but we have our dictators, despots and tyrants. We've had them down through the ages. We still have them. The emulators of Nero, Ivan the Terrible, Hitler, Stalin and Genghis Khan's are still active. They're all over the world. One general's orders can, of course cause thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions to suffer. The world is full of cruelties and injustices in homes, factories, plants, jails, and everywhere. A research doctor working on cancer for seven years, studying the ravages of the disease, is getting $55,000 a year as a researchman. 
His brother is a truck driver, who gets $75,000 a year, plus benefits. It doesn't seem quite fair. He is angry about it. Well, you have these inequities and injustices all over. The mothers of the world have worked very hard. They don't belong to any union. They receive no guaranteed wage, and often their children shun them. In my experience, sometimes they are never even invited to their children's weddings. In visiting many of them in rest homes, a common complaint is, my children never visit me. Justice is of the mind. You must become acquainted with the mental and spiritual laws. Then you are in a position to command justice, which means to make things even, to balance the imbalances. Justice means just treatment. Justice, when personified, is usually represented as a goddess holding a sword or scale, often both. Her eyes are sometimes blindfolded or closed as tokens of impartiality. Justice is conformity to truth based on righteousness right thought, right feeling, right action based on the golden rule, or the law of love. It means to balance the imbalances and establish equilibrium. Millions all over the world are hungry for peace, harmony, health, abundance, security and love. The place to find security, peace and joy is to get in tune with the infinite and claim, infinite spirit flows through me as love, peace, strength, guidance, harmony, beauty and inspiration. This is the bread of life. It's an invisible, intangible but real food. A merry heart doth good like a medicine, the broken spirit drieth the bones. The bread, of course, is not bread on the table. It's the bread of peace, harmony, right action, beauty, strength and courage. How can you live today without inspiration? Without love? Without guidance? Without inner peace? The real meaning of the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is give us that which is our own. God is the giver and the gift. God is the living spirit within you. The gift has been given. Therefore, we have to learn to be receivers, for all things are ready if the mind is so. Do you pray for air, sunshine or water? Take all the air you want. Who cares? It was always here. It was here before you were born. There is enough fruit, scientists tell us, that rot in the tropics to feed all of humanity. Nature is lavish, extravagant, and bountiful. It's inexhaustible. You can get all the energy you want from hydrogen, you know. It's in the water. There's no shortage of water. There's always the same amount of water in the universe. You are dealing with the infinite. Spirit and matter are one. Matter is the lowest degree of spirit, and spirit is the highest degree of matter. Infinite spirit created the universe, the galaxies of space. Infinite intelligence is within us. We can have an idea worth a fortune. We can have an idea and put millions to work. We can have new ideas about energy or transportation. We can do all these wonderful things, because the infinite within us will reveal it to us. You must persist in that which is right. Right thought, right feeling, right action in the great laws of life. You must persist in taking right action in that which is lovely, noble and godlike. Persevere on these things and all good will be yours. The law is impersonal and neutral. That applies to any law. That's the law of your subconscious mind, also. Whatever you impress is expressed on the screen of space. Morality depends on how you use the law. Murderers can plant seeds or orchids and they will grow for them, also. They can also navigate a plane if they are initiated in the laws of navigation. The law responds to the holy as well as to the cutthroat. Your thought carries its reward. Never take advantage of another or hurt another in any way. To do so is to hurt yourself, because whatever you think about the other you must remember. You are the thinker and you are creating it in your own mind, body and circumstances. You don't always find justice in this world. To think so, of course, is insane. But, in the kingdom of heaven there is justice, and the kingdom of heaven is within you. Heaven is your own mind when it's at peace, and you're a king over your conceptive realm. You are the master over your own thoughts, feelings, actions and reactions. Of course, you're a king over your own mind. You will experience the exact manifestation of your inner beliefs and conviction. As within, so without. As above, so below. As in heaven meaning your mind, so on earth your body, your environment, conditions, your world, your social status, your position in the world, your financial status, all things appertaining to you. All things appertaining to you are a mathematical representation of your inner state of mind. The inside balances the outside. 
as within, so without. There is a divine harmonious solution through the wisdom of the Almighty. Adhere to this truth. When fear comes, affirm. It is God in action, which means all around harmony and peace. God is the life principle in you moving as beauty, harmony, love and peace. It's the living spirit Almighty. It's without face, form or figure. Scientists call it energy. Energy is a term used by science for the living spirit. It moves as unity, moves as harmony. There are no divisions or quarrels in it. There is nothing to oppose the infinite. Infinity can't be divided or multiplied. To think so is absolute insanity. There is only one power not two, or three, or a thousand just one. There is one power moving as unity, harmony. There is nothing to oppose omnipotence. Otherwise, words have no meaning. So, when you say, God in action, it means all around harmony and peace. Adhere to that truth and the day will break and all the shadows will flee away. Insist on right action and harmony. It's wrong to contribute to the greed or the neurosis of another person. Insist on divine law and order in your life. Insist on wholeness and beauty. Insist on divine love, for God gave you richly all things to enjoy. God made you rich. So, give attention to spiritual values. Do this feelingly, knowingly, and intensively and you will be triumphant. For example, the drug, Latril is used by many people who have cancer. Because the U.S. government bans it, they go down to Mexico to obtain it. They have told these cancer patients that they are incurable, it's hopeless, and they are going to die anyhow so why bother? There's no chance, they have nothing to offer you. Well, if these same people believe that Latril can help them, why not let them use it? These injustices and inequities are rampant. They are saying to you, you're going to die, but you must die our way. If you want to go down to Tijuana and get some shots, why shouldn't you? I, personally, have known people who claim they were completely healed of cancer by taking these injections of Latril. Well, if they believe even if the object of your faith be true or false, they get results. According to your belief, even though it's blind belief, your subconscious will respond. Therefore, that makes sense to me. The issue is freedom. By every rational indication, Latril is harmless. It is the active ingredient of apricots. This being so, why can't a free people have it if they want it? If you are mean to yourself, if you are condemning yourself, if you are mistreated by others, if you think you are a doormat, everybody is going to step on you and walk on you. Exalt God in the midst of you, mighty to heal. Because you are a daughter of the infinite, you are a son of the living God. Therefore, be conscious of your dignity as a child of the living God. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's the law of mind. The law is logical, it's eminently fair, and it's absolutely just. As we sow, we reap. There are some who look upon wealth like the air they breathe. They have ideas. They say, infinite intelligence reveals to me new ideas which are creative, which bless humanity. New ideas come to them. There are many people who landed in America from a foreign country. All they had were the clothes on their back, and they had ideas. They studied hard. They learned English. They are now employing thousands and thousands of people. They went up the ladder. They had something to give. The law always evens things up. Law is immutable. A man in Los Angeles feared that he would lose his home. He said, Oh, yes, I'm going to lose it, and he pictured the loss and all that. He said, I can't get the money. My relatives have turned me down. The banks won't give it to me. He began to think of lack, loss and limitation. And, of course, he lost his home. This is equalization of the inner and the outer. You can't think lack, loss and limitation and expect prosperity and success. Then the law would not be just. The law is absolutely just. The inside governs the outside. This is an equalization of the inner and the outside. The inside is one of poverty and privation, fear and lack. That which I greatly fear has come upon me. It's a state of mind. Therefore, according to his belief was it done unto him. To him that hath shall be given. To him that hath a consciousness of wealth believes in a God of abundance. Say, God is the source of my supply. All my needs are met at every moment of time and point of space. Such people attract wealth of all kinds, spiritual, mental and material financial. Yes, they have the consciousness of affluence. 
They looks upon wealth like the air that you breathe. Blessed are the poor. Yes, the poor are open and receptive. They expect great things. If you have a closed mind, I can't teach you anything. You can't put anything into a full cup. A lot of people are that way. They say, I know it all. You can't teach me anything. They look down at you. They believe that it's unfortunate you don't belong to their cult or creed or something else in which they believe. But religion is of the heart. It has nothing to do with the lips at all. Your religion is the thing that binds you. It's your emotional espousal. What you really believe in your heart is made manifest, not what you believe with your lips. Millions are bound by fear. The thing that binds you is your religion. We should be bound back to a god of love. That should be our real religion. A god of love in our own heart, guiding and directing us, our boss, our guide, our troubleshooter, our adjuster. Having such a boss in your mind, you have a god of love. That's true religion. Its ways become ways of pleasantness, and the paths become paths of peace. Don't you know the religion of millions of people in the world is plain ignorance? Buddha said thousands of years ago that the only sin is ignorance, and all the misery and suffering in the world is the consequence. So, imagine ignorance ruling our mind. Isn't that a frightful thing to contemplate? Yet, it rules millions of minds. And superstition governs the minds of millions of people. So, the dominant idea governs you. It governs all your lesser thoughts, feelings, actions and reactions. We are talking about laws of mind. And the laws of mind you cannot change. So, should we take care of people from the cradle to the grave? No if you do, you are psychologically castrating them. You rob them of their divinity. We are here for self-discovery. We are here to make mistakes. When you went to school you got a rubber at the end of your pencil. You're supposed to make mistakes. Through mistakes you learn how to add, subtract, divide. You might make mistakes in human relations. You learn from it. Therefore, when you learn the laws of mind you shouldn't repeat the mistake, because you've learned how to use the laws of mind. You don't rob people of self-propulsion of any shade of self-discovery. So, to take care of them from the cradle to the grave, they become vegetables. They never discover themselves. You rob them of their divinity. It's wrong. Then you say to them, I'm going to see to it that you don't learn. That you don't know who you are. But they are children of the living God, heir to all that is. They are here to learn. Do not deprive them of it. Justice makes things equal. Know the truth. The truth shall set you free. What is the truth? I am is the truth. I am means being, life, awareness. It's a nameless name. When you say I am, you are announcing the presence of the living God. In India they call it Om, which means being, life, awareness. One woman was praying for promotion and advancement. Yet she resented the supervisor, saying to herself, That supervisor is blocking my promotion. I explained to her she was unjust to herself, placing this woman on a pedestal, making her greater than the infinite within her. This attitude makes no sense. Her desire for promotion, expansion and growth is from the life principle within, and the infinite can bring to pass in divine law and order promotion, expansion, right action, anything you want. She was denying the power of the infinite which is omnipotent all-powerful, and claiming that the supervisor was greater than the infinite. That's absurd, isn't it? She made things equal by affirming. Promotion is mine. Advancement is mine. Achievement is mine in divine law and order, through the power of the infinite. She established the mental equivalent, and according to the mental equivalent is it done unto you. There is no such thing as a free lunch in the universe. You have to pay for everything in the universe. If you want to become a great actress or a great singer, you have to go within yourself. And if you have that talent to sing, you can say, God sings in majestic cadences through me. I sing the song of triumph through the power of the Almighty. You imagine you are singing in a wonderful, magnificent way. That you are stirring up the souls of your listeners, stirring up within them peace, harmony and love. That you are lifting them up in joy and happiness. As you continue to do that, you are establishing the mental equivalent. If you love music, you have to study the scales, the symphonies and all that. You have to get absorbed and engrossed in music. You have to give it attention. You have to practice, practice, practice. You have to establish the mental equivalent of music in your soul so that you can play Rachmaninoff's prelude blindfolded. Why? 
In that way your talent and knowledge are saturated into your subconscious mind. Likewise, if you want to prosper, be successful in life, you have to establish the mental equivalent. Get wisdom, you are told. With all thy getting, get understanding. Wisdom is an awareness of the presence, the power of God within you. You are becoming wise when you know that every thought is creative. Every thought is incipient action. The word was made flesh. The word is a thought expressed. It's made manifest. Every thought is incipient action. Every thought you think is creative. You'd better have a healthy, reverent, wholesome respect for your thought. Otherwise, you're going to get into lots of trouble. What you feel you attract, and what you imagine you become. You can imagine yourself as a bum. You can imagine yourself jumping trains as a hobo. Keep it up and you'll become a hobo. But you can imagine also that you are a tremendous success, that you're a great actor. You can imagine yourself before an audience, making them laugh and cry, realizing the power within you to bring the beauty of Shakespeare to enrich the lives of your listeners. Scientists tell us that everything in the universe sings. Yes, it does. It's a university of densities, frequencies and intensities. Your body is simply waves of light. The whole world is the dance of God. This is modern science today. So, wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom. With all you're getting, get understanding. Wisdom is justified of her children. You have children of the mind just as well as physical children. If I see a beautiful painting that you painted, I realize that you were contemplating the indescribable beauty of the infinite and you brought forth beauty on the canvas. But how could you bring forth beauty on the canvas except you were contemplating beauty? You don't see beauty. It's a quality of the infinite within you. You don't see love, but you can love your child. You can love a dog, too. It's an emanation of goodwill. These are invisible, intangible powers within you. Yes, you do have children of the mind. It may be a book you write which inspires, elevates and dignifies the soul or a sculpture of something beautiful that came out of your mind as a child of your mind. So, we have children of the mind. We also have physical children. How often have you said about a neighbor's boy, he is well-bred. He is well-mannered. Notice what a wonderful student he is. He respects the policemen, his teachers, and his parents. And he does all the chores around the house and is respectful and all that. Don't you say, he must come from a good home. His parents must have inculcated into his cranium wonderful ideas and great truths, because he practices the golden rule, the law of love. You say, the parents have raised him well. Yes, children justify the wisdom in the training of the parents. Your wisdom is reflected in the attitude of the son or the daughter. It also is reflected in your work, your science, your art, your industry, and your writing. And you read some of these letters written to the newspapers, often written in venom, in vitriol. They are quite vindictive. That's based upon self-loathing. In other words, I hate myself. When you hate yourself, you project hatred onto others. But, you see, you can't hate others except you first hate yourself. It's impossible, it's unthinkable, it's inconceivable. Therefore, self-loathing is self-hatred. Then we project that onto others. It comes out in our speech, in our art and everything else. Get wisdom. It's the principal thing. In all thy ways acknowledge her. She will make plain thy paths. Trust her and believe in her, and she will bring it to pass. There is a cosmic law, and that law is within you. You cannot gain or lose anything except through your mind. For the law, as I said previously, is absolutely fair, eminently just. You can't bless your child and curse him or her in the same breath. You can't laugh and cry at the same time. You can't exalt and denounce in the same breath. You can't say, my child infinite intelligence is guiding him or her, and in the same breath say, that child's all mixed up. No, you can't think of two things at the same time. If your mind exalts the divinity in your partner, then the marriage will grow more blessed and more beautiful through the years. Why? You are exalting the divinity within each other. If you dwell on each other's shortcomings, derelictions and peculiarities and abnormalities we all have them, then you are fasting these states on the other person and also on yourself. Then you are eating out of the garbage can. You are scavengers, and you have already divorced because you are divorced from harmony, peace, love, joy, beauty, kindness, goodwill, and understanding. Surely, that's divorce. Divorce takes place in the mind. Then you are in trouble.
The thing to do is exalt the divinity in each other and claim that infinite intelligence leads and guides your partner. Divine right action reigns supreme. Divine love saturates the mind and heart of the other person. Then the marriage or the partnership grows more blessed through the years. You cannot gain or lose anything except through your mind. You can't. You will not admit the loss. Supposing you told me you lost $30,000 through some con man who swindled you. Well, you probably didn't use your five senses. You probably didn't investigate him. You didn't check with an attorney or broker. You didn't investigate his background. You didn't do anything you were supposed to do. You were careless, indifferent, apathetic, listless and lazy. You didn't even use common sense. Then you admit that you lost it. If you admit you lost it, you have. But, you can't lose or gain anything except through the mind. So, I bring you back to knowledge of the laws of mind. Literally speaking, you have lost it. But if you will mentally claim that you are now mentally and spiritually identified with the $30,000, it comes back to you in divine law and divine order. Because whatever you give mental attention to, whatever you are focused on, your subconscious will magnify and multiply exceedingly. You refuse the loss. You do not accept the loss in your mind. Therefore, you cannot lose it. That's the law of mind. You can't gain except through the mind. You can't lose except through the mind. You can't sell a home except you first sell it mentally. You don't buy a pair of shoes except you first bought them mentally. You don't get a job except you first accept it mentally. The body doesn't do anything. Your finger doesn't write a check. It's the mind acting on your finger that writes the check. This is what I teach people. This woman lost $30,000. I'm constantly on my guard against negative thinking. I cast it out of my mind whenever it enters in. I have faith in the infinite power and presence that always works for good. My faith is in the goodness and guidance of the infinite. I open my mind and heart to the influx of the divine spirit. I discover an ever-increasing sense of power, wisdom and understanding. I am mentally and emotionally identified with $30,000 and I know that I cannot lose anything except I accept the loss in my mind, which I positively, definitely and absolutely refuse to accept. I know the way my subconscious works. It magnifies what I deposit in it. Therefore, my money comes back to me, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It came back to her, multiplied and magnified. It is God in action. In a nutshell it's the set of the sails and not the gales that determines the way you go. It is your inner thought, feeling and imagery. In other words, it is your mental attitude operating within you rather than the winds of negative thoughts and the waves of fear from without that makes the difference between promotion and success and failure and loss. Whatever you impress on your subconscious or believe, your subconscious mind will bring it to pass as form, function, experience and event. Whatever you really believe with your conscious mind, your subconscious will dramatize that and execute it, whether it is good or bad. A great law of mind is this. Whatever you attach to I am you become. For example, if you say, I'm no good. I'm a flop. I'm a failure. I'm getting old. I'm no use anymore. Whatever you attach to I am you become. Therefore, you should say, I am strong. I am powerful. I am loving. I am harmonious. I am kind. I am inspired. I'm illumined. I'm immensely wealthy. And I am doing what I love to do divinely happy and divinely prospered. Justice is of the mind. You must become acquainted with the mental and spiritual laws. Then you are in a position to command justice, which means to make things even, to balance the imbalances. Justice means just treatment. Justice is conformity to truth based on righteousness right thought, right feeling, right action based on the golden rule, or the law of love. It means to balance the imbalances and establish equilibrium. If you want to prosper, be successful in life, you have to establish the mental equivalent. Get wisdom, you are told. With all thy getting, get understanding. Wisdom is an awareness of the presence, the power of God within you. You are becoming wise when you know that every thought is creative, every thought is incipient action. Chapter 9. The Cure for Hurt Feelings. Some time ago I had a letter from a man who stated that he couldn't understand why everybody around him annoyed him. I asked him to come and see me, and in talking with him I discovered that he was constantly rubbing others the wrong way. He did not like himself and was full of self-condemnation. He spoke in a very tense, irritable tone. His acerbity of speech grated on one's nerves. 
he thought meanly of himself and was highly critical of others. I explained to him that while his unhappy experiences seemed to be with other people, his relationship with them was determined by his thoughts and feelings about himself. I elaborated on the fact that if he despises himself he cannot have goodwill and respect for others. It's impossible, because it is a law of mind that he is always projecting his thoughts and feelings onto his associates and all those around him. That's called projection. He began to realize that as long as he projected feelings of prejudice, ill will and contempt for others, that is exactly what he would get back, because his world is but an echo of his moods and attitudes. I gave him a mental and spiritual formula, which enabled him to overcome his irritation and arrogance. He decided to write consciously the following thoughts in his subconscious mind. Remember, your conscious mind is the pen, and you can write anything you want in your subconscious mind. This is what he wrote. Practice the golden rule from now on, which means that I think, speak, and act towards others as I wish others to think, speak, and act towards me. I walk serenely on my way, and I am free for I give freedom to all. I sincerely wish peace, prosperity and success to all. I am always poised, serene and calm. The peace of the infinite floods my mind and my whole being. Others appreciate and respect me as I appreciate myself. Life is honoring me greatly, for it is provided for me abundantly. The petty things of life no longer irritate me or annoy me. When fear, worry, doubt or criticism by others come to me and knock at my door, faith, goodness, truth and beauty open the door of my mind. There is no one there. The suggestions and statements of others have no power. I know now how to cure hurt feelings. The only power is in my own thought. When I think God's thoughts, God's power is with my thoughts of good. I know the thoughts of others have no power except the power I give them. They have to become my thoughts. Then it becomes a movement of my own thought. He affirmed these truths morning, noon and night, and he committed the whole prayer to memory. He poured into these words life, love and meaning. By osmosis these ideas penetrated the layers of his subconscious mind, and he became a changed man. He said to me, I am learning how to specialize myself out of the law of averages. I am getting along fine. I have received a promotion on my job. I now know the truth of the passage. If I be lifted up in my mind I, will draw all manifestation unto me. He learned the trouble was within himself. He decided to change his thoughts, feelings, and reactions. Anyone can do the same. It takes decision, stick to it iveness, and the keen desire to transform oneself. Begin to realize that infinite intelligence, the guiding principle of the universe, is within you. The infinite healing presence controls all your vital organs and all the processes and functions of your body. You have the capacity to make choices. Use your imagination and all the other powers of God within you. Your mind is actually God's mind. When you consciously, decisively, and constructively use the infinite power within, you become free. Emerson inspires you to enlarge the concept of yourself when he announced this profound truth. What Plato has thought, we may think. What a saint has felt, we may feel. What at any time has befallen any person, we can understand. Who has access to the universal mind is a party to all that is and can be done, for this is the only and sovereign agent. Emerson was America's greatest philosopher, one of the greatest thinkers of all time. He was constantly in tune with the infinite. He urged us to release the infinite possibilities within us. Emerson taught the dignity and grandeur of humankind and pointed out to his listeners that the great appear great to us because we are on our knees, that we attribute greatness to Plato and others because they acted upon what they, themselves, thought and not upon what others thought they should think. Begin to have a lofty, noble and dignified concept of yourself, and the petty things of life will no longer irritate you. If they do, you are emotionally immature. You suffer from infantilism. That's why people say, why don't you be your age? Why don't you grow up? Are your feathers easily ruffled when someone says, get on the ball? You're behind the eight ball in your department. Or do you take in stride and say, well, that's right. I'm going to have a better showing the next time? Everyone is a child of the Most High. The infinite is within you. There is a right way to talk, to walk, to drive a car, to make a cake. There is a right and a wrong way to do everything. To live a full and happy life you must live according to principles. You would not think of building a wheel off-center, or violating the principles of electricity or chemistry. Likewise, when you think, speak, 
act and react from the standpoint of the infinite intelligence within you, you will find that your whole life will be one of joy, happiness, success and peace of mind. Mrs. Rong Wei was jealous and hateful towards the supervisor in her office. Oh, yes, she was suffering from hurt feelings. She had developed ulcers and high blood pressure. Once she became aware of the spiritual principle of forgiveness and goodwill, she realized that she had accumulated many resentful and grudging attitudes and that these negative and obnoxious thoughts were festering in her subconscious mind. She tried to talk with Ms. Supervisor in an effort to straighten matters out, but the woman brushed her off. In a continuing effort to correct the situation, Mrs. Rong Wei reinforced the principles of harmony and goodwill for 10 minutes every morning and night prior to going to work. This is what she did. She affirmed as follows. I surround Ms. Supervisor with harmony, love, peace, joy and goodwill. Now, this is not mumbo jumbo. She knew what she was doing and why she was doing it. These thoughts or ideas sink into the subconscious. There is only one subconscious mind and the other person picks it up. She said, there are harmony, peace and understanding between us. Whenever I think of Ms. Supervisor, I will say, God's love saturates your mind. A few weeks passed, and Mrs. Rong Wei went to San Francisco for a weekend. On boarding the plane, she discovered that the only vacant seat was the one next to Ms. Supervisor. She greeted her cordially and received a cordial and loving response. They had a harmonious and joyous time together in San Francisco. They are now friends and attending my lectures on Sunday mornings. Infinite intelligence set the stage for the solution of this difficulty in ways that Mrs. Rong Wei didn't know. The ways of your subconscious are past finding out. As the heavens are above the earth, so its ways are above your ways. Mrs. Rong Wei's changed thinking had changed everything, including a perfect healing of her ulcers and high blood pressure. She was hurting herself. No other person is responsible for how you think or feel. You are, because you are the only thinker in your universe. Only you are responsible for the way you think about your congressman, your senator, or anybody else. I recall a young woman saying to me one time, Everybody in my office dislikes me. There are several who want me fired. I said to her, Why don't you resign and find another position? She said, What's the use? I've already had three jobs this year. This young lady had a brilliant mind. She was well educated and was an outstanding legal secretary. 90% of her problems were in her personality. Did you know that over 90% of all the problems in the factory, school, business, government and in the home are not technical? They are the inability of people to get along with others. They are rubbing others the wrong way personality conflicts, personality troubles. Over 90% of her problem was in her personality. But the tendency is to blame others. I gave her a spiritual prescription and suggested that she take it regularly morning and night for several months. I told her to pray the following prayer for every man and woman in her office every day before she went to work. This is what she prayed. I send out loving thoughts and feelings of goodwill, happiness and joy to all those in my office. I affirm, claim and believe that my relationship with each one of my co-workers will be harmonious, pleasant and satisfactory. Divine love, harmony, Peace and beauty flow through my thoughts, words and deeds, and I am constantly releasing the imprisoned splendor within me. I am happy, joyous and free, bubbling over with enthusiasm. I rejoice in the goodness of God in the land of the living and in the innate goodness of all people. Now, this is something she reiterated and remained faithful to. When thoughts of anger, criticism or of being hurt came to her, she would pour forth goodwill upon others. Before the end of that year she received a wonderful promotion and was put in complete charge of the entire legal office. For example, a thought comes to you that you would like to wring somebody's neck. Well, what's to prevent you from saying, God's peace fills your soul? Nothing in the world. This is the law of substitution. It takes a little practice. Anybody who wants to do it can do it. How much do you want what you want? Do you want to give up your grudges, your hurt feelings, your resentment? and antagonism and get good digestion and normal blood pressure. You have to give up something. A man who I was interviewing recently said to me, I am all mixed up and tied up. I can't get along with others. I am constantly rubbing them the wrong way. This young man was hypersensitive, jittery, self-centered and crotchety. In spite of all this, he wanted a good relation with his co-workers, to get along with them in every respect. 
I explained to him that his present personality represented the sum total of his habitual thinking, training, indoctrination and emotional atmosphere, plus the sum total of beliefs inculcated upon his mind, but that he could transform himself. I explained that the infinite dwells within him, that all the attributes, potencies, qualities and aspects of the infinite were lodged in his deeper mind. They could be resurrected and expressed in his personal life. I gave him the following prayer for the purpose of transforming his entire personality. You are transformed by renewal of the mind. He affirmed feelingly and lovingly several times a day. God is a great personality, the one life being expressed through me. God is the infinite life principle within me and his presence flows through me now as harmony, joy, peace, love, beauty and power. I am a channel for the divine in the same way that a bulb is a channel for electricity. The wholeness, beauty and perfection of the infinite are constantly being expressed through me. Today I am reborn spiritually. I completely detach myself from my old way of thinking. I bring divine life, love, truth and beauty into my experience. I consciously feel love for everyone. I radiate it. I exude it. Mentally I say to everyone I contact, I see the divine presence in you. I know you see the divine presence in me. I recognize the qualities of the infinite in everyone. I practice this morning, noon and night. It is a living part of me. I am reborn spiritually now, because all day long I practice the presence of the infinite. No matter what I am doing, whether I am walking along the street, shopping, or going about my daily business, whenever my thought wanders away from the infinite, I bring it back to the contemplation of the divine holy presence. I feel noble, dignified and godlike. I walk in a high mood, sensing my oneness with the infinite. His peace fills my soul. As this man made a habit of allowing attributes and qualities of the infinite good to flow through his mind, his whole personality underwent a marvelous change. Because the personality is the sum total of your thinking, your feeling, your beliefs, your conditioning. He became affable, amiable and increased in understanding. He now communicates vibrancy and goodwill wherever he goes. Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And the law is. I am that which I contemplate. I am that which I feel myself to be. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. With your eyes stayed on God there is no evil on your pathway. Divine love goes before you today and every day making straight, glorious and happy your way. A husband and wife were quarreling recently. Both were suffering from hurt pride. Oh, yes, their egos were deflated. The wife was weeping had crying jags, temper tantrums. Both were very angry, glowering at each other. Both accused each other, blaming each other. They had a daughter, age six. She looked at both of them and said, Both of you deserve a good spanking. Both parents laughed. The tension was broken. They had to laugh at themselves. They were silly. The whole episode was ludicrous and irrational. They were enjoying hurt feelings. This psychic trauma robs you of vitality, wholeness, beauty, energy, and you can't afford hurt feelings, because they rob you of everything worthwhile. It's the quickest way in the world to get old and wrinkled, and sick. It's very expensive medicine. It robs you of everything worthwhile. It robs you of vitality, enthusiasm, energy, good discernment, and judgment. It leaves you a mental and physical wreck. There are some people who get a morbid, pseudo-satisfaction out of playing the martyr role. They say, if you love me, you will do thus and so. Some say, I will be dead and gone, and you'll be sorry for the way you treated me. You are giving me a heart attack. You are killing me now. This is emotional blackmail. They are trying to get you to do what they want you to do. Certainly, they are not interested in your welfare. They are selfish. They are possessive. They say, do what I want you to do. They are not the slightest bit interested in your happiness, your peace, or your joy. Do you want all your relatives and associates to think the way you do? To believe the way you do? To act the way you wish them to act? To vote the same way? To go to the same church? If you do, you are emotionally immature. It's called infantilism. You haven't grown up. Give your relatives, your grandfather, your grandmother, everybody give them their freedom. Permit them to believe what they want to believe. If they want to believe in a devil, let them believe in it. Let them have their peculiarities, their abnormalities, eccentricities and unconventional ways. 
There is a wonderful saying, MYOB. That means, mind your own business. They have the right to do what they think is right. You have the right to do what you think is right. You are here to do right, think right, act right and be right. You are here to be a producer. You are here to contribute to the world. What do you produce? It should be harmony, health, peace, joy, abundance, and security. You have no time for criticism, condemnation or self-pity, or criticism of others because you are too busy about your own work. You are bringing forth great things. Your success, prosperity, peace and happiness are not dependent upon what others think, what others do or don't do, what they say or don't say, what they think or don't think, or what they believe or don't believe. The only thing that matters is what you think in your heart. Your heart is your subconscious. As you think and feel, so are you. You are responsible for the way you think. Your relatives aren't. You are responsible for your reactions, your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions. You are the master. You are the king. The suggestions, statements and actions of others have no power to disturb you. You disturb yourself by the movement of your own thought. Therefore, you have the opportunity to curse or bless. If someone calls you a skunk, do you say, wait a minute, am I a skunk? Do I smell like one? Or you can say, nothing you call me can disturb me today. May God's peace fill your soul, and go on about your business. You refuse to give that person power to give you a headache, migraine, or disturb you emotionally, or cause you to be irrational and make a fool out of yourself, which is maybe what the other person wants. You are too smart for that. It is cruel as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire amidst flame. Jealous competition plays havoc with us. A jealous person is childish, and looks that way. Did you ever look at a jealous person man or woman in business, profession, or in the home life? Jealous people in business are interfering with other people's business. Their thoughts are on the other people's actions, when they come home, the prices in the window, how they are conducting their businesses, and all that. They don't seem to have any time for their own business. They are not attending to their own business. They are working for the other people all day long. They get no pay for it. Isn't that a waste of energy, vitality, and enthusiasm? It certainly is. You please others best when you give the best that you have of your talents, your ability, your time, and everything else. Do you think the person of whom you are jealous blocks you? No your thought governs you. Your belief governs you. If you are jealous of another, you feel inferior. You are full of fear. You have a rejection complex. You are a slave to the other person. You are placing the other person on a pedestal and saying, you're way up there and I'm down here. You are demoting yourself, certainly attracting lack and limitation and impoverishing yourself along all lines. It's disastrous. Nobody has power to hurt you. You hurt yourself. It is a movement of your own thought. Your thought is the king. Your thought is creative. Is the other person's thought creative? Is your thought creative? Does your belief about you and God govern you or does the other person's belief govern you? Are you going to be hypnotized, mesmerized, brainwashed, or manipulated by others? Not if you do not let them. You have a mind of your own. You come to your own decisions. There is an infinite intelligence within you, a guide, a counselor something within you that sustains and strengthens you. Some time ago I had a consultation with a member of my congregation. He said he was timid, shy, resentful, and looked upon the world as harsh and cruel. Actually, he was trying to escape from taking his rightful dominion over life. He said people didn't appreciate him and looked down upon him. They criticized him. He was full of hurt feelings. Because of all this, this young man had an inner sense of insecurity and inadequacy. He was down on himself. He said, how can I gain the appreciation of others? I gave him a biblical quotation. Love thy neighbor as thyself. The real meaning of this text is that your neighbor is yourself. The real self of you is the infinite intelligence within you. Speak thou to him for spirit and spirit can meet. I explained to this young man the truth about himself and how to love and appreciate himself more along the following lines. If you despise and deprecate yourself, you can't live up or give esteem, goodwill, and respect to others. For it is a cosmic law of mind that we are constantly projecting our thoughts, feelings and beliefs onto others and what we send out comes back to us. If you are mean and cruel to yourself, others are going to be mean and cruel to you. The self of you is God. 
It's your higher self. It is the supreme intelligence. Surely, you should exalt that and honor it. That's love. That's your neighbor. And love means to be loyal and faithful. Give your recognition, veneration to the supreme intelligence within you, not to any created thing. Then you love God, which is your neighbor, the closest thing. You are a son of the infinite, and all the powers and qualities of the infinite are within you. You must love and honor the indwelling presence. So, love of self is to honor, recognize, exalt, respect and give your allegiance to the living spirit within you, supreme and omnipotent. The supreme intelligence made you, created you, animates and sustains you. It is the life principle within you. This has nothing to do with egoism, or self-aggrandizement. On the contrary, it is a wholesome veneration of the divinity which shapes your ends. The Bible says that your body is a temple of the infinite. That you are here to glorify the infinite. When you honor, respect and love the self of you, you will automatically love, esteem and honor others. Learn to love your true self. Then you will learn to love and respect others. Love, the self of you, which is the I am within you. You are saying I am morning, noon and night. When you say, I am, you are announcing the presence of the living God within you. That's the spirit in you that created you. It's all wise. It knows all and sees all. Surely, you should honor that. That's the real meaning of loving your neighbor as yourself. In a nutshell begin to realize that infinite intelligence, the guiding principle of the universe, is within you. The infinite healing presence controls all your vital organs and all the processes and functions of your body. You have the capacity to make choices. Use your imagination and all the other powers of God within you. Your mind is actually God's mind. When you consciously, decisively, and constructively use the infinite power within, you become free. No other person is responsible for how you think or feel. You are, because you are the only thinker in your universe. Only you are responsible for the way you think about your congressman, your senator, or anybody else. Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And the law is. I am that which I contemplate. I am that which I feel myself to be. With your eyes stayed on God there is no evil on your pathway. Divine love goes before you today and every day making straight, glorious and happy your way. You can't afford hurt feelings, because they rob you of everything worthwhile. It's the quickest way in the world to get old and wrinkled, and sick. It's very expensive medicine. It robs you of everything worthwhile. It robs you of vitality, enthusiasm, energy, good discernment, and judgment. It leaves you a mental and physical wreck. The only thing that matters is what you think in your heart. Your heart is your subconscious. As you think and feel, so are you. You are responsible for the way you think. Your relatives aren't. You are responsible for your reactions, your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions. The suggestions, statements and actions of others have no power to disturb you. You disturb yourself by the movement of your own thought. Therefore, you have the opportunity to curse or bless. Learn to love your true self. Then you will learn to love and respect others. Chapter 10. Handling Difficult People In the islands of Hawaii, you meet people of every ethnic group and of diverse religious beliefs living together harmoniously, peacefully, and enjoying the sunshine of God's love. I visit all these islands many times. The native who drove me from the airport to the Maui Hilton Hotel told me that his antecedents were a mixture of Irish, Portuguese, German, Japanese, and Chinese. He pointed out that the people here have intermarried for generations, but racial problems are unknown. One of the chief reasons some men and women do not get ahead in life is their inability to get along with others. But the trouble really is within themselves. They can't get along with themselves. They are frustrated, they are quarreling inside their own mind. They fail to realize their dreams and aspirations. They project their animosity, their frustration onto others. Now, you tell people how to realize their desires, dreams, and aspirations. Say, God gave you that desire to be grander and greater than you are, for life is progression. Life is an endless evolvement towards the real. The spirit within you is forever saying to you, rise, transcend and grow. The murmurings and whisperings of our heartstrings are always lifeward. Then you say, infinite spirit which gave me this desire reveals the perfect plan for its evolvement in divine law and divine order. Nourish it and sustain it, and the door will open up for you. But unless you know the laws of mind and how to achieve your goals in life, 
you will become frustrated and bottled up inside yourself. Millions of people rub others the wrong way. Often their attitude of pomposity is tactless and offensive. The best way to get along with others is to salute the divinity in the other person and to realize that every man and woman is an epitome and example of the entire human race. The divinity is in every one of us, for all of us are God made manifest. There is only one being. Call no human your celestial father. There is one celestial father, that is God. The term, father, is the life principle, the common progenitor of the father of all. Most religions refer to God as, our father. We are all intimately related. Therefore, to hurt another is to hurt myself. Perhaps in my stupidity I don't know it. Nevertheless, it's absolutely true. If you wish that others will fail, you are thinking of failure. Your thought is creative, and you will fail. Maybe those people believe in prosperity and success, and they prosper like the green bay tree. But you are the dope. You are the one who's suffering. Every person who walks the earth is a son or daughter of the infinite intelligence and presence and power. There is only one power. When we respect and honor the divinity within ourselves, we will automatically reveal, honor and revere the divinity in the other person. Love thy neighbor as thyself. People are confused about that. They say, how can I love that fellow? He beats his wife, he comes home drunk, and he's mean to the children. It has nothing at all to do with it not a thing in the world. The self of you is God the higher self. Love in the Bible is not a sentiment, it's not an emotion. All it means is that you have a healthy, wholesome, reverent respect for the divinity that created you, which started your heartbeat, which grew the hair on your head, which gave you the whole world when you were born. It's all here, you know. And the sunshine was here, and the air. God gave you richly all things to enjoy. Now, if you don't have a reverent, wholesome respect for the divinity, how in the name of heaven can you respect the divinity in anybody else? You can't. But when you honor this divinity that watches over you when you are sound asleep, governs your breathing, heartbeat, circulation of your blood, metabolism, and all phases of your life when you respect that, it answers your prayer, too. Then, when you respect and honor that, you'll automatically respect it in others. If you don't respect it in yourself, you can't honor it in others. That's why a man can't love his wife, his son, his daughter, or anybody except he first loves himself, for the self of him is God. God is the living spirit which created him. Love is to give your allegiance and loyalty to the one power. If you respect the other powers or are giving power to the stars, the sun or the moon, or the weather, or the strawberries, or the fan, or something, then you are giving allegiance to the created thing, not to the creator. In the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, our God is jealous, in the sense that you mustn't know another. The power is one and indivisible. It moves as unity and harmony. There is nothing to oppose it, thwart it, or vitiate it. Therefore, you give recognition, honor, allegiance to the one power. Then you love God in the biblical sense that all things are added to you. Then you don't place another person on the pedestal and say, this person can block my good then you are unjust to yourself. When visiting one of the hotels in Hawaii, I had an interesting conversation with a waiter. He told me that every year an eccentric millionaire from the mainland visited the hotel. This visitor proved to be a miserly type who hated to give a waiter or bellboy a tip. He was churlish, ill-mannered, rude, and just plain ornery. Nothing satisfied him. He was constantly complaining about the food in the service. He snarled at the waiters whenever he was served. This waiter said to me, I realized he was a sick man. A Kahuna native Hawaiian priest says that when people are like that, there is something eating them inside. So I decided to kill him with kindness. This waiter consistently treated this man with courtesy, kindness, respect, silently affirming, God loves him and cares for him. I see God in him, and he sees God in me. He practiced this technique for about a month, at the end of which time this eccentric millionaire for the first time said, Good morning, Tony. How's the weather? You are the best waiter I have ever had. Tony told me, I almost fainted. I expected a growl, and I got a compliment. He gave me $500 as a parting tip. And a word spoken in due season. How good is it? A word is a thought expressed. This waiter's words, thoughts, were addressed to the sole subconscious mind of the cranky, cantankerous guest. 
They gradually melted the ice in his heart. He responded in love and kindness. Tony proved that seeing the presence of God in the other and adhering to that great eternal truth pays fabulous dividends in human relations, spiritually as well as materially. There is an old aphorism containing a profound truth. I had an interesting conversation with a social director in one of the hotels in Maui. She pointed out that occasionally when she says to a guest, it is a wonderful day, the guest says, what's good about it? I hate the weather here. I don't like anything about this place. She added that she knew that particular guest was emotionally disturbed and driven by some irrational emotion. She had studied psychology at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu and remembered that her teacher had pointed out to her that one does not get upset or resentful toward the person who is a hunchback, for example, or who suffers from any other obvious congenital deformity. You may have compassion for the person. Maybe he had suffered a serious accident, or maybe he was born that way. Likewise, one should not be disturbed because some people are emotional hunchbacks and have twisted, disturbed and warped mentalities. One should have compassion for them, understanding their mental and emotional chaotic state. It is easy to overlook and forgive them. This young lady is gracious, charming, affable and amiable. And, apparently, nobody can ruffle her feathers. She has built up a sort of divine immunity, and she fully realizes that no one can hurt her but herself. That is to say, she has freedom, as anybody has, to bless the other person or to resent the other person. She knows very well that the only one able to hurt her is she, herself. That is, the movement of her own thought, which is under her complete control. The suggestions, statements and actions of other people have no power to disturb you. It's the movement of your own thought. You can curse or bless. You can say, God is guiding me now. Peace fills my soul. Or, you can say, he's a scoundrel, or, she's a scoundrel, as the case may be. You generate the anger. You are the boss. You are in control. The other person has no power to disturb you. A young musician who plays a stringed instrument at night to pay his way to the University of Hawaii where he is studying law told me that he had experienced friction with some of his teachers, that his memory had failed him during the oral and written examinations. This young man was tense and resentful. I explained to him that his subconscious mind contained a perfect memory of everything he had read and heard, but that when his conscious mind is tense, the wisdom of the subconscious does not rise to the surface mind. Accordingly, he prayed as follows every night and morning. Infinite intelligence in my subconscious mind reveals to me everything I need to know, and I am divinely guided in my studies. I radiate love and goodwill to my teachers, and I am at peace with them. I pass all examinations in divine order. Now, he is writing that down with his conscious pen in his subconscious mind. And whatever you write down in your subconscious will come to pass in divine order. That's the way you learn to walk, to swim, to dance, to drive a car. You repeated a thought pattern and an act again, and again, and again, and again. After a while you said, it's second nature. What is second nature? Second nature is the response of your subconscious mind to your conscious thinking and acting. Of course, it's automatic. It's compulsive. That's called prayer. Most people don't even know what prayer is. Three weeks went by, and I received a letter from this man saying he had passed a special examination with flying colors, that his relationship with his teachers is now excellent. He succeeded in incorporating the idea of perfect memory for everything he needed to know into his subconscious mind by reiterating the affirmations I gave him. His emanation of love and goodwill was subconscious picked up by his teachers resulting in harmonious, human relationships. There is a crater in Hawaii called Halakala. Once it was a fiery, gaping depression. It is now a cool, cone-studded aftermath of a violent volcano. I was with a group of people, some of whom were from such widely diverse localities as Denver, Pittsburgh, Stockholm, Australia, and New Zealand. I sat next to an Australian doctor and his wife in the limousine. He told me that volcanic eruptions causing havoc similar to the results of the volcanic activity at which we were looking had taken place in his own life because he was in the habit of judging people too harshly. The gist of his conversation was that he used to boil over with rage at what columnists wrote in the newspaper. He wrote poisonous, vindictive and vitriolic letters to members of the parliament, the heads of the various unions, and others. This internal seething and turmoil brought on two physical eruptions in two severe cardiac attacks, 
plus one volcanic eruption in the form of a mild stroke. He recovered from these attacks and realized that he had brought them on himself. While in the hospital a nurse gave him the 23rd and 91st Psalms to read, saying, Doctor, this is wonderful medicine. He began to dwell upon the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life because I dwell in the house of God forever. And I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy power, and thy staff, they comfort me. He began to dwell upon the inner meaning of the 91st Psalm. I dwell in the secret place. I abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. He covers me with His feathers, and under His wing shall ye rest. It's impossible to dwell upon these great eternal truths that have stood the test of time for thousands of years and not get a peaceful mind. You see, people down through the ages of all religious beliefs have used these psalms in cases of shipwreck, fire, emergencies, so-called incurable diseases, and all manner of trouble. And these psalms have protected them. These are written in the universal, subjective mind called in Hinduism the Akashic Record. Therefore, as you use these psalms, even though you don't understand the inner meaning of them far more wonderful if you did but even though you don't, and you use any of these psalms, you are tapping the survival technique, the experiences, and the healings of others down through the ages, and you get a response, and marvelous results follow. So, he discovered there was such a thing as spiritual medicine. It goes in through your eyes and your ears. So, he began to dwell upon these psalms. Gradually their meaning sank into his soul. He pointed out that he had long since learned to adjust to people, realizing they are all conditioned differently and that this is a world of imperfect human beings striving towards perfection. This doctor had learned to be true, as he said, to the God-self within him and to respect the divinity in the other. Shakespeare said, To thine own self be true. Then it follows, as the night the day, thou canst not be false to any man. This doctor had learned that to understand all is to forgive all. He is still intolerant to false ideas, but not people. He remains true to the truths of God and eternal principles. A man with whom I went swimming in the ocean adjacent to the beautiful, majestic Maui Hilton Hotel said to me, I am here to get away from it all. He began to criticize everybody in his organization, as well as the government. He even seemed to have a grudge against the infinite. In fact, he told me he felt he would get along better if God would just let him alone. He asked me, what can I do to have better human relations and get along with these ugly, nasty people? I suggested to him that research has demonstrated that much of the difficulty many people have in human relations is that they don't look within themselves for the cause. That's where it is in most instances. The first step would be to get along with his own difficult self. I pointed out to him that much of his trouble with his employees and associates came from himself primarily and that these other people might be called secondary causes. He admitted he was full of hidden rage and hostility, was deeply frustrated in his ambitions and plans in life. He began to see, however, that his suppressed rage kindled the latent hostility or anger in those around him, and he suffered from their reactions, which he, himself, had engendered. He discovered that what he termed the animosity and hostility of his associates and employees reflected his own hostility and frustration to a great extent. I gave him a spiritual prescription which he was to follow regularly and systematically. I know there is a law of cause and effect, and the mood which I generate is returned tome in the reactions of people to me and in conditions and events. I realize my inner turmoil and anger set off ugliness and anger in men, women and animals. I know that no matter what I experience it must have an affinity in my mind conscious or unconscious for as I think and feel, so am I, and so do I express, experience and behave. I give myself this spiritual medicine many times a day. I think, speak and act from the divine center within me. I radiate love, peace and goodwill to all those around me and to all people everywhere. This infinite being lies stretched in smiling repose within me. Peace is the power at the heart of God, and his river of peace floods my mind, my heart and my whole being. I am one with the infinite peace of God. My mind is a part of the infinite mind. What's true of the infinite is true of me. I realize and know that no person, place or thing in the whole world has the power to upset, annoy or disturb me without my mental consent. 
My thought is creative, and I consciously and knowingly reject all negative thoughts and suggestions, affirming that the infinite intelligence is my guide, my counselor, my governor, and that this wisdom watches over me. I know infinite intelligence is my real employer, and I am working for this presence and power that animates and sustains me. The real self of me is God, which is the living spirit within me. It cannot be hurt, vitiated or thwarted. I realize I am the one who has hurt myself the most by my self-criticism, self-condemnation, and self-denigration. I send kindness, love and joy to all people, and I know goodness, truth and beauty follow me all the days of my life, for I live in the house of the infinite forever. Three weeks transpired, and he wrote me, saying that practicing this phase of mental and spiritual laws had replaced his inner, chaotic, seething cauldron state of mind with serenity, tranquility, and a sense of imperturbability. Peace, you are told, is the power at the heart of God. The infinite, as Emerson says, lies stretched in smiling repose. The finite alone has wrought and suffered. The finite is your own conscious mind where all the trouble is, but in the depths of yourself is absolute bliss and absolute harmony. A submarine commander will tell you if he goes down far enough in the ocean there is absolute bliss, absolute harmony. There is no noise or confusion of any kind. The same is true of the depths of ourselves. I had an interesting conversation with a Japanese businessman who philosophized along these lines. I have been in business 50 years and have traveled extensively. I have learned that people are basically good and honest. I take people as they come. They are all different. They have had different training and conditioning. They have different customs and religious beliefs. They are the result of their training, education, habitual thinking. I know complaining about these people and getting angry with customers won't change them. I don't let them disturb me. I refuse to let anybody get under my skin. I bless them all and I walk on. He showed me a list of 10 customers who owed him considerable sums of money, who had ignored his several bills. He said, I have been praying for each one morning and night, realizing the infinite presence and power is prospering them in all ways and that infinite intelligence guides, directs, and multiplies their good. I pray that each pays his bill gladly. That they are honest, sincere, and blessed in all their ways. I started a month ago doing this. Eight of them have paid, apologizing for the delay. There are two to go, but I know they will pay, too. He discovered that when he changed his mental attitude toward the delinquent customers, they changed also. Treat people with respect. Honor and salute the divinity in the other person. It's within everyone. Maybe they are cutthroats or murderers. Nevertheless, the divine presence is there. They may not be using it, it may be dormant, it may be asleep. But, nevertheless, it's there. It's there in your husband. It's there in your wife, son, or daughter, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law. The divinity is there. It shapes our ends, rough hue it how we will. So, you wanted that. Give respect to that. Radiate love and goodwill to all. It costs nothing. It pays fabulous dividends. Realize that nobody who is well adjusted acts in a contentious, hostile, antagonistic, and surly manner. The maladjusted people are always attracting maladjusted people. Inharmonious people are always attracting inharmonious associates. Of course, they are. Like attracts like. Birds of a feather flock together. Know there is a mental conflict somewhere when people are antagonistic and contentious. The kahuna says there is something eating them inside. There is a jumping bean. They jump. The worm is inside the bean. And when it is heated, it jumps. Likewise, there is a jumping bean within many people. They are prejudiced. Prejudice is prejudgment. They have judged before they know anything at all about it. Some people are prejudiced against Jews, Catholics and Protestants, politicians, certain political movements, and so forth. They know nothing at all about it. It's prejudgment. You ask them. What do these people believe in? They don't know. They are prejudging. They are prejudiced. That's a sickness of the mind. There is a psychic pain somewhere. God is the true self of you. It can't be hurt, thwarted or vitiated in any way. If you find difficult people in your life, surrender them to the infinite. Declare your freedom. Say, I surrender them to the infinite and this infinite presence and power takes them out of my life in divine law and divine order through divine love. And this same presence and power takes me out of their life in divine law and divine order through divine love. And it will. 
it will be as if the earth swallowed them up. You will find yourself in green pastures and still waters. For he leadeth me beside the green pastures, he restoreth my soul. There is this marvelous presence and power within all of us. We meet people everywhere in the office, the home, the factory, or when we travel. We meet people all over the world. We must learn to get along with them. There are over 6 million people in the world today, and the population is increasing every day. Hermits, cave dwellers, recluses can't escape contact with other human beings. They have a mind, too. There is one mind common to all individuals. You can't run away from yourself. So they carry their mind with them wherever they go. And all of us are immersed in the mass mind. It's called the law of averages. It is no use to run off to Boston saying to yourself, there are nicer people in Boston. Remember, you carry your mind and your disposition with you, and if you have a nasty and ugly disposition, you'll attract ugly people there, for like attracts like. You'll attract them wherever you go. Stop running away from yourself. Meet the problem where you are. The problem is within us. There is a Chinese story of the boy who ran away from home. In China the custom was, when a boy ran away from home he would always go to the village schoolmaster in the place to which he ran, for the village schoolmaster was supposed to have studied the I Ching, the great book of wisdom. He was supposed to be wise and could answer the boy's problems. So the boy made it a point to go to the village schoolmaster at all times whenever he was in trouble. The first question the schoolmaster asked the boy when he went to see him was, Son, tell me. What kind of people were in the city or town where you live? The little boy said, Well, master, they were cruel and nasty. When I was sick they didn't even visit. The schoolmaster said, They are the same here, son. Keep on going. So the boy ran away to another town. Then he went into the village schoolmaster in that town. The village schoolmaster asked, What kind of people were in the town you left? Well, he said, they beat me, were cruel to me. When I was in the hospital they didn't even visit me. And my parents were very cruel, they beat me mercilessly. The schoolmaster said, they are the same here, son. Keep on going. The next town he went into the village schoolmaster and told the same story. The village schoolmaster said, they're nasty here, too. There are ugly people here just like they were in the town you came from. Keep on going, son, and you'll find the right town. So, on the way he began to ask Do, the name for God in China. He asked Do for guidance, to put the words into his mouth. Then the next town he went into, of course, he went to the village schoolmaster. He said to the village schoolmaster, What kind of people are in this town? He asked him the same question. He said, Son, tell me. What kind of people were in the town where you lived? Well, he said, they were kind, they were gracious, they were lovely to me. When I was sick they visited me, brought me soup. And they were kind. They gave me money when I left. They were wonderful, wonderful people. He said, they're the same here, son. This is the town for you. Stay here. What does it mean? It means we meet ourselves wherever we go. For the world we see is the world we are. We're always looking out through the contents of our own mentality. Down through the ages we've had people promoting utopias of all kinds such as socialism, communism, communes, islands in the sun, where all of us would live in peace and harmony, and where love would reign supreme, we'd share the wealth, and all that sort of tamiro, which is all it is. We've had these utopias down through the ages. You know very well what happened to them, as well as I do. If we practiced the golden rule and the law of love, we wouldn't need any utopias or gardens of Eden or things of that nature. It would be heaven on earth. We've had the golden rule in all the Bibles of the world. We've also had love thy neighbor as thyself. We've had all these things. And if we practice the golden rule, as you would that people should do to you, do so to them in like manner. What you would not have them do to you, do not do to them. You treat the other, as you would like to be treated. Of course, if people practiced that there would be no occasion for war, sickness, disease. There would be no occasion for armies, navies, soldiers, or anything. It would be heaven on earth. It's as simple as that. You can quote the golden rule, but if you practiced it, then we wouldn't need any of these things. We wouldn't need any armed forces or nuclear weapons or anything. These truths have been taught for thousands of years. So has the great law of love. We've had the golden rule for 10,000 years. But, you see, 
People act according to their conditioning, according to their fears, hates and prejudices. If they are governed by ignorance, this produces strife and suffering. When Buddha in his meditation asked the God Presence for the cause of all the suffering, misery and crime in India, the answer was ignorance. So, ignorance is the only sin, and all the suffering, misery in the world is the consequence. Of course, that's true. It's not true because Buddha said it. It's true because it is true. Ignorance is the only sin, and all the suffering is the consequence. Teach people the unqualified capacity in God to go within and claim guidance, inspiration, wealth, prosperity, success, true place, and you've given them the key. The infinite intelligence responds to them. It opens up new doors for them. They do not want to hurt anybody in the world, because they have found the source within themselves they can find wealth, true place and expression, healing, and everything else under the sun so, ignorance is the only sin. Knowledge of the laws of mind and the way of the spirit will produce health, happiness and peace, abundance and security. When you say, infinite intelligence leads and guides me, it responds to you. When you say, divine right action is mine, it responds. You say, infinite intelligence reveals my hidden talents to me, it opens up a new door for me where I express myself at the highest level and exercise my faculties at the highest degree, it opens up that door for you. I hold before you an open door, and no one can shut it. The nature of infinite intelligence is responsiveness. Now you are tapping your deeper mind. I have given you the key. You don't want what others have. You don't want their cows, their oxen, their donkeys, or anything that is theirs. Because you can go to the source and claim the same thing. Whatever you claim and feel to be true, the spirit will honor, validate and execute. This does away with all jealousy, and all envy, and everything unlike it. A sales representative for a pharmaceutical company went to see a doctor friend. He was representing a company that had brought forth a new drug for a particular disease. The doctor was a friend of his, played golf with him, played cards with him. The doctor was very insulting, criticized him and his presentation, and criticized the pharmaceutical company. The salesman was aghast, disturbed. The nurse said, don't pay any attention to him this morning. His only son died on the operating table last night and everything they tried failed. So, the salesman said, I understand. Notice how the irritation, the inner disturbance drops away when we hear of the sorrow, grief, and tragedy that another person suffers. The heart melted a little bit and love took over. So, he understood. To understand all is to forgive all. A few years ago I read about a woman who called the police and said her husband threatened her with a gun. Of course, the police came, but no gun was found in the house. The newspapers took it up. The woman was very angry and they had a violent quarrel. Under that irrational emotion she called the police. She said that he threatened to shoot her, to kill her. The publicity in the local press ruined the man professionally. She was very sorry, she regretted it, but the damage had been done. This is what irrational emotion does. Negative emotions compel you to act them out. When you want to be nice, you're ugly. When you want to succeed, you fail. Emotions kill. Emotions cure. He that is slow to wrath overcometh much, because you realize there is a power within you that gives you peace. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. So, she regretted having damaged her husband's reputation. She was a victim of an irrational force called anger. An emotion compels us to act it out. Many people are driven by passions, angers and hates and are victims of their own irrational emotions. The answer is to ask yourself, is this infinite intelligence and divine love thinking, speaking, and acting through me? If not, desist and tune in with the infinite, realizing infinite intelligence is my guide, my counselor, my troubleshooter. His peace fills my soul. This presence is the infinite peace and absolute harmony and I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. This is the impregnable fortress. It is my unassailable citadel. Here I dwell beyond time and space. Here I am in tune with the infinite which lies stretched in smiling repose, and I know that to be alone in the silence is to be alone with God. No one can lay siege to me there. This divine contemplation supplants all negative thoughts and emotions and heals you. It's called supplanting. You can supplant it. When the room is dark, 
you turn on the light for darkness is the absence of light. It is impossible to know all the complexities of other lives. We don't know about their early training, their indoctrination, their religious taboos and strictures, their conditioning which caused them to be ugly or full of hostility. Sometimes false religious beliefs and hatred toward other religious beliefs have conditioned the minds of millions. They fight over their religious beliefs in many parts of the world today, as you know. But religion should give you joy, should give you peace, should give you happiness. For in him there is fullness of joy, in him there is no darkness at all. Heretofore you have asked for nothing. Now ask that your joy might be full. These things have I said unto you that my joy might remain in you and your joy might be full. And the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and happiness. These are the powers that are within you. Therefore, you have this wonderful opportunity to radiate love, peace, and goodwill to all humankind. It costs you nothing, it pays fabulous dividends. Sometimes, when you go into the forest area, you see the trees are straight as a die, and one particular tree is narrowed and twisted. Maybe there was a fence there when it was a sapling, or a boulder. Maybe people twisted it, sat upon it. But, anyhow, the cause is gone, but the effect remains. Likewise, we have twisted, distorted, warped mentalities. Perhaps all this started in their childhood. In parts of the world, Protestants are taught to hate Catholics, Catholics are taught to hate Protestants. It's like the Irishman who went over to Northern Ireland and spent some months there. When he came back, they asked him how he found things. Well, he said, the Catholic hates the Protestant. Little boys of seven are throwing stones at soldiers. Little girls of seven and eight are also learning to throw grenades at Protestants, and the Protestants against the Catholics, and the Catholics against the Protestants. It's frightening. I wish they were all heathens so they might live together like Christians. Well, of course, there's some humor in that. But he's pointing out the state of mind, the conditioning. We have Muslims, Hindus, and people of various religious beliefs fighting each other. We've had religious wars down through the ages. But, true religion gives you joy. The true religionist means that bound by a God of love. So, when a God of love is enthroned in your mind, it dominates all other thoughts, feelings, beliefs, actions and reactions. That's the ideal religion. Then the fruits of that spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and happiness. Because you must demonstrate what you believe in. You must show forth what your religious belief is. It must appear in your body, your home, your pocketbook, and your relationship with people, your art, your science, and your industry. Where is it? You demonstrate what you believe in. You wouldn't resent or be hostile toward a paraplegic or a person with a congenital deformity. People with twisted, distorted mentalities often attack those who have been kindest to them. The reason being their inner peace, serenity and tranquility and poise throws their seething unrest into bold relief. Therefore they unconsciously desires to drag others down to their disturbed mental state. They would deny that. Nevertheless, it's absolutely true. Misery loves company. They think, why should they be so happy and peaceful when I'm so miserable? So they like to drag you down to their own level. Never become enmeshed in the negative mental vibrations of others. Don't let them drag you down. If you do, you are contaminated by that negative, destructive mood. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and the measure ye meet shall be measured to you again. All of us can avoid mental pain, anxiety and tension by ceasing to pass judgment in our minds. Marcus Aurelius said 2000 years ago, where there is no opinion there is no suffering. Where there is no judgment there is no pain. So, you have no judgment. You have no pain. If I am wearing a white sock and a black sock and you happen to see it and you are disturbed. Who is disturbed? You are. I don't even know I have them on. You are disturbing yourself. You are the cause of your own suffering. If you get all upset about what some politician, some president or some senator, said or did and did not do, who is suffering? You are. Of course, you know you are the cause of your own suffering. According to your judgment or decision, which is arrived at in your own mind. Therefore, you are the cause of it. Let your opinion be still. If the cucumber is bitter, don't eat it. If there are briars or brambles on the road, avoid them. If there is no judgment, there is no suffering.
There is nothing hidden that is not revealed, nothing covered that is not made known. If you get all excited and agitated about what the columnist said in the morning newspaper, well, he has freedom to write that. You have freedom to write a constructive letter negating the whole thing and telling all the reasons you disagree. But you are emotionally immature. At least, you should be spiritually mature and realize that as the writer is writing from his own standpoint and you have perfect freedom to disagree. You also have freedom to write a constructive letter to your senator, or congressman, or board member, as the case may be, telling what you think and what you believe, and why criminals shouldn't be allowed to roam the earth because of some technicality, and why rapists should not be let loose under some technicality, either. You can do all these things in a constructive way. But if you get all exercised and agitated about it, you are looking for trouble. And who's troubled? You are. Who's hurt? You are. Don't puncture the ego of other people. There is no point in deflating them. Maybe their ideas are foolish, but all you do is generate hostility. You could say, your idea is interesting. It should be explored. This is my idea. It may not be better, but I look at it this way. You are respecting the others, and they will in all probability show you some respect because you are showing respect. We are all sons and daughters of the Most High. We're children of eternity. So, you don't ride roughshod over people and say, I believe it. Therefore, you should believe it. This is my opinion. You must take it. No, you show respect for all of them. You just bring forth your idea, but you don't ridicule or puncture the ego of others or deflate them. All that does is cause resentment and antagonism. It doesn't do either you or the others any good. Respect them. They are acting according to the level of their mentality. A husband used to come home and criticize his wife, find fault with her hair, the food, and the way she was bringing up the children. She began to cry copiously, and the tears brought satisfaction to him, because you can be sadistic with tears. Not just with your tears, but you can also be sadistic with your words. You can get into a crying jag and say, you are killing me. You are giving me a heart attack. You are the cause of all my suffering. What you are doing is practicing emotional blackmail. You are trying to get the other person to do what you want him or her to do. That moment you are selfish. You are tyrannical in your attitude of mind. Don't kneel to that kind of thing. The man who criticized his wife and made her cry got what he wanted. I told the wife, you'd better wake up. Tell your husband that he no longer can disturb you by his remarks. I'm onto your game. Your criticism can no longer disturb me, because of the movement of my own thought. I go back to the infinite, which is my guide and my counselor. I'm going to sing a hymn. I'm going to vacuum the floor or take a walk. I'm going to tune in on the eternal. One, who lives in the hearts of all people. It wasn't what he said that caused her distress. It was her thought about it. It was the movement of her own thought. The suggestions, statements and actions of others have no power to disturb you. It's the movement of your own thought always. There are those who enjoy being hurt by others. There is the woman in London who was beaten up by her husband. He'd come home drunk and beat her up. Finally, he beat her up so much that he was arrested. The judge said to the woman, who was in the court, have you anything to say before we pronounce sentence on your husband? Oh, she said, your honor. I love him so. He said, Madam, you don't know what love is. England doesn't love him. He gets three years in jail. Love doesn't punish. Love doesn't do anything unloving. The poor woman hated herself and she wanted someone to punish her. And he used to punish her. That's wrong. Love doesn't do anything unloving. Love frees, love gives. Love is the spirit of God. Children of love are peace, harmony, joy, goodwill kindness, honesty and justice. These are children of love. If you love a woman or a man, you love to see that person happy, joyous and free. You don't do anything unloving. You don't pass cutting remarks. You don't criticize. You certainly don't beat your loved one or things of that nature. Love is of God, and God is love. When you love another, you see the presence of God there. You say, what's true of God is true of that person. That would be called love. Then there are those who like to needle others. They go out of their way to make cutting remarks or embarrass them. Why do they do this? You must realize they are frustrated, they have an inferiority complex, they feel inadequate. They get some sort of a morbid satisfaction out of hurting you. But you can't be hurt. You say, God dwells within me. 
walks and talks in me. God is my guide. Then you are immunized, God intoxicated. They can't hurt you. The suggestions of others have no power to create the things they suggest. It's the life principle. It started your heartbeat. It animates and sustains you. It takes care of you when you are sound asleep. When you walk down the street, it's spirit walking down the street. When you lift a chair, it is spirit lifting the chair. Your body doesn't do anything. Your body moves as it is moved upon. Your body acts as acted upon. God is the progenitor, the creative power. There is only one creative power, not two, or three, or a thousand. You don't make another person a cause, when it's your father, which is the living spirit. Does another spark your unredeemed aggressiveness? Does someone hurt your pride? Someone said to Will Rogers, you know, one of my antecedents came over on the Mayflower. So, Will Rogers said, well, my antecedents met them at the boat. You are proud of your spiritual heritage, of the divinity that shapes your ends, for God is the father of all. Therefore, you are proud of your spiritual lineage, because children come through you but not by you. All the powers of God are within you. Look at all those who served humanity, whether it's Lincoln or Churchill, Edison or Marconi, Clara Barton or Helen Keller no matter who it was, we honored them all. We build monuments to them. We speak about them, because they contributed to the blessings of humanity. They gave much to people. You can radiate love, peace and goodwill to all people. Require nothing from people. Expect nothing from people. Your expectation is from God. You will never be disappointed. What you expect is what you get. Expect the riches of the infinite. You expect guidance, harmony, health, peace, joy, abundance, and security. You expect marvelous and wonderful things, for all things are ready if the mind were so. So, you are living in the mood of expectancy. You live in the joyous expectancy of the best. Inevitably, the best must come to you, because you get what you expect. Release them all unto the infinite. Release everybody. Wish for them health, happiness, peace, and all the blessings of heaven. Realize also that infinite intelligence guides and directs you in all your ways. It's a lamp unto your feet always. It's a light upon your path. Divine law and order govern your life. Divine peace fills your soul. If you are dealing with difficult people, you find you have trouble with them, say. I release them all mention their names unto the infinite which created them. This God presence takes them out of my life and takes me out of their life in divine order through divine love. And all its ways are pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. The Bible says, whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. To believe is to accept something as true. Great numbers of people, however, believe that which is absolutely false. Consequently, they suffer to the extent of their belief. To believe is to accept something as true, to live in the state of being it, to be alive to something. Believe in the goodness of God in the land of the living. Believe in the guidance of the infinite. Believe in the riches of the infinite. Believe in a God of love watching over you, sustaining and strengthening you, and according to your belief is it done unto you. If, for example, you believe that Los Angeles is in Arizona and you address your letter accordingly, it will go astray. Remember, that to accept something is to accept it as true in your mind. Believe in the goodness of God in the land of the living and all your ways will be ways of pleasantness and all your paths will be paths of peace. In a nutshell the best way to get along with others is to salute the divinity in the other person and to realize that every man and woman is an epitome and example of the entire human race. When you honor this divinity that watches over you when you are sound asleep, governs your breathing, heartbeat, circulation of your blood, metabolism, and all phases of your life when you respect that, it answers your prayer, too. Then, when you respect and honor that, you'll automatically respect it in others. If you don't respect it in yourself, you can't honor it in others. Peace is the power at the heart of God. The infinite lies stretched in smiling repose. The finite alone has wrought and suffered. The finite is your own conscious mind where all the trouble is, but in the depths of yourself is absolute bliss and absolute harmony. Radiate love and goodwill to all. It costs nothing. It pays fabulous dividends. Realize that nobody acts in a contentious, hostile, antagonistic and surly manner who is well-adjusted. Ignorance is the only sin. 
Knowledge of the laws of mind and the way of the spirit will produce health, happiness and peace, abundance and security. True religion gives you joy. The true religionist means that bound by a god of love. So, when a god of love is enthroned in your mind, it dominates all other thoughts, feelings, beliefs, actions and reactions. That's the ideal religion. Then the fruits of that spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and happiness. If you are dealing with difficult people, you find you have trouble with them, say. I release them all mention their names unto the infinite which created them. This God presence takes them out of my life and takes me out of their life in divine order through divine love. Believe in the goodness of God in the land of the living. Believe in the guidance of the infinite. Believe in the riches of the infinite. Believe in a God of love watching over you, sustaining and strengthening you. And according to your belief is it done unto you. Chapter 11. Jonathan Livingston Seagull. A Spiritual Interpretation. Some years ago a book about a seagull, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, by Richard Bach became one of the best-selling books of its time. The author is a pilot and speaks in aeronautical language. He is the nephew of the famous Dr. Marcus Bach, a professor at the Institute of Religious Science. This is a delightful book, less than 100 pages. It was later made into a movie. A bird has two wings, symbolic of thought and feeling. These are divine agencies that move, fashion, and mold destiny. Your thought and feeling control your entire future. Every thought felt as true is embodied in the subconscious mind and comes forth as experiences, conditions and events in your life. That's the law of mind. It's immutable, changeless, timeless and ageless. It is just as true a law of science. All of us have the wings of imagination and faith, which enables us to soar aloft above the problem and contemplate the way things ought to be. We can contemplate the divine solution, happy ending, realizing and knowing that the answer is already within, that supreme intelligence which lives in all people. The Bible says, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. When there is a monsoon, typhoon, hurricane, or a storm of any kind, the eagle soars aloft above the storm directly into the sun and remains poised and calm. And when the storm abates, it returns to the earth. The eagle is a symbol of the United States chosen for that particular reason to remind all of us that we in time of trouble, confusion, sickness, or whatever it might be, turn to the God within, contemplating harmony, health, peace, joy and inspiration, the bread that comes down from heaven. This is why they said, Lord, evermore give us bread. The bread of peace, the bread of harmony, the bread of joy, the bread of wisdom, the bread of strength, the bread of inspiration. We are fed by these things, it's not just bread on the table. But, you'll never be hungry for wisdom, truth and beauty if you contemplate the God presence within, calling upon it to guide you and direct you. Turn to the God presence within. Claim, inspiration, right action, beauty, love, peace, abundance. It responds to you. Call upon me, I will answer you. The book is taken out of his vivid imagination. Imagination is the workshop of God. It is really a fantasy. It's a story about the seagull, written, as I said, in aeronautical language. It's a fable, a story, like Aesop's fables, Little Red Riding Hood, Robinson Crusoe, Santa Claus, Aladdin's Lamp, and the story of the fairy godmother. These things are allegories. Allegories are parables as they are called in the Bible have been used in all cultures from the earliest times to present truths to the people. There is an old legend that explains this. Truth went about the town complexly naked you've heard the expression, the naked truth. The people ignored him and would not let him into their home's minds. One day, truth came upon his brother, Allegory. Now Allegory was dressed in fancy and beautiful clothes. Truth cried to him. Brother, things are so bad. Nobody welcomes more or even wants to acknowledge me. It must be because I am so old. Allegory responded. It is not because you are old. I, too am old, but the older I get, the better people like me. I can help you. He dressed truth in some of his elegant clothes and sent him on his way. Sure enough, from that time on, he was welcomed and invited into everybody's home. So in ancient times truths were given in the form of allegories to the peoples of all nations. They were used to dramatize the births and deaths of kings and princes, to teach the wisdom of prophets and seers and the miracles of God. 
When the eagle is hungry, it flies up. It flies off to a place where there is food. Its environment does not limit it. This is to remind us that we are transcendental beings, not limited by our environment or external conditions. In prayer therapy you are taught to lift your consciousness above the problem. If you rise high enough in thought, the problem will be solved. Withdraw your attention from the problem. Concentrate gently on the infinite presence and power, supreme intelligence, which knows only the answer. As you do this, then the answer will come. You are rising in a high state of consciousness. The ever-living one, the all-wise one, the all-knowing one, the self-renewing one, the self-perpetuating one is within you. And as you contemplate these great truths within you, you will receive the necessary elevation of the mind and the heart, by realizing the infinite knows only the answer. Before they call I will answer, while they are yet speaking I will hear. He brings all these things out in the book. Call upon me and I will answer you, meaning the nature of infinite intelligence is responsiveness. It responds to you. It's impersonal. It's no respecter of persons. There are many people who solve the most difficult problems by affirming feelingly, knowingly, and lovingly. God's love fills my soul. God is guiding me now, revealing to me everything I need to know at all times everywhere. Gradually, the realization of divine love saturates the whole being. In the I Ching, the famous book of wisdom you read, take care of the cow. Well, of course, you don't take that literally. The cow is an ancient word for the subconscious mind. Fill it with life-giving patterns. Eradicate the negative patterns because, as you fill your mind with the truths of God, you crowd out of your mind everything that is unlike God. So, the I Ching speaks of your ancestry, the fairy godfather. Great truths, you see, are conveyed in these stories, such as the story of William Tell. Many people take that literally. It's only a myth, but it conveys a great truth. The story of Santa Claus appeals to children. It's difficult for children to perceive abstract truths. They want something tangible, something they can touch and feel, like the man with the big beard, Santa Claus, bringing all the gifts. Children can understand that. And, don't rob them of that, because later on they'll discover, of course, that Santa Claus is the presence of God within them. They must feel and touch something. The Bible says that the husband is head of the wife. In the Bible, the wife means your subconscious mind, and the husband is your conscious mind. That's true psychologically, but it's not true from an objective standpoint dealing with men and women. The wife, it says, is subject to the man in all things. Your subconscious is controlled by your conscious mind. Your subconscious is amenable to suggestion. And whatever directions you give to your subconscious mind, you are like a captain on board a ship. You are giving orders to the crew in the engine room. And whatever orders you give, the crew in the engine room follows. They don't talk back to the captain. Your conscious mind is the captain. What orders are you giving your subconscious mind? The Garden of Eden is an allegory. Your conscious mind is the gardener, and your subconscious is the garden. Now, what are you planting in the garden? It's the nature of the apple seed to become an apple tree. Seeds grow after their kind. If you think of harmony, health, peace, beauty, love, right action, inspiration and guidance, and busy your mind with these things, you'll have a wonderful garden full of orchids. What you sow in your subconscious, so also you will reap. If you wish for health, you must give your attention, devotion, and loyalty to the healing presence within, realizing it created you, made you, and continues to sustain you, it, knows all the processes and functions of your body. Therefore, as you claim that this miraculous healing power is healing, restoring, vitalizing, cleansing, quickening, transforming your whole being, as you keep it up and do whatever is objectively necessary also, you go to a doctor and bless him, realizing he or she is God's creature and is guided by God and that all healing is spiritual anyhow. Jonathan Livingston Seagull did not want to be one of the flock, he didn't want to be just one of the herd. The law of averages is the law of the herd. He wanted to fly higher than other birds. And in one of his first flights, he stalled and fell. Jonathan says for a seagull to stall in the air is a disgrace. It's a great dishonor. But Jonathan Livingston Seagull was no ordinary bird. He was different. He wanted to fly, but he wanted to fly high. He didn't want just to follow boats, eat fish, and live like the others. No he realized there was something grander and greater that he could accomplish. 
he stalled and fell. Well, failures are stepping stones for your climb to success. When you went to school you got a rubber at the end of your pencil. Everyone knew that you would make mistakes. But through your mistakes you grew, advanced, and moved forward in the light. So, these so-called failures are not failures. They are stepping stones to your triumph. So, he is unashamed, we are told. He stretches his wings, and he decides to try, try, and try again. More than anything else, Jonathan Livingston Siegel loved to fly. One success, remember, wipes out all the failures. They say that Edison had 999 failures and then the last experiment was a success. So, one success wipes out all the failures in your life. But were these failures? No, there were 999 ways that he didn't have to experiment again. They were stepping stones to his triumph. They were comrades in arms on the journey. So, if you love mathematics, it will reveal its secrets to you. If you love electricity like Edison did, it will reveal its secrets to you, too. If you love music you will excel and become a great musician. So, Jonathan loved to fly. Yes, you too can fly to fly to higher dimensions of your mind. And as you begin to love and give your attention, devotion and loyalty to the divine presence within, you, too, will soar above the problem. And you will not be one of the flock or one of the herd. You will not be living according to the law of averages. But you'll come out from among them, and you'll be separate. Jonathan didn't know why, for instance, when he flew at altitudes less than half his wing span above the water, he could stay in the air longer with less effort. His glides ended, not with the usual feet down splash into the sea, but with a long, flat wake as he touched the surface. Now, his mother said, why is it so hard for you to be like the rest of the flock? In other words, why don't you be like all the other birds? Why do you want to be different? Why can't you leave the low flying to the pelicans and the albatross? Why don't you eat? You are bone and feathers. He said, I don't mind being bone and feathers, mom. I just want to know what I can do in the air and what I can't. That's all. I just want to know. What he really wants is to put his head above the crowd. And when you put your head above the crowd, people throw stones at you. If you are way down there in the mud and mire of life, nobody pays any attention to you. But they do take pot shots at you when you put your head far above the crowd. So, imagination separates one person from another. It's a beacon light in a world of darkness. I am talking about disciplined, controlled imagination. And the world whips you, Emerson says, when you are a non-conformist. Who wants to conform? All the great achievers of the world, whether they were scientists, artists, inventors, no matter who they were, all those in the religious field were nonconformists. These are the people who contributed to humanity, whether it's Pasteur, Newton, Carver, or Einstein. Einstein didn't conform to the mechanistic belief of the world. On the contrary, he knew that this world was a world of densities, frequencies, and intensities. It was alive, a dynamic universe. And the greatest experience in the world, Einstein said, was a mystical experience, our communion with God. George Washington Carver was a slave who carried his master's books, but he had a vision. You go where your vision is. A vision is what you are giving attention to, what you are looking at in your mind, where you want to go. He wanted to go someplace. He wanted to be educated. He wanted to become a scientist and he became a great scientist and the entire world paid honor to him. He said that he asked God, why did you make Carver? Well, God responded, George Carver, you're not ready for that answer yet. He said, well, then, Lord, why did you make the universe? Well, God responded, George, I don't think you're ready for that yet. Well, then, he said, why did you make the peanut? Now, George, God said, you're getting down to your size. So, Carver developed 500 compounds from the lowly peanut. So, you, too, can rise above the crowd. Emerson said that God walked and talked in our thoughts. That the key to accomplishment is in our thoughts. He, too, was prevented from talking at Harvard. He spoke there once, and I think it was about 30 years later before he was invited back to speak because he shocked them all by telling them the truth of being. Marconi decided to explore the mysterious sound waves that we do not hear but are all around us. Edison decided to light up the world. Do you know what his relatives did to Marconi? They put him in a straight jacket for six weeks. They said he was insane, that he was psychotic. 
Nevertheless, he developed the technique that enabled UP to conquer wireless communication. Edison was sent home from school. They said he was stupid and dumb, couldn't learn. Other boys were laughing at him. He was disturbing the class. But his mother, and Edison, himself, didn't think so. He decided to light up the world, and he did. He brought forth thousands of inventions. He said one time he never invented anything. The ideas came to him from the depths of his own mind, and he nourished them and sustained them. And the way opened up. Jonathan Livingston Seagull persisted in his dream, but his father said to him, Winter isn't far away. Boats will be few, and the surface fish will be swimming deep. He said, Son, if you must study, then study food, how to get it. This flying business is all very well, but you can't eat the glide. Don't you forget that the reason you fly is to eat. Jonathan nodded obediently. For the next few days he tried to behave like the other gulls the way his parents wanted him to act, screeching and fighting, diving at old scraps of fish and bread. But he couldn't make it work. It's all so silly, he said, so pointless. It's nonsense hungry gulls chasing one another. He said, I could be spending all the time learning to fly. There's so much to learn. Just as Jonathan refused to give up his dream, you must not give up yours. You are here to rise, transcend and grow. You are not here to conform. A teacher has some boys and girls in the class. One of them might be an Einstein, one of them might be a Carver, and another one might be an Madame Curie, or a Joan of Arc, or a Lincoln. Why should they conform? Conformity is not the way to life. We are all different. We are all unique. You don't have the same whorls on your fingers, same toe prints, same glandular system, same ideas, same dreams or aspirations. You are entirely different from any other person in the world. You are unique, for God never repeats himself. Why on earth should you conform? A lot of people go to church. They want to be seen there. They say, this is the thing to do. I said to one man, do you believe in that? He said, not a word of it, but it's the place to be seen. Of course, that's hypocrisy. Of course, all that does is give you a complex. That creates a complex. Don't believe anything that your conscious and subconscious do not agree with. Furthermore, don't believe a lie. Don't believe anything that insults your intelligence. Put it on the shelf and say, I don't quite understand that now, but the spirit of truth in me reveals to me all truth. Then the answer will come to you. Jonathan attempted many ways to improve his flying capacity. Finally he concluded that the answer was speed. And in a week's practice, Jonathan learned more about speed than the fastest gull alive. He also lost control at higher speeds. Flying to 1,000 feet. Yes, he was able to do that, too. He was about to go 70 miles an hour. The key, he thought at last, must be to hold the wings still at high speed. To flap up to 50 and then hold the wings still. It took tremendous strength, but it worked. In 10 seconds he had blurred through 90 miles an hour. Now, he is gaining all the time. Jonathan had set a world speed record for seagulls. Note that Jonathan never ceased trying. And as you keep on trying, if you persevere to the end, you shall succeed. The astronauts who tried to get to the moon had many setbacks, but their vision was on the moon. And, of course, they had to go where their vision was. So, these failures were, as I said, stepping stones to their triumph. The joy is in overcoming. That's the way you sharpen your mental and spiritual tools. That's the way you get ahead in life. So, if you have some setbacks, do not look upon them as failures not at all. Now Jonathan had some trouble in the air. His wings were ragged bars of lead, but the weight of failure was even heavier on his back. He wished feebly that the wake could be just enough to drag him gently down to the bottom and end it all. Well, there are people who, when they get setbacks try to flee from them. Faced with failure or disappointment, they want to end it all. They despair. They think, what's the use? I'm at the end of my rope. They may even contemplate suicide. Sure. They may be at the bottom, but now there's only one way to go, and that's to rise. Turn your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help. The hills, of course, represent the God presence within, supreme intelligence, absolute power. People with a suicidal complex are looking for a solution. They want freedom, that's all they want. But if you jump off a bridge, you solve no problem. You are earthbound. You are in a daze. 
You don't solve any problem by running away from it. You carry your mind with you. The problem is in your mind, and that's where you solve it. You are not your body. You are a transcendental being. You are not limited by your body. So, Jonathan said, if I were meant to fly at speed, I'd have a falcon's short wings. I'd live on mice instead of fish. Father was right. I must forget this foolishness. I must fly home to the flock and be content, just a poor, limited seagull. Have you ever said that to yourself? I must be one of the herd. I must be one of the family. I mustn't be different. I must comb my hair the same way? No, he thought. I am done with the way I was. I am done with everything I've learned. I am a seagull like every other seagull, and I will fly like one. So, he climbed painfully to 100 feet, flapped his wings. He felt better, for his decision to be just another one of the flock. There would be no ties now to the force that had driven him to learn, the hollow voice inside. There is always that voice in you saying to you, rise. Come on up higher. I have need of you. For life is always seeking expression through you. If someone is drunk in the gutter, there is a voice telling that person to rise, transcend, grow, come on up higher. It's the God presence seeking expression. And Jonathan said that the voice exclaimed, Seagulls never fly in the dark. Seagulls never fly in the dark, he said to himself. If you were meant to fly in the dark, you'd have the eyes of an owl. You'd have charts for brains. You'd have a falcon's short wings. They're in the night, 100 feet in the air. Jonathan Livingston Seagull blinked. His resolutions vanished. The Bible says, I will lead the blind in a way they know not. I will lead them on paths they have not known. Millions are blind to the fact that your thought is creative. Every thought is incipient action. What you feel you attract. What you imagine you become. Any idea emotionalized, good or bad, that you impregnate your subconscious with comes to pass as form, function, experience and event. There is supreme intelligence within you, which we call God. It responds to your thought. Millions do not know that. They reject it. It's up in the sky somewhere. So, the seagull thought. A falcon has short wings. That's the answer. What a fool I've been. All I need is a tiny, little wing. All I need is to fold most of my wings and fly with just the tip's short wings. The wind was a monster 70 miles per hour, 90, 120 and faster still. Oh, yes. He's getting faster all the time. His vows of a moment ago that is, listening to his parents were forgotten, swept away in that great, swift wind. Wind, in the Bible, means the spirit within. Yet, he felt guiltless breaking the promises he had made himself. Such promises are only for the gulls that accept the ordinary. One who has touched excellence in his learning has no need of that kind of promise. A bad promise is better broken than kept. Don't ever keep a bad promise. Some preachers preach that a marriage is a promise you must always keep. They frown upon divorce. This is not God's will. If your marriage is hopeless, and if the two of you are always fighting and quarreling, it is better to break up the lie than to live the lie. There are some cases that are absolutely hopeless, where they are irreconcilable. It takes two to make a go of marriage. It's 100%, not 50-50. When you see God in each other, and salute the divinity in each other, and exalt the God presence, and rejoice in the happiness, peace, and harmony of each other, then, of course, the marriage grows more blessed through the years. But when two are fighting and quarreling and resenting each other, then they are already divorced. I have talked to people who have been divorced 50 years, yet they are still living together. They are divorced from harmony, beauty, love, peace, kindness, and goodwill all these things. They are divorced completely from their marriage vows. It is better to break that promise. Don't compromise with evil. Don't compromise with anything negative. Insist on divine right action. Insist on the best, and the best will come to you. Always take the best, and the best remains. Never accept the second best. So, one who has touched excellence has no need of these bad promises, for there is nothing too good to be true, nothing too wonderful to last, for the love, the light, and the glory of the infinite were the same yesterday, today and forever. There is nothing too good to be true. If you say, it's too good to be true, you are saying that. You are making a law for yourself, and to you it doesn't happen. It happens to the person down the street. If you say, it can't last, what can't last? 
Love is ageless and timeless. So is peace, abundance, security, and inspiration. The truths of God are timeless, and ageless, and changeless, and eternal. If you say, it can't last, it will not last. It's a law you are making to yourself. For you it can't last. So, Jonathan finally had reached terminal velocity. The wind was a solid, beating wall of sound against which he could move no faster. He is going at 214 miles an hour. That's enormous speed for a bird. He said, Jonathan Livingston Seagull flew directly through the center of the flock, ticking off 212 miles an hour, eyes closed. The gull of fortune smiled upon him, and it was wonderful. This, Jonathan said, is a great breakthrough. It was a breakthrough. The wind caused a single moment in the history of the flock. At that moment a new age opened for Jonathan Gull. A single wing-tipped feather, he found, moved a fraction of an inch, giving him a smooth, sweeping curve at tremendous speed. Now he is entering a higher dimension of mind. He becomes a spiritual paratrooper. When you pray, you become a spiritual paratrooper, because you fly above the problem or difficulty to the haven of rest, to the God presence within, the secret place where you walk and talk with God. And there you contemplate the way it is in God in heaven, meaning the spirit within you. Heaven is the infinite intelligence within you, the infinite mind and infinite power in which you live, and move, and have your being. You are in heaven now. That's where you live. You are a spirit now. Therefore, as you contemplate the all-wise one, boundless love, infinite intelligence, absolute harmony, and infinite wisdom, realizing that the answer is there and you contemplate the divine solution, the happy ending, knowing in your heart and soul the almighty power will respond to you, then the day will break for you and all the shadows will flee away. That's why you become a spiritual paratrooper. You never dwell on the problem. You detach your mind from the problem altogether and contemplate the solution, the way things ought to be, the wholeness, the beauty, and the perfection of the infinite. Never once do you dwell upon the problem. Only on the answer, the solution, the way out. Jonathan had flown the first aerobatics of any seagull on earth, and he went through what he called the great breakthrough. And he said, all the other seagulls will be wild with joy now because of my great breakthrough. How much more there is now to living. Instead of our drab, slogging forth and back to the fishing boats, there is reason to live. There is reason to life. We can lift ourselves out of ignorance. We can find ourselves as creatures of excellence, intelligence, and skill. We can be free. We can learn to fly. Yes, the meaning of that is that there is a power within you, a mystic power. It was known down through the ages. Buddha, Zoroaster, they all discovered it. A mystic power, the divine presence within you that can lift you up from a sick bed, from poverty, from confusion, from want, from frustration, and lead you to the high road of happiness, peace of mind, and freedom. Right now. That power is there. And you can use it. You don't have to be like the herd. Look around you. There are a lot of people using this power. There are 16 million people, we are told, in the United States of America thinking constructively today, using divine power whether you call it science of mind, unity, or divine science. When you name it, you cannot find it. When you find it, you cannot name it. Throw your labels out the window. You have a mind. How do you use it? Use that power within you constructively. Some call it God, Allah, Brahma, health and happiness. Use it negatively, ignorantly, stupidly, maliciously, viciously, and people call it the devil, hell, liar in wait, adversity, misery, suffering, pains, aches, insanity, and so forth. That's all there is to it. So, Jonathan thought the gulls would be delighted, because he had his breakthrough. Do you think they were? They were not. The senior bird was waiting for this fellow. He said, stand to center. That meant only great shame or great honor for Jonathan Livingston. He said, stand to center, for honor was the way the gulls' foremost leaders were marked. Of course, he saw the flock this morning. They saw the breakthrough. But, he said, I want no honors. I have no wish to be a leader. I want only to share what I have found, show those horizons out ahead that we all can fly. We don't have to live this way, following fishing boats, eating dead fish and things of that nature. Jonathan Livingston Seagull, said the elder, stand to center for shame in the sight of your fellow gulls. It felt like being hit with a board. His knees went weak, and they sagged. 
centered for shame. Impossible, he said. The breakthrough. They can't understand. They're wrong. For his reckless irresponsibility, the solemn voice intoned, violating the dignity and tradition of the Gull family. To be centered for shame meant that he would be cast out of the Gull society, banished to a solitary life on the far cliffs. One day, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, you shall learn that irresponsibility does not pay. Life is the unknown and the ignoble except that we are put into this world to eat to stay alive as long as we possibly can. A seagull never speaks back to the council flock, but Jonathan's voice rose. Irresponsibility, my brothers. He cried. Who is more responsible than a gull who finds and follows a meaning, a higher purpose for life? For a thousand years we have scrambled after fish heads, but now we have a reason to live, to learn, to discover, to be free. Give me a chance. Let me show you about the new life, what I have found. The flock might as well have been stone. The brother it has broken, the gulls intoned together, and with one accord they solemnly closed their ears and turned their backs upon him. You are familiar with that, aren't you? I talk to people who have taken up unity or science of the mind, or something of that nature, who are studying the laws of mind within them, impersonal, no respecter of persons. In him there is no Greek, no Jew, no bond or free no male or female, neither now nor then, only the ever-flowing reality going on forever. The God presence within you knows nothing about creeds, Christianity, Islam or Judaism, or any ism. Some people are so sure that they have the only answer, the only creed. People often bring me letters written by parents to children who have embraced a different approach to God than that of their families. One mother wrote to her daughter, The lake of fire is waiting for you, you left the faith of your fathers. You'll be cursed. Hell is waiting for you. Come back to the faith. Of course, there's no love there. You have to explain to them. Now, you mustn't resent your mother or your father. They are writing from the standpoint of ignorance and fear, superstition. They have been brainwashed and mesmerized. To understand all is to forgive all. Therefore, you know why they wrote that way. They are not writing from the standpoint of love, peace or harmony. Because if you love someone, you don't want them to burn for all eternity, you must have a frightful state of mind to wish that any person in this world would burn forever and ever. You really would be sick. So, if someone has found peace and harmony, wouldn't you be glad if your daughter or son had found peace, harmony and love in their life, who found something that gave them strength, power, and a new zest for living? You should be glad. Can God learn something within you? Can God grow? Can God expand? And where is God? God is within you. Can you learn something? Isn't all wisdom in you now? It is, of course. And you are told in the Bible. They have eyes and they see not. They have ears and they hear not. Their heart is wax gross. Lest at any time they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and become converted and I should heal them. You can only hear what you are ready to hear. You can only hear what you want to hear. And there are a lot of people whose minds are closed. They don't want to hear anything. The mind is no good except it's like a parachute that opens up. You must be opened up. You must open up to receive the truth. So, there are a lot of people who say, Oh, I eat, and sleep, get a can of beer, look at TV, and that's life to them. That's not living. That's not life at all. Life is a gift to you. You are here to express life. You are here to release the imprisoned splendor that is within. How could you earn a living? Life is a gift to you. You are here to make it a better place to live. Maybe you have a talent of music, or beauty, or art, or something like that. Maybe you can become a great doctor and save lives. The joy is in giving. The joy is in serving. The joy is in making this a better place to live in. So Jonathan spent the rest of his days alone. He flew to the far cliffs where he was banished. His one sorrow was not solitude. It was that other gulls refused to believe the glory of the flights that awaited them. They refused to open their eyes and ears. Have you proceeded to tell your relatives about the power of mind and things of that nature? They rend and tear you, don't they? Don't bother with it. Don't cast your pearls before swine. That's biblical language. In other words, don't try and convert people when their mind is closed. They only resent you. When they are ready to hear, they will hear. God waits for everybody. Don't be in any hurry. For God is love. Whether you are a beggar, thief, cutthroat, murderer, 
or a holy person, all people shall awaken to see the transcendent glory, which God is. For God is love, and God can't lose himself. And your life is God's life. God is life. Therefore, what's the hurry? Surely, truth is offered to all. I have taught this in my radio programs, my sermons and in my books. Everyone is free to listen. Some turn it off and say, that's frightful. Some lovely people write me letters and say the day is coming, and you're going to burn in a lake of fire for telling people the Savior is within them, and that each of us is our own Savior, and that each of us molds and fashions our own destiny, and each of us promotes ourselves. I'll continue to say it, because it's absolutely true. Jonathan no longer needs fishing boats and stale bread for survival. He found something else, and he would like the others to come along. When electricity came forth, gas, which preceded it, tried to stifle it. The life of gas was threatened, too, by that power which preceded it. New ideas, you see, meet with resistance. When the automobile came out, they had riots in Dublin, because the horse and buggy drivers thought they were being put out of business. And so on, through the entire gamut of every great discovery of life you find these things. People fight the truth. They say they have been listening to this thing for 2,000 years. People go to sing the same old hymns. They say the old religion is good enough for me. What is it? What's good enough for you? Nothing is too good to be true. All the truths of God are within you. What's true of God is true of you. You are here to reproduce all the qualities and attributes of God. How wonderful you are. That's what you are here for. You are here to glorify God and enjoy Him forever and that's what you are here for. Not to eat, and sleep, and look at TV. Jonathan Siegel discovered that boredom, fear and anger are the reason that a gull's life is so short. Discover the powers that are within you. Life is a gift. God is the giver and the gift, and all the gifts are on the Christmas tree within you. What good is any teaching? What good is any book? What good is the human race? What good is any institution on the face of the earth except it becomes an instrument through which the eternal melody of God is played? For the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And, therefore, these are the fruits that you bring forth. That's what the author is trying to say in the gull story. After a while, two gulls appeared, streaking down in flawless formation. And Jonathan said, who are you? Suffer the little ones to come unto me, you know. For in their innocence they are like the angels of heaven. The little ones are the inspiration, guidance, creative ideas, and answers that come to you. But many people brush them aside. These are the little ones that come unto you. And you should entertain them, honor them, for they are the voice of the divine the promptings, urges, volitions, warnings, guidance, inspiration, creative ideas that well up from the subliminal depths. Yes, they are rejected, but they should be accepted. When you reject one of these little ones, twas better that a millstone was put around your neck and you were dropped into the ocean. Why? Because when you reject the inspiration, the guidance, the promptings, the murmurings, and the whisperings of the God presence, then you are drowned in grief and frustration. A lot of people brush these things aside yet all the time God's presence is knocking at your door saying, let me in. Why don't you open the door of your heart to the soft thread of the unseen guest? It opens with an inner lash. It's your own heart. And that voice says to you, Look, I'll wipe away all tears. I'll heal you. I'll inspire you, set you on the high road. I'll do wonderful things for you, for my name is wonderful. I'm the mighty God. I'm your everlasting Father. I'm the Counselor. I'm the Prince of Peace. What do people do to that? It's despised and rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hide our faces from him. That's the God presence within you. So, the visitors, yes, these are angels that come to you intuitive knowledge, urges, inspirations, and promptings. Entertain them. They say, I came to take you home. He said, I have no home. I've been kicked out of the Gull Society. I'm over here on the cliff. But they said, yes, you have a home. A home, of course, is with God the secret place of the Most High where you abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So, he said, this is heaven. Heaven is your mind at peace. Heaven is that invisible intelligence in which you live, and move, and have your being. When I see you lift a chair, I see the unseen power. That's God. 
Thought is God, too, because your thoughts are creative. The Word was God. So, Jonathan realized, of course, that heaven was within himself. The most important thing in living was to reach out and touch perfection. And that which they most loved to do was to fly. In the next dimension, he says, we are practicing advanced aeronautics. Well, of course, that's what you do in the next dimension. You move from octave to octave, from glory to glory, from strength to strength, for there is no end to the glory, which is within us. Learn to play Rachmaninoff's prelude here, and then you'll be better able to play it in the next dimension. You can't be less tomorrow than you are today. Life goes not backwards nor tarries with yesterday. Life is progression, an endless development toward the real. Never in eternity could you exhaust the glory and the beauties that are within you. That's how wonderful you are. For the infinite is within you. We choose our next world through what we learn in this world. True. What are you learning here? Learn everything you can about the treasures of heaven. The truths of God and the great eternal truth are all you can take with you. So, people think they can take the bank account with them. You can't. But you can take your knowledge. The treasurers of heaven are in your own mind where moth and rust will not consume, where thieves cannot break through and steal. Take your knowledge of God, take divine love with you, faith and confidence, and you'll meet loved ones, of course. Because, when you came into this world you were met by loving hands. When you go into the next dimension, your loved ones meet you, too. What's true on one plane is true on all planes. That's what he is pointing out here. He is a great mystic, this Jonathan Livingston Seagull. You ought to read the book. Yes, the loved ones are all around you. He said, you didn't have to go through a thousand lives to reach this one. No, because God is within you. And this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today, not tomorrow because you are dealing with the timeless, spaceless being within you. There is no sense of duration in your mind. You go to sleep every night. That's where you go when people in their ignorance call you dead. You are in the fourth dimension. You go there every night, and there is nothing to be afraid of. Sometimes at the hospital, a man is about to pass on, and he says, John is here, Mary is here. They are talking to him. He is not drugged, either. He is quite rational and conducting a vigorous conversation with me. And a few days later they discover that John had passed on in India or something, and he was right there talking to his father. Loved ones know you are coming. The elder gull smiled in the moonlight. He said, you are learning, Jonathan. Yes, Jonathan replied. What happens from here? Where are we going? There is no such place as heaven. No, Jonathan, there is no such place. Heaven is not a place. It's not a time. Heaven is being perfect. He was silent for a moment. You are a very fast flyer, he said. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You are in heaven now. Heaven is your own mind at peace, the spirit within you. Father, which art in heaven? The Father, of course, is the spirit, the Father of all, the common progenitor. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not, here nor there. The kingdom of God is within you. The elder said, any number is a limit. Perfection doesn't have any limit. Perfect speed by some is being there now in the next dimension. That's whatever you think of. If you think of a loved one, you'll meet the person. If you want to be in Belgium, France, or South Africa, you're there instantaneously. Because your mind is omnipresent. You are no longer limited by a three-dimensional body. You are a spirit now. When did you cease to become a spirit? So, he points out without warning. Chong that's one of the visitors in the next dimension. The great gull vanishes and appears at the water edge 50 feet away, all in the flicker of a second. Then he vanished again and stood in the same millisecond. Here Jonathan is telling you about the person who dematerializes and rematerializes a person who is fully developed, initiated, who is illumined and inspired, and one with the self-originating spirit. Such a person can go to the next dimension, live there for a while, go to any planet, and the spirit within, the all-wise, creating all things, will project a body consonant with the dignity, the atmospheric pressure, and so forth of that particular planet. Uri Geller, the famous paranormalist who dematerialized a watch and rematerialized it again and whom the greatest scientists in the world, have studied, shows you that mind does all these things. That's what he was talking about. So, you are omnipresent. Your loved ones are all around you. 
He says you can go to any place at any time you wish to go now in the next dimension. I've gone everywhere, he said, on every whim I can think of. Those who put aside travel for the sake of perfection go anywhere instantly. Yes, because in the next dimension, you see, you travel through thought only, wherever we want to be. You communicate through your thought. And, of course, spirit is omnipresent. Believe you have it now, and you shall receive it. The reality, of course, is the thought image in your mind. So, Chong spoke slowly to Jonathan. To fly as fast as thought to anywhere that is. You must begin by knowing that you have already arrived. In other words, believe you have it now. Stop seeing yourself, he said, as trapped inside a limited body that has a 42-inch wingspan. No, you are everywhere at once across space and time. You are omnipresent. You can be sent outside of your body now. Your body is on a couch. You can go there consciously if you know how to do it. You have visual, auditory and tactical capacity. And who are you? Are you dead or something? No, you are John Jones. And you have a body. But it's a fourth dimensional body, rarefied, and attenuated. And it can go through closed doors, collapse time and space. That's what Jonathan Livingston Seagull is talking about. He said, I am a perfect, unlimited gull. That's what you are. You are a son of the living God, heir to all of God's riches. You were spirit. When did you cease to become a spirit? You were always a spirit. You are a spirit now. A billion years from now, or a trillion years, you will be spirit somewhere. For that's who you are. Spirit was never born, it will never die. When they could see again, Chong was gone. Chong had the capacity to collapse time and space, reappear and disappear just like many swamis in places in Asia have been reported to have that capacity down through the ages. We are going through a breakthrough here just like Jonathan did. The gulls see farthest who flies the highest, he said. Jonathan stayed and worked with the new birds. In other words, the birds coming into the next dimension, Jonathan helped them along. And initiated. That's what happens to you when you go to the next dimension. Loved ones, nurses, doctors initiate you, too. There are people loving and kind there. They minister to you initiate you into your new dimensions, and, of course, you learn there like you do here. The child's life that was snuffed out at the womb still grows and expands in the next dimension. And, of course, when you pass on, you meet that child, but it is fully grown, because there are teachers there, and love is universal. And that child is a grace note in the grand symphony of all creation. There is no death. A child who is snuffed out in the womb still lives as a grace note in that grand symphony of all creation. We are all kept together by that symphony of love. And Jesus, Moses, Elijah, Buddha, Muhammad these are the great conductors that conduct us all into that symphony of love, the universal orchestra, celestial one. So, God is eternal now, he points out here. Another gull, Fletcher, was still young and they want to make him a god. Well, he said, I'm not any different than any other gull. We are all unlimited idea in the mind of the infinite gull, which means that you are a son of the living God right now. You are a daughter of the infinite, a child of eternity. So, Jonathan said, don't be harsh, Fletcher. In casting you out the other gulls have only hurt themselves, and one day they will know this. And one day they will see what you see. Forgive them. To forgive all, you see, is to understand all. That's what he is pointing out. Therefore, love is simply seeing the divinity in the others. Not, as he says, it isn't loving the evil, it isn't loving a man because he beats his wife, and it isn't loving him because he's cruel to his children. It is honoring the divinity in that person, the spirit in you talking to the spirit in the other, claiming what's true of the spirit is true of you, is true of him, and is true of you, too. Because God dwells within you. Therefore, spirit with spirit shall meet, salute the divinity in the other and say, I see God in him and he sees God in me. And the love, the light, and the glory of God flow through him. Then you are identifying. That's called love. Each of us is, in truth, an idea of the great gull an unlimited idea, freedom. Yes, we call it being the son of the living God. Your body, he said, is simply a thought from beginning to end. Break the chains of your thought and you break the chains of your body, too. Your whole body, from wingtip to wingtip, he said, is nothing more than your thought. God thinks and worlds appear. 
God had to think of humans for humans to appear. Whatever God thinks is forever. And that's all your body is, and you'll have bodies to infinity. Many people unconsciously leave their bodies at night and see events before they happen. They are able to describe things that are happening in a room. And all these wonderful things are powers that are within you. Job said. If a man dies, shall he live again? The question has been asked millions of times, for God is life. There is no end to our glory. The body is a beginning. Your body is an end. You'll have bodies to infinity. You'll always have a body. You can't even conceive of yourself without a body. That'll be a fourth dimensional body, a vehicle for expression of life. That is the golden key that opens the palace of eternity. We mustn't think of death as an ending. We think of it as a beginning, a new birthday in God. So, that's what you do. You rejoice in a new birthday in God if your loved one has passed on. There are celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. We are born in the image of the earthly. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So, there is no end to our glory. There is no end to you, for life, itself, is growth. Never in eternity could you exhaust the wonders and the glories that are within you. You don't love a negative. You don't love hatred and evil. Of course, you don't. You have to practice and see the real gull, the good, in every one. In other words, see God in your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, and your neighbor. God dwells in everybody, and to identify with that God presence and call it forth, God's peace, God's love, God's harmony, God's joy, that's loving. You are not loving evil. That's absurd. When love comes in, everything unlike love goes out. Look with understanding. Find out what you already know, and you'll see the way to fly, now and forevermore. In a nutshell in prayer therapy you are to lift your consciousness above the problem. If you rise high enough in thought, the problem will be solved. Withdraw your attention from the problem, concentrate gently on the infinite presence and power, supreme intelligence, which knows only the answer. As you do this, then the answer will come. You are rising in a high state of consciousness. We are all different. We are all unique. You don't have the same whorls on your fingers, same toe prints, same glandular system, same ideas, same dreams or aspirations. You are entirely different from any other person in the world. You are unique, for God never repeats himself. Why on earth should you conform? Millions are blind to the fact that your thought is creative. Every thought is incipient action. What you feel you attract. What you imagine you become. Any idea emotionalized, good or bad, that you impregnate your subconscious with comes to pass as form, function, experience and event. There is a supreme intelligence within you which we call God. It responds to your thought. Don't compromise with anything negative. Insist on divine right action. Insist on the best, and the best will come to you. Always take the best, and the best remains. Never accept the second best. So, one who has touched excellence has no need of these bad promises, for there is nothing too good to be true, nothing too wonderful to last, for the love, the light, and the glory of the infinite were the same yesterday, today and forever. There is a power within you, a mystic power. It was known down through the ages. Buddha, Zoroaster, they all discovered it. A mystic power, the divine presence within you that can lift you up from a sick bed, from poverty, from confusion, from want, from frustration, and lead you to the high road of happiness, peace of mind, and freedom. Right now. That power is there. And you can use it. You don't have to be like the herd. You have a mind. Use that power within you constructively. Men call it God, Allah, Brahma, health and happiness. Use it negatively, ignorantly, stupidly, maliciously, viciously, and people call it the devil, hell, liar in wait, adversity, misery, suffering, pains, aches, insanity, and so forth. That's all there is to it. We mustn't think of death as an ending. We think of it as a beginning, a new birthday in God. So, that's what you do. You rejoice in a new birthday in God if your loved one has passed on. There are celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. We are born in the image of the earthly. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So, there is no end to our glory. There is no end to you, for life, itself, is growth.
Chapter 12. Religion and Woman's Bondage. Why a special chapter in a book about self-confidence and self-esteem devoted to women? Unfortunately, there are still many people who consider that women are inferior to men and indeed are ordained by the Bible to take a secondary place. Believing this, many women have accepted a lower place in life than they should and have low self-esteem. This has become even more of an issue as more and more churches and synagogues have ordained women as clergy. A woman came to me very upset. She firmly believed that she was called to be a minister, but was told by her father that the Bible was opposed to women ministers. He quoted the following verses from the New Testament. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also set the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. This is what the father quoted to the daughter. This literal interpretation of the Bible has kept women in bondage for thousands of years. Her father was taking the Bible literally. But the Bible is a psychological and spiritual drama, taking place in the consciousness of its readers. The Bible is not dealing with doctrinal questions and theological concepts, which are merely created by theologians out of their own mentality. The word, church, in the Bible does not refer to a building or religious sect or denomination. The word, church, means ecclesia, or a calling out or drawing forth of wisdom, truth, and beauty from your subjective depths. It could be called an aggregation of spiritual ideas in your own mentality. To enter the church, or ecclesia, of God, one must adopt a new mental attitude and realize that God is spirit and that you are one with that spirit. Many people have read the Bible literally, forgetting the spirit are the real meaning. There are different interpretations of the scriptures, together with their promulgation of certain creeds and dogmas, which is the main reason for the countless sectarian groups or churches of today. The true church is within yourself and is not made of creeds, rituals, forms, or ceremonies. Nor is it contained of marble structures or those of wood and stone. Your own heart, your subjective self, is the temple of the living God. Because the I am, the presence of God, dwells within your subjective depths. And the spirit of truth in you will guide you into all truth. There is only one truth. Not two, three, or a thousand just one. There is only one power. The Lord, thy God, is one Lord. One presence and one power. Not two, or three, or a thousand. Turn to the Spirit within, which is God, and ask for light and inspiration. And all the different creeds and dogmas will vanish. You will then find the true church within yourself the presence of God. Men and women in the Bible refer to the interaction of your conscious and subconscious mind. They don't wear pants or a dress in the Bible. They represent union of your conscious and subconscious mind. We are all male and female. Woman means your subconscious mind where the infinite intelligence and boundless wisdom of God abide. Emerson says the infinite lies in smiling repose. In other words, God lies in your subjective depths. When you pray for inspiration, guidance, or seeking light on some subject, naturally, you remain silent, still, and receptive. By lowly listening you shall hear the whisper of the gods, Emerson said. As you know, the nature of infinite intelligence is responsiveness. And you use your conscious mind to carry out the guidance and inspiration that come from within. This procedure has nothing to do with sex or whether you are male or female. In other words, the Bible is not referring to sex but to gender. Everyone is male and female in the sense that every person has a conscious and a subconscious mind. That's simple. When you pray for another, you realize that God is not the author of confusion but of peace, the same, biblically speaking, as any person who is dedicated to God and the eternal principles of life. To pray scientifically for another person, you quiet the mind, and remain still and passive. You don't try to make something come to pass. You seek results, but you don't try and coerce the subconscious to obey your decrees. Your subconscious responds to your conviction regarding the infinite healing presence within you. In the prayer process you don't dwell on symptoms, aches, or pains. Neither do you say, John or Mary is getting better now. His nerves are calmer, his heart is normal. These are suggestions, but not a real silent realization. For example, if you are praying for Betty Jones, affirm. Betty Jones is known in divine mind. God dwells within her and his river of peace saturates her mind. His love fills her soul. God is, and his presence flows through her, vitalizing, 
healing, restoring her to wholeness and perfection. I give thanks for the healing power of God taking place now. In this prayer process, you identify with the Divine Presence in Betty, and you claim that what is true of God is true of her. After your silent spiritual treatment, if you felt an inner sense of peace or satisfaction, or if you felt that was the best you could do for the present, dismiss the matter until you feel led to pray again. The next time you pray for her should be as if you had not prayed before. If after the first time you prayed you said, this will do until I get back to it again, you would stultify your prayer. Each time you pray for Betty, you are reinforcing the idea of vitality, wholeness, and perfection for her. Gradually or immediately, as the case may be, the idea of perfect wholeness and vitality will be resurrected in Betty. When you relax and let go and enter into a psychic, passive state, your conscious mind is partially submerged and you are in rapport subjectively with Betty. What you feel is true of Betty will be felt by her. When you prayed, you were the silent one in your own church, knowing that God is the author of peace and health, not sickness or confusion. Your subconscious does not speak or articulate like your conscious mind. Your conscious mind dwells on wholeness, beauty, perfection, and decrees joy and vitality. There is the response from the subconscious according to the belief and conviction of the conscious mind. This is why it is written. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. It has nothing to do with women, as such. Your subconscious speaks in symbols, allegories, dreams, and visions of the night. Your conscious mind may interpret and become the spokesman for the subconscious mind. Aaron and Moses represent your conscious and subconscious mind. Aaron was the spokesman for Moses. You are told Moses had an impediment of speech. In other words, your subconscious mind doesn't speak to you like your conscious mind does. You receive intuition. Answers to your prayer may come in dreams and visions of the night, allegories, symbols, perhaps in numbers and cryptograms. That's the way your subconscious generally speaks to you. Therefore, Aaron is the spokesman. Your conscious mind interprets or carries out the dictates of the subconscious mind. When, therefore, the Bible says, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, but this means that God is your husband. The answer is obvious. You are to turn to the infinite intelligence within you for guidance, right action, inspiration, and direction. You are not to impregnate yourself with the negative thoughts, fears, and false beliefs of the world. Rather, enthrone God-like ideas and eternal verities in your conscious mind. As you busy your mind with these constructive thought patterns and eternal verities, your subconscious will respond accordingly. This applies to you regardless of your sex status. That's why your maker is your husband. God's ideas, the truths of God, should impregnate the subconscious and not the false beliefs of the world. After the above explanation to the woman at the opening of our talk, she rejected completely the false interpretation given to the Bible by her father and decided to become a minister. The Bible is now being taught from the standpoint of a spiritual or esoteric meaning, and women are gaining their freedom from the false and ignorant interpretation of the scriptures. Men and women are equal in the eyes of God. Male and female created he them, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. That applies to everybody. The greatest degree of freedom for women is in the United States. Complete emancipation, spiritually, mentally, physically, and financially, is already on the horizon. Woman represents the subjective side of life, which is invisible and covered by the objective side of life. It is sad, but true, that religion and superstition have been the prime offenders of advising people to belabor their bodies with all kinds of stern austerities for no good purpose. In ancient times many religious devotees practiced flagellation, privation, and starvation, which were forms of mental and physical debauchery. Many of these religious devotees maltreated their bodies so much that they actually ruined them for the remainder of their lives. It is said that Saint Francis spent the last year of his life in a deep, childish melancholy because, he said, I brought this body to this pass, because I have beaten my brother he meant his body too hard. This doesn't make you spiritual, of course, by austerities, or rigidities, or by beating your body, or starving yourself that doesn't make you spiritual. You become spiritual by the contemplation of the truth of God from the highest standpoint. It is true that down through the ages man in his ignorance have taken advantage of woman's biological handicap. She'd give birth to children and devoted many years in bringing up the children to where they could be independent and support themselves. During all this time she's been under a physical handicap, 
and man has taken advantage of that for his own aggrandizement and to make her an inferior. Many religions misread and misinterpret the allegory of the Garden of Eden in order to justify keeping women in subjection. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. It is absolutely stupid to take this literally. It is true psychologically, as previously explained, because your conscious mind controls your subconscious. Your conscious mind rules your subconscious. Your subconscious is amenable to suggestion. It's amenable and subservient to the suggestions of your conscious mind, which anyone can demonstrate under hypnosis. In the early days of Christianity a council of the church fathers was held in Alexandria. The purpose of this meeting was to decide whether women really possessed a soul or not. Lo and behold, they voted on the matter, and the conclusion was that she had by a majority of one. We are now beginning to have women ministers in the Protestant churches, but since the early days of Phineas Parkhurst Quimby in 1847 onward, we've had women ministers in unity, religious science, science of mind, divine science, church of truth, and all branches of the New Thought field. Women, of course, predominate in the New Thought field. Recently women priests have been ordained in the Episcopal Church. It is only a question of time until we have women priests and bishops in the Roman Catholic Church. There are now women rabbis in Jewish congregations. Today in many Protestant and Reformed Jewish seminaries, half or more of the seminarians are women. In the political arena, women have been presidents or prime ministers of countries like Israel, Great Britain, the Philippines, India and Pakistan. There are many states in the United States with women governors, cities with women mayors, senators and representatives in Congress on the benches of many courts including the Supreme Court. It is also quite likely at some time in the future to have a woman as President of the United States. There were many famous women superiors in the convent of nuns in the Middle Ages, who had their own establishments, who were illumined and inspired, and who became so outstandingly brilliant that they far outshone the men of their day. The men became frightened and nipped their distinguished and illustrious spiritual careers in the bud. There were distinguished scholars and outstanding executives, also, and their male colleagues decided to clip their wings. If these men had known the truth, they would have rejoiced and been exceedingly glad that members of their religious order had moved onward, upward, and Godward. To inhibit and block another is to place blocks in your own progress and advancement. Zoologists and naturalists inform us that there is no animal living under instinct dominating a female, though there are a few instances where a female dominates a male. Down through the ages man has dominated the female through the misuse of his mind, and he has exploited the female of the species because of her biological role in life. Allegories can be read at different levels. Like dreams. Many have more than one interpretation. Adam and Eve represent your conscious and subconscious mind the male and female. Adam represents every man. The serpent that tempts you represents your five senses, which deceive you and trick you at times, and perhaps tempt you or try to dissuade you from turning away from the belief in one power. You must not be governed by your five senses, however, which consist of sundry concepts, good and bad. Five sense knowledge is not sufficient to govern your life, for then you become impregnated with all sorts of false knowledge, fears, doubts, and negative suggestions of all kinds. There are several levels to the Garden of Eden story. But, actually, you are the Garden of Eden yourself. The four rivers represent your spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical natures. They also represent an allegory of your body representing the four fluid systems of your body. The cerebral spinal system, the sympathetic nerve system, the bloodstream or circulatory system, and the intestinal tract. The flora and fauna of the garden, the plant and animal life, represent the flora and fauna of your body. The flora the vegetation of the body and the fauna the cells of the body. This garden is tended by a man and woman your conscious and subconscious mind. The allegory of the Garden of Eden is concerned with gender, not sex. It deals with the relationship of the male and female principles in all of us. Namely, the conscious and subconscious mind. Eve the subconscious, was taken from Adam's rib while he slept. This, of course, is all psychological. One way of looking at this is that during sleep the subconscious mind controls and emerges. The rib basket protects all the vital organs of your body. One meaning of the rib is the natural symbol of the preservative and protective nature of your subconscious mind, for your ribs protect all the vital organs of your body. It is merely an allegory. 
During sleep answers come in your dreams often the full solution to a perplexing problem is given to you when you are asleep. Your subconscious controls all the vital processes while you sleep. The rib also means the structural idea or plan in your mind, and as you emotionalize the idea and become enthusiastic about it, you are calling forth Eve, the subjective or emotional, which is the creative medium. Emotion follows the thought, the idea, and the invention in your mind. This is why in some countries in the Far East the woman follows the man. He goes first, and she follows with a load on her head or back. He takes it easy. They take these things literally, which, of course, is absurd. This is the curse of literalism. It is said that a curse was pronounced upon Eve for listening to the serpent. And Eve was made subject to her husband. The subconscious is subject to the husband conscious mind not only for good but for evil, too. It is foolish to listen to the serpent, which means, in simple language, the false beliefs of the world, the five sense propaganda. The serpent is another name for the life principle, or God, only it means God upside down, a morbid, twisted, distorted concept of life, God, and the universe. There is only one power. When you use the power constructively, harmoniously, and peacefully, people call it God, Allah, Brahma, health, or happiness. When you use that power ignorantly, stupidly, maliciously, people call it Satan, the liar in wait, the devil, insanity, fear, ignorance, superstition, sickness, and all that. There's only one power. How do you use it? Good and evil are in your own mind. It's the movement of your own thought. If you visit someone with cancer, are you bothered by the thought that you may get it? Where's the tempter? It's in your own mind. Slay the negative thought. Cremate it at once and affirm. Spirit in me is God. It is the ever-living one, the all-wise one. It can't be hurt. It can't get sick. It's omnipotent, supreme. This attitude will protect you. An allegory is a representation of the spiritual meaning through concrete or material thoughts. It is a figurative treatment of one subject under the guise of another. When I was a boy I asked the priest at my church where the Garden of Eden was. He said it was between the Tigris and Euphrates and told me to ask no more questions. If a thing is true there is a way in which it is true. There is no such garden anyplace, and there never was an actual Garden of Eden. And the two trees are within yourself. It is true psychologically. All of us have received instructions and ideas, good and bad, false and true, when we were young and impressionable. Our minds, being malleable, accepted them. Like seeds these ideas grew up in us and became fixed states of mind. Some of them became phobias and fixations. Perhaps some were based on fear and prejudices. Others, perhaps, from the golden rule, honesty, integrity, goodwill, and so on. So, the tree of good and evil, therefore, is within yourself. Fixed beliefs in the golden rule is good, and that God is going to punish you or that you are a sinner in the hands of an angry God is a false belief. So, people have grown up with these false beliefs, but the tree of life is there, which is the presence of God in you. Our religious beliefs were given to us when young. Like fruit on a tree, we bear fruit according to the beliefs implanted in our subconscious mind. The religious wars of today bear bad fruit from the tree of life within us. All seeds grew after their kind. The tree of good and evil is our own mind believing in good and evil, which is the cause of the troubles of the world. There is only one power not two, three, or a thousand. In the Bible, man refers to the conscious mind, and woman, subconscious. When the Bible says that the woman should be subject to the man in everything, do not take it literally. The subconscious does serve the conscious mind faithfully. It gives form to what is impressed upon it. Whatever ideas are emotionalized and felt as true are impressed on the subconscious. Whatever is impressed on the subconscious, good or bad, it brings forth as form, as function, experience, and event. The subconscious does not respond to mental coercion, or force, or compulsion. It responds to your persuasion, to your feeling, to your love nature, to your emotional nature. Your subconscious will accept whatever you predominantly accept and believe in your conscious mind. It accepts your convictions. It accepts what you really believe in your conscious, reasoning mind. Your subconscious will bring it forth. The husband is head of the wife, you are told, but this is not literally true of men and women in their relationship. But it is true of the conscious and subconscious mind the male and female aspect within everybody. 
When the Bible says that he who loves his wife loves himself, and they two shall become one flesh, it is the mystery of your own consciousness, the male and female principle within yourself. When your conscious and subconscious agree on anything, your prayer is always answered. Two shall agree as touching on anything on earth, it shall be established through my Father, which is in heaven. If your conscious and subconscious agree on harmony, prosperity, success, and achievement, then it must come to pass, because you are operating on a law. For there is no quarrel in your conscious or subconscious mind, and your prayer will be answered. The conscious mind is the male aspect, and it dominates the subconscious, or the female. Assume the feeling of being what you long to be, and you'll become it. Walk in the light that it is so. The Bible is talking about the interaction of the male and female principle. In those days there were no terms such as conscious and subconscious mind, or objective mind, or subjective mind. These are of recent vintage. When these two phases of the mind work harmoniously and peacefully, and in unison and accord, the issue from this union results in health, wealth, happiness, and true expression. The cause of all the misery and suffering in the world is the inharmonious interaction of the male and female principle within men and women. Therefore, contemplate whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely and of good report. Think on these things all day long. The marriage in the Bible is the union of your thought and emotion. When these two unite and are constructive there is an issue from this union. If your thoughts are godlike, your emotions being generated from your thought, your heart will then be a chalice for God's love. The real marriage in the Bible is your sense of oneness with God. From that union comes forth all the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, abundance, security, happiness, and vitality. A man or woman is not to be looked upon just as a body. You are a mental and spiritual being. Your body is a vehicle and is a representation of your thoughts, feelings, imaginations, and beliefs. Spirit, consciousness, awareness, the IAM, the life principle is the reality of each person. It's called the living spirit almighty. When you say IAM, you are announcing the presence and power of God within yourself. It's a nameless name. It means being, life, awareness. The Bible talks much about spiritual laws and truths of life. It is not talking about men and women as such. The Bible knew the workings of the mind and was well acquainted with what we call abnormal psychology today. For about 300 years, the teachers and leaders of early Christianity performed great things, including miraculous healings. They were on fire with the truth. All of you know the history of the great Roman emperor, Constantine, who came along and organized the early church into a vast organization, establishing rites, rituals, ceremonies, and doctrinal regulations, dogmas, and tenets to be believed in. It grew on the outside but began to die slowly on the inside. This is true of all religions of the world. Their priests, ministers and leaders forgot the real source of all blessings and bounty and looked to form, ceremony, structures, and the hierarchy, worshipping the created thing rather than the creator. Always look to your own divine center for the light and true wisdom. If any person lack wisdom, let him or her ask of God, who giveth to all liberally and upbraideth not. We are told that Samson's strength was in his hair. Hair represents thoughts and emanations of divine energy your mental patterns and attitudes. You are not to take it literally. This is why man's hair is cut short. This should not be taken literally, as it has nothing to do with actual physical hair on the top of your head. Man cuts off the hair, meaning he gets rid of all resentment, antagonism, arrogance, pride, prejudices, and hostility. By identifying with divine love, the spirit of forgiveness, and exalting God in the midst of him, then his head, our conscious mind, is truly uncovered. Because he has removed all the false beliefs and all the arrogance and price, and he is ready for prayer. He's humbled before the infinite. He's ready for meditation and spiritual growth. Looking at it symbolically and from a spiritual standpoint, long hair on a man would indicate a growth of false concepts and erroneous opinions, accompanied by negative emotions, intellectual pride, and conceit, and a know-it-all attitude. One of my congregants asked me why it was that women through the ages were looked upon as chattels, inferior to man, and subservient. She mentioned, for example, that one of her female antecedents in the old country in Europe would leave the room whenever a man came to visit her husband. As previously explained, the subconscious was subservient to the conscious mind of the man. 
The male, the conscious mind, intellect, is dominant. All that means is that your conscious mind should be the guardian of the threshold and should see to it that nothing enters into your subconscious that does not fill your soul with joy, with faith, with confidence, vitality, and enthusiasm. If you see a builder laying bricks and one brick is underneath the other, both bricks are the same and of equal importance. That might apply to the home that you are building yourself. The brick underneath is in an inferior position. Not, however, inferior in usefulness or importance to the structure of the building. One brick is inferior in placement or position. That is all. It's just as important as the other. This is the same with your subconscious mind, called the woman in the Bible. Your conscious mind controls and dominates your subconscious, but the two are essential. And the latter is amenable to suggestions and habitual thinking and imagery of your conscious mind. Your subconscious responds to the dominant thought of your conscious mind. One of our radio listeners has a secretarial position with a large corporation. She is about to retire. She wrote me and said she heard me say on my daily radio broadcast that if you pictured yourself on board a plane or ship and felt the reality of it for example. If you wanted a voyage on a ship, you should picture the event here and now and feel yourself as sitting on deck, looking at the stars, listening to the creaking of the planks and ship, smelling the briny ocean, feeling the ocean breeze in your face, and looking at the vast deep, by dwelling on the scene and making it so vivid and real that when you opened your eyes after the meditation period, you were actually amazed that you were not on the ship, your feeling was so real, it is a sure sign that you have fixed it in your subconscious and it will come to pass. Even though you do not have the money to take the trip, if you succeed in impregnating your subconscious, it will surely come to pass in ways you know not of. Accordingly, she followed the technique and on the third night fell asleep affirming, trip, trip, trip. She awakened the next morning and had no further desire to pray about it, because she had succeeded in fixing the idea in her subconscious mind. The sequel was interesting. When discussing her retirement benefits with her financial advisor, she learned that she could juggle her investments in her 401k retirement account to take a month-long cruise. This is what the Bible means by cubing your thought, or mental image, mothering it. For it is the mother that gives birth to the child, not the man. She began to think about the trip, got maps of foreign countries, and then, getting interested in visiting all the foreign ports, she engaged the power of her subconscious mind, because she evoked the feeling, the interest, and the enthusiasm. Then the subjective mind brought it to pass in its own way. The woman in you always represents your emotion, your feeling nature, and your subjectivity. The man gets engaged to a woman, and if he woos her successfully, loves her, cares for her, and tells her how wonderful she is, and remains faithful to her, gradually it consummates into a marriage. Prayer is the same thing as wooing a woman, telling her how much you love her, how much you care for her, giving her presence, and exalting her, wishing her well, and the apple of your eye, so to speak, you are nourishing it, sustaining it, and loving it the idea in your mind. Gradually, it will sink into your subconscious by osmosis, and it will grow like a seed. You are married to it. From that issue comes forth the answer to your prayer. So, the ancients taught the prayer process to be very similar to a man courting a woman, remaining faithful to her, and then it will consummate into a marriage. Your subconscious mind does not choose your thoughts. Your conscious mind is a choosing, volitional mind. This is why the subconscious mind can be polluted by an ignorant, tyrannical, despotic, egotistic and autocratic conscious mind. When the conscious mind entertains gangsters, assassins, and marauders in the form of evil, hostile, hateful, and vengeful thoughts, these pollute and befoul the subconscious, and bring forth all manner of diseases and disorders of the mind, the body, and the business. This type of conscious mind can be in every person irrespective and regardless of sex. To indulge in resentment or a desire to get even causes your subconscious to respond in a negative and destructive manner. Modern research by psychosomatic doctors points out that they have found destructive emotions behind cancer patients. In an article on prevention in a magazine for better health, Dr. Carl Simonton, a specialist in oncology, the science of tumors, states as follows. Some personality characteristics of the cancer patient that other scientists have identified as significantly different than non-cancer patients are a tendency to harbor resentment and an impairment in the ability to express hostility, a tendency to self-pity, difficulty in developing and maintaining meaningful, long-term relationships, a poor self-image, plus a sense of basic rejection, 
either by one or both of his parents. Consequently, this person develops the life history pattern seen so commonly in cancer patients. Dr. Simonton points out in the above quotation from his article that negative, destructive emotions can bring about destructive diseases in the human body. This is why the Bible says the woman's head your subconscious should be governed by divine ideas, mothered by divine love. This is the government of the free. It guarantees peace, security, health, and abundance. The woman your subconscious should always be watched over and protected by your conscious mind. The woman is the glory of man. The word glory comes from glory. That is, whatever thoughts are true, lovely, noble, and godlike. The word ray means light, and glow means warmth and love. And when you are focused on that which is true, lovely, noble, and godlike, they will find their way by a process of spiritual osmosis into your subconscious mind. And should there glow, warmth, and light on all your undertakings. If you do not govern, control, and direct your emotional life, you will respond to all the sundry negative thoughts, fears, and predictions of gloom and doom which bombard us night and day. Then these irrational emotions will impel and propel you into negative action and reaction. In biblical language, you are committing adultery when you cohabit with evil, hate, jealousy, resentment, hostility, or ill will in the bed of your mind. To do so is to spawn an evil progeny. The woman's hair is not shorn nor shaven because hair, being symbolic of thought, emanations of goodwill, should be protected at all times by the truths of God and watched over by the overshadowing presence of the God of love, enthroned and dominant in the conscious mind. Man's hair, symbolically speaking, should be shorn, as previously explained, in the sense that his intellect should be anointed with the wisdom of God and his contemplation should be on the truths of God from the highest standpoint. Down through the ages men have worn hair long and short, but the Bible is talking about your thought life, your mental patterns, the vibrations that emanate from you, and focused attention. Long hair, symbolically and biblically speaking, would be wrong for a man, as it would indicate that he was governed, not by spiritual reasoning, but by negative emotions in the mass mind. Woman's hair, accordingly, should not be shorn, which, in the psychological and spiritual sense, means that her mind is not at peace, that she does not have God or God-like thoughts or ideas as her husband. In other words, ignorance, fear, and superstition are governing her, and she is not clothed with the garment of salvation and the robe of righteousness. The woman who is uncovered, therefore, in the light of the Bible in its inner meaning, becomes unstable, neurotic, subject to every wind that blows. Needless to say, whichever you are, a man or a woman, you do not take the subject of the hair literally. A man with long or short hair may be a god-like man. The trouble is not in his hair or head, but the way in which he uses the laws of mind and the way of the spirit. The answer to all problems is to keep your attention on God and all things good. Then you are prophesying for yourself a wonderful future. For with your eyes stayed on God, there is no evil, we are told, on your pathway. The conscious mind should be a guide and protector for the holy child, which child, of course, is your awareness of the presence and power of God within you. When you become aware of the divine presence within you, the IAM, the presence of God in you, that's called a child in the Bible, the spiritual idea, your awakening to that power and presence within you. Your thought is your conscious mind, and your feeling and emotion are subconscious. When these two unite in peace and harmony, your prayer is answered. That's called God in action. Your conscious and subconscious unite on anything. There's a child, an expression, a son, which is the son bearing witness of the father and mother. In other words, the answer to your prayer. It bears witness to the union of your conscious and subconscious mind. This is the way your mind works. Knowledge of this is the birth of the holy child, or wisdom, in you. Practice the harmonious, synchronous, and joyous relationship between your conscious and subconscious mind and you will bring forth health, peace, strength, and security. And throne the right idea in your mind. Then you will experience in your heart the true feeling. The union of your thought and feeling represents the married pair in you. When they are fused, the third element, peace, God, enters in and you experience the joy of the answered prayer. Let your heart become a chalice for God's love, or the manger for his birth. As a result, you will express and bring forth a child which is God, our good, on the earth. Earth means your body, your environment, all phases of your life. Your conscious mind called the husband is the motor, 
The subconscious could be looked upon as the engine. You must start the motor and the engine will do the work. The conscious mind is the dynamo that awakens the power of the subconscious. The first step in conveying your clarified desire, idea, or image to the deeper mind is to relax, immobilize the attention, get still and quiet. This quiet, relaxed, peaceful attitude of mind prevents extraneous matter and false ideas from interfering with your mental absorption of your ideal. Furthermore, in the quiet, passive, receptive attitude of mind, effort is reduced to a minimum. There is a wonderful power within you. It's the subjective power. Become convinced now there is a power within you capable of bringing you what you imagine and feel is true into manifestation. Sitting idly by daydreaming and imagining the things you would like to possess will not attract them to you. You must know and believe that you are operating a law of mind. Become convinced of your God-given power and use your mind constructively to bring into manifestation the thing you desire. Know what you want. The subconscious mind will carry out the idea. That's the woman in you. That's the creative power. It's called the mother, it's called the womb, it's called the wife. It's called by many names, but it is the creative power. You have a definite, clear-cut concept of what you wish to possess. Imagine clearly the fulfillment of your desire. Then you are giving the subconscious something definite to act upon. The subconscious mind is the film upon which the picture is impressed. The subconscious develops the picture, sends it back to you in a material, objectified form. The camera is you consciously imagining the realization of your desire through focused attention. As you do this in a relaxed, happy mood, the picture is cast on the sensitive film of the subconscious mind. You need also a time exposure maybe two or three minutes, or longer, depending on your temperament, feeling, and understanding. The important thing to remember is that it is not so much the time as the quality in your mind, or thinking, or your degree of feeling, or faith. Generally speaking, the more focused and absorbed your attention is, and the longer the time, the more perfect will be the answer to your prayer. Believe that you have received, and you shall receive. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believe that you've received them, and ye shall receive them. To believe is to live in the state of being it. It is to be alive to the truths of God, to accept something as true, or to live in the state of being it. As you sustain your mood, your feeling, you will experience the joy of the answered prayer. Accept the fact that you have an inner creative power. Let it be a positive conviction. This infinite power is responsive and reactive to your thought. To know, understand, and apply this principle causes doubt, fear, and worry to gradually disappear. The deeper mind, remember, is responsive to your thought. Your deeper mind reproduced your habitual thinking and imagery 24 hours a day. That's the meaning of, let us make man after our image and after our likeness. Let us bring forth all manifestation that is, your conscious and subconscious mind based upon your habitual thinking and imagery. Let the life principle flow through that matrix that mold, of your habitual thoughts and imagery. So, the subconscious, called the subjective or deeper mind, sets in operation its unconscious intelligence, which attracts to you the conditions necessary for your success. You should make it a special point to do the thing you love to do. And if you are wondering what that is, realize there is an infinite intelligence within you that knows only the answer. Say, infinite intelligence reveals to me my true place in life where I am doing what I love to do, divinely happy, divinely prospered, and I follow the lead which comes clearly into my conscious, reasoning mind. As you do this, the answer will come clearly into your conscious mind. It will be impossible for you to miss it. Then you follow that lead which comes to you. Then you will discover that all your ways are ways of pleasantness and all your paths are paths of peace. In a nutshell men and women in the Bible refer to the interaction of your conscious and subconscious mind. They don't wear pants or a dress in the Bible. They represent union of your conscious and subconscious mind. We are all male and female. Woman means your subconscious mind where the infinite intelligence and boundless wisdom of God abide. Men and women are equal in the eyes of God. Male and female created he them. You are not to impregnate yourself with the negative thoughts, fears, and false beliefs of the world. Rather, enthrone God-like ideas and eternal verities in your conscious mind. As you busy your mind with these constructive thought patterns and eternal verities, your subconscious will respond accordingly. This applies to you regardless of your sex status. That's why your maker is your husband. God's ideas, the truths of God, 
should impregnate the subconscious and not the false beliefs of the world. There is only one power. When you use the power constructively, harmoniously, and peacefully, people call it God, Allah, Brahma, health, or happiness. When you use that power ignorantly, stupidly, maliciously, people call it Satan, the liar in wait, the devil, insanity, fear, ignorance, superstition, sickness, and all that. There's only one power. How do you use it? Good and evil are in your own mind. It's the movement of your own thought. A man or woman is not to be looked upon just as a body. You are a mental and spiritual being. Your body is a vehicle and is a representation of your thoughts, feelings, imaginations, and beliefs. Spirit, consciousness, awareness, the IAM, the life principle is the reality of each person. It's called the Living Spirit Almighty. Practice the harmonious, synchronous, and joyous relationship between your conscious and subconscious mind, and you will bring forth health, peace, strength, and security. Enthrone the right idea in your mind. Then you will experience in your heart the true feeling. The union of your thought and feeling represents the married pair in you. When they are fused, the third element, peace, God, enters in and you experience the joy of the answered prayer. Let your heart become a chalice for God's love. About the author a native of Ireland who resettled in America, Joseph Murphy, was a prolific and widely admired New Thought minister and writer, best known for his metaphysical classic, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind, an international bestseller since it first appeared on the self-help scene in 1963. A popular speaker, Murphy lectured on both American coasts and in Europe, Asia, and South Africa. His many books and pamphlets on the auto-suggestive and metaphysical faculties of the human mind have entered multiple editions some of the most poignant of which appear in this volume. Murphy is considered one of the pioneering voices of affirmative thinking philosophy.